I'd like to introduce um, Dr. James M. Anderson, who is the director of the Division of Program Coordination, Planning, and Strategic Initiatives, known fondly in the Office of the Director as Deep Poughkeepsie. It's the parent division to the Office of Strategic Coordination, home of the Common Fund. So Jim is here to give you a hearty welcome from the Common Fund. Thank you, and here's Jim. Okay, my charge was to give you a hearty welcome. So, good morning. <laughs> and I'm welcoming you on behalf of all the NIH staff that have been involved in developing this program. And welcome to Bethesda. This is going to be a really fun couple of days here. Um, let me begin by giving a little background, because this program is a little different. If you've been an NIH grantee before, you're used to the standard ways that we manage programs. This is going to be a little different, and it's in the common fund, so I'll tell you why it's different because that implications for how this is managed. Um, you all know, some of you, that NIH has 27 different institutes, and each has its own budget and its own mission from Congress. There's the National Cancer Institute, Heart, Lung, and Blood, and there's a lot of research that goes across the institutes, but until 2004, there was not a fund that allowed people to get together to do new things. So NIH actually started that with the roadmap in 2004 and kicked off some, some very big programs that you may, you may know about the Human Microbiome Project, for example. Uh, and on the left there, Congress noticed this, and in 2006, when NIH was reauthorized, it actually gave an appropriation, which this year is uh, $533 million for these kinds of projects. And, and they gave us some guidelines. They now, in law, these projects can only be 10 years. So we're really focused on what are you trying to accomplish, and let's keep on track and let's get it done. Uh, and they also said in the law that these have milestones and goals. So these aren't the kind of projects that you inch towards a solution. That we use the common fund when we say, ah, this is the time. I can see a solution. And if we do this and we all do it together and get it done, it'll change the way we do science. So that's, uh, that's what the Common Fund is all about. There's currently 29 active projects. We're now at 10 years, so some have cycled out. Uh, and we pick up a few more each year. Uh, they are, the, the character of these are, I'll give you an example. One would be, um, well, let's use the human microbiome. I already mentioned that. This was the issue that, oh, maybe 15 years ago, people studied a single bug at a time or a few bugs. But then with the advent of uh, high throughput sequencing and computational ways to rebuild all the bugs that you're sampling, there may be a thousand different bugs in your sample, but you could never study that before. So the premise to this project was, hey, let's just generate a reference data set from several different body sites in lots of different normal people. And when you did that, you could step back and get the big picture. And that's just accelerated the way we can work on the human microbiome. So that's the character of what we try and do. And we're going to do it with SPAR. Lots of home runs with this program. We're going to have another one with SPAR. Uh, I just point out that about a third of the funds are also used not for large, multi-center, multi-initiative managed projects, but for investigator-initiated. So these are people come forward with an idea, but there's different rules about it, and we, they're, they're not like your standard R01 projects, and the way that they're reviewed and so on allows people to take a lot of risk. So uh, it's not all large managed projects like we're talking about today with SPARC. So again, here are some of the characteristics that are going to apply to the SPARC uh, project is we think there, there's a time, this is the time, where if we made a large uh, directed investment in this area, we could really change the way science is done. And since it's, uh, it's a short-term project, well, 10 years at most by law, we'll have to be very clear about what the milestones and goals are, why we chose those, and what the implications are going to be if we succeed. Because that's what we do. Is we, we, we don't do these projects until we say, we know what the implications of that solution will be, and that's going to change science. Uh, it also, I just want to point out that this involves multiple of our institutes and centers. These are not uh, disease-specific. They, they go after a, a fundamental biology principles, usually, that are underlying, or tools or technology that are widely useful for any different disease area. Also, something which we won't dwell on much today is 
We've chosen to use a more flexible management style, which is atypical uh, with this program, and you'll see that roll out more in years to come. And part of that is because we're going to partner biology advances with technological advances, and, and the rate at which discoveries or advances will be made will be uneven. So we'll have to be more nimble as we go forward with this program. So the management approach will be also flexible and more nimble than those of you who are NIH investigators will, will usually be used to. So I want to point out again, this is a multi-institute. Many institutes are interested in this, but our four scientific leaders our institute directors, uh, Chris Austin from NCATS, Roderick Pettigrew, who will speak next from NIBIB, Alan Willard uh, is the acting deputy director of uh, NINDS, and Greg Germino is the deputy director of NIDDK. So again, you see translational, biomedical uh, uh, imaging and then engineering, uh, ner nervous system, kidney disease. It's a very, as we know, we're very interested in uh, neural modulation of a variety of organs. So that's the, it's a very general lessons we're looking for. There's also a project team leaders for this, uh, Dan, Grace, Vinay, and Jill from these corresponding institutes. And then there's many other folks with different administrative roles that help with this. So next I want to turn it over to Roderick, who is the director of the Institute of Biomedical uh, Imaging and Bioengineering. A really quick slide change. So he's been the director since 2002 when the Institute was founded. Um, and we're looking for him for guidance in this program, particularly in the engineering and imaging aspects. Bradley? Uh, thank you, Jim, and good morning, everyone. I also want to uh, not only welcome the people that physically are in this audience, but those that may be joining us uh, electronically by way of a webcast. I understand there will be an opportunity for those individuals to also interact in this uh, workshop uh, by sending in uh, messages and questions that will be entertained uh, as um, we progress through the day and have our discussion sessions. Uh, my task also, like Jim's, is fairly straightforward. It is to give you uh, an orientation uh, to bring everybody into this discussion uh, from a common background. So I'd like to give some perspective, uh, particularly including those individuals that may be listening by way of the web and are somewhat new to this concept or curious about uh, the basic concept that we're exploring here is this new approach and, and new way to develop uh, therapeutics uh, for a variety of diseases and, and conditions. And, uh, and then to conclude with a brief overview of what we hope to accomplish in this workshop, which will be further elucidated by my colleagues, uh, Alan Willard and Gregory Gimino. Uh, the uh, basic idea here is one of using electrical stimulation, electrical impulses, to modulate uh, the body's neural circuits, as indicated here in this uh, commentary and piece that was uh, published in Nature a couple of years ago. And this basic idea <clears throat> is not new. It's been around for some time, as, as you'll hear. The NIH has supported research in this area uh, for decades. Uh, and I'll illustrate some of that. Uh, but it has flown by a variety of terms and terminologies, and so that everybody is on the same page and there's no confusion, we're all basically talking about the same thing when we use these different terms. Electrics, electroceuticals, bioelectric medicines, et cetera, and so forth, are all referring to the same idea. The phraseology that we use at, at the NIH is more mechanistically derived, as you can see here, stimulating peripheral activity to relieve medical conditions. 
and we just sort of abbreviate this to conditions. Medical conditions is a broad term referring to diseases and disorders. Uh, that's a bit long for an acronym, so we simply call it uh, what you see here, abbreviated as SPARC. So as Jim has introduced, this is a common fund program, SPARC is. Uh, the basic idea is, is shown here to establish uh, methods to stimulate the peripheral and enteric nervous systems for treatment of diseases with a particular focus on understanding exactly how this works. We need to understand the underlying mechanisms of neural control and neuromodulation, and I think that's the first order of the day. Uh, we would, however, like to develop uh, through this program some proof of concept for this new class of uh, therapeutics, uh, specifically neural devices to treat uh, diseases. Now, a year uh, after the first uh, article that I showed you from Nature appeared this report in Nature specifically citing this NIH Common Fund effort, uh, calling it SPARC, as you can see here, and spelling out the acronym, and underscoring, once again, what this is all about from the standpoint of the NIH, focusing on the mechanisms that underlie electrical control in organ systems, and that will form the bulk of much of the discussion that we have today and how to move forward to actually achieve that goal. Now, as I mentioned, this is not an entirely new concept. It isn't new at all. A basic research in this area was funded by uh, NINDS uh, two decades ago. Our institute was created just a little over a decade ago, and since then we have carried on in funding research, which led through this, to this breakthrough in spinal cord injury and treating spinal cord injury by way of adding epidural electrical stimulation in addition to the routine physiotherapy uh, regimen that had been practiced for some years, uh, but with little gain in terms of modulating the neural network and the neural system. Uh, this dramatically changed a little less than a year ago with this study, uh, which was first reported a couple of years ago, I think in 2012, with the first person to have been treated in this fashion and a remarkable improvement uh, that surprised even the investigators, the primary investigators of the study, Reggie Edgerton and Susan Harkimer, were surprised that this individual treated with the expectation of him being able to simply hold up his posture if he was able to stand, if they were able to stand him up observed that he regained some voluntary leg control, and you'll hear from him, I have a video at the very end, uh, but also regained bladder, bowel, and sexual function. This uh, made a tremendous difference in his quality of life. It was a surprise to everyone. That was repeated in, a, in three additional patients and reported uh, a little less than a year ago, as you can see here, in brain. Uh, that altering spinal cord excitability enables voluntary motion after chronic complete paralysis. And if you read this, it was not only voluntary but also involuntary, as you'll hear from Rob Summers, with some dramatic improvements in the autonomic nervous system. There's patient number one, Rob Summers, and the investigators, Edgerton and Harkimer, flanking him on both sides, received tremendous uh, uh, press. Uh, as you can see here, this is just a few of uh, the uh, uh, publications uh, and coverage in the media that was observed, including an above-the-fold first-page um, report in, in USA Today and there's a variety of, of, of publications from around uh, the world. So here I'd like for you to just take, uh, this is about the three and a half minutes or so, listen to this first person's account of what happened when he was stimulated with these electrodes surgically implanted in his uh, lumbar spine just above the epidural with sufficient uh, electrical stimulation to modulate the excitability of the spinal cord, but not at the level to stimulate any sort of muscle contraction. And I want to make that a point. Uh, this was done in a control pattern, it's still being studied, but if you listen to him, you'll hear about his journey uh, and the discovery that, is, that were being made by this team 
with this particular approach. And specifically, hear about the autonomic system and the surprises that, uh, uh, that were uh, to come uh, with this particular treatment as regards the autonomic the system. benefit came on the third day of the experiments when I stood for the first time in more than four years independently. But that was just the beginning of the benefits I was about to see from the FDL stimulation project. The first thing I started to notice was an increased sensation throughout my entire body when the stimulator was turned off. This was great since now I could feel when I was uncomfortable and was able to adjust myself. This made sure that I wasn't going to get any pressure sores or skin breakdowns, which are a huge risk for people living with paralysis. The increased sensation also made me realize that my overall circulation had improved while the stimulation was turned off. I had noticed this because my skin had started to clear up and regain a healthy color as opposed to a grayish pale color. With the increased circulation, I also regained the ability to sweat. This allowed me to stay out in the heat longer and keep my body cool whereas before I could only spend no longer than 30 minutes out, out in the sun on a hot day. And now that I'm able to, to sweat normally, I can get back outside and do the things I love, such as coaching baseball and helping out with, with youth organizations. The epidural stimulation has also helped my lung function. I've been able to get longer, deeper breaths while working out. I've been able to cough without any assistance, which again, sounds unusual, but as a quadriplegic, I didn't have the lung abdominal strength to cough without help. So better lung function helps me in many aspects of someone who lives with paralysis. Better breathing, being able to cough, allows me to break up the stuff in my lungs to avoid certain issues like pneumonia. Some of the biggest things that I noticed that came back were the, the bla bladder and bowel function. This has given me the ability and freedom to go and do things I please, so I can go out in public or I can go on long plane rides and not have to worry about bathroom issues or unaccessibility issues. And if you were to ask anyone living with paralysis on a daily basis what the one thing is they'd want to get back, the number one thing they would all tell you would be bladder and bowel function so they could be more independent without having to live and rely on other people for those, those types of issues. I've also regained sexual function without the use of any medication or any other devices. This is very important for people living with paralysis, especially those who are trying to start families and can live a normal life. All of these have come back while the epidural stimulation is turned off. But when the stimulator is turned on, I have the ability to stand with a walker now, and I can also move my toes, ankles, knees, and hips all on command, which is huge in taking the next step to literally be able to take the next step. Each one of these I have gained back or have seen a great improvement. Each one of these things I have, I have seen a great improvement on is great by itself, but when you put them all together, it's absolutely unbelievable. And it has completely changed my life from where I was five years ago. It has allowed me to be independent again, and but more than anything, it's given me my confidence back in who I am. So I'd like to, again, thank the NIB IB for everything they do and continue to please fund all these great things so that in the next 10 years, my story will just be another regular story. Thank you very much. Now, I think it was uh, obvious, but I neglected to underscore that he had a high-level cervical spine injury and was a quadriplegic for four years um, uh, after his injury uh, and uh, what he was recounting was after the, the stimulation and after his complete paralysis. So the overarching uh, workshop of this goal is to identify uh, strategic areas for NIH to invest in to catalyze this uh, neuromodulation research. There has been considerable uh, planning that has gone into um, establishing and organizing this workshop. There was a uh, bioelectrics medicine summit meeting that was uh, co-held by the NIH uh, with a number of industrial uh, colleagues uh, and in the dates that you see there where the idea was uh, 
bringing the research community, the global research community together. The NIH has established a common fund working group. You've heard about this uh, in a general sense with quite a number of NIH institutes participating in this, uh, which is uh, typical of common fund activities. As you heard from Jim, these are all trans NIH uh, activities that uh, support the research and the missions of multiple institutes across the NIH. And you can see all of them involved in this particular effort. Uh, we've continued to have conversations, again, with the community inside and outside, uh, within the government and outside the government, as you can see there. And indeed, uh, as is uh, common practice for us uh, here at the NIH to receive input from the broader community with a series of RFAs, RFIs, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, is uh, listed there. Uh, one focusing on input regarding the use and, and uh, potential utility of devices that already have received market approval, but for other applications and having those potentially adapted uh, for this purpose. Uh, information on addressing the mechanisms that underlie uh, this particular approach, uh, understanding neural control and neuromodulation. And then uh, the third one, uh, information on developing technologies that would be needed to take advantage of this understanding uh, that would be obtained uh, in our approach uh, as uh, requested in the middle RFI. The goal of this particular workshop in broad strokes is quite straightforward. It really is to uh, listen uh, to all of you, both in this room and those that are listening by way of the webcast, to inform uh, us in our decision-making process and to help with planning the next steps for this particular initiative, uh, stimulating peripheral activity to relieve medical conditions or simply spark. So with that as a way of introduction, I'll turn this over to my colleagues to follow, Alan Willard and Craig Germino. Great. Good morning. I'm going to give you a very brief um, update on the status of what we've been doing here within NIH to get this SPARC initiative moving. And just to remind you of the opportunity and the challenge, just in dramatic stories such as the one that Dr. Pettigrew just shared with you, we are aware that there are these incredible opportunities um, to enhance end organ function by various forms of stimulation. At the moment, we have um, these, these interesting observations. What we don't have are good understandings of the mechanisms of action. And so the real challenge for us is to be able to get from cases where we have a spectacularly, surprisingly good result to ones where we have a good result and we're not surprised and we were expecting it to happen as a result of the treatments that we do. So our challenge here is to um, use the amazing technological advances that have happened to help us understand the biology, to use the discoveries in biology to reverse engineer and reverse translate and move back to the technology and to get through this iterative process to come up with new therapies. And just as a reminder, for those of you who haven't thought about um, peripheral um, um, nervous system in, in some period of time, we have um, outlined here uh, the major elements of the um, autonomic, uh, parasympathetic, and sympathetic nervous systems. As one who used to work on the enteric nervous system, I have to point out that there are an enormous number of um, of cells, let's see if I've got a pointer here, enormous number of, of cells within, within the, uh, the lining of the intestine. In fact, as many as, thanks, 
as many as one, if I do it here, I think people who see the screen can get it. There are as many neurons in the enteric nervous system as there are in the spinal cord. So somewhat different density, but lots of them there. So if we look at this amazing neuroanatomy, there are incredible opportunities. And the challenge for us is to how to take advantage of them. So if we think about what we need to be able to really understand it, we need detailed knowledge of the physiology and neurophysiology of these various um, visceral organ systems. We also really need to understand what is the extent of individual variation, both between individuals within a species and also variation between species if we're going to take good advantage of various animal models. So there's just, as one who spent the early part of his career working on the peripheral nervous system, it's incredibly exciting to me to see where we are today and to see this focus and interest in really getting into the peripheral nervous system and understanding how to use it to help improve the lot of patients with a variety of conditions. So um, what are we thinking about now? As Dr. Anderson said, when you think common fund, you think big and bold. Um, but you also don't think forever. So here, order of magnitude, we're thinking um, something on the order of $200 million over seven years. These things can vary according to opportunities. And the teams um, working on SPARC uh, can be divided into four groups. So the biology team, where we're really um, interested in getting the kinds of detailed anatomic and functional mapping that we need to really understand how these systems work the technology development team that will help us get the next generation tools, getting the better um, neuromodulation systems, really understanding how to use new technologies in the peripheral nervous system. We're aware of amazing things going on in optogenetics, incredible electrode technologies. We're hearing about this every day in the NIH Brain Initiative where all these um, technologies are being developed for studies in the central nervous system. Many of them will be wonderfully applicable to making advances in the peripheral nervous system as well. These kind of developments aren't going to happen just in academic and, and, and medical institutions. We're going to need very thoughtful partnerships with industry and with FDA. All of these various types of devices which can have both short-term and potentially long-term plasticity-mediated effects really need to be thought about very carefully. And so um, there's probably going to be some interesting action in the regulatory space as well as we move forward with these. And then finally, if we're really going to make advance on the aggressive timelines that Jim talked about, where we're really trying to make a big difference, a catalytic difference in five to 10 years, we need to be sharing data very effectively. And so we have to be thinking about how to get this data into a publicly available resource and how to really use um, good modern modeling and theoretical methods to be able to take advantage of the data to to uh, make that move between biology and function and therapy. So a lot of interesting challenges, and I know that during the course of the next two days, we're going to hear about a lot of really interesting opportunities and additional challenges. Um, we have released the first funding opportunity announcement for the SPARC program. This one is an exploratory one um, focused on developing tools for the discovery of mechanisms. Um, for those of you who do um, uh, business regularly with NIH, the U18 is probably not a familiar mechanism. You can think of it as an R21, so it's a two-year a two grant with a modest budget, uh, but the U means that it's a cooperative agreement and that there's more partnership with NIH and a bit more management. The most important point on this slide is that for anyone interested, um, there's a pre-application informational teleconference on March 5th from 3.30 to 4.30. I would also point out that the contact person here is Dr. Grace Pang, who is at the table. And I'll show you a picture of her for those of you uh, uh, in a minute so that uh, if you have questions for her, you can talk to her during the course of the meeting. Um, just a couple of points about this funding opportunity announcement. It's really heavily focused on identifying technologies that will enable us to have end organ control, neural control of end organ function. So it's not just technology for technology's sake. We really want to have this end goal in mind. Again, this is part of the common fund where we've got a big picture goal here. And so um, in these applications, people really need to be describing how the pre proposed technology is going to be tailored to enable us to understand how to achieve end organ control through modulation of neural activity. 
So people, and it's spelled out here, people need to define appropriate um, technology challenges. Like with R21s, there's no preliminary data expected or required, but you should have some reasonably sound theoretical rationale for why you want to um, uh, develop or improve the technology um, that you're thinking about. Okay. Um, there is a Spark website, and on the Spark website, um, funding opportunity announcements like this one will be described. Um, here, I'll show you the actual URL, but if you're like me and you don't remember URLs, Google can always find it. Google is especially good at finding NIH sites, NIH Spark. I don't think it's just Big Brother following me, but anything that I want to find like this, usually the top hits are up there. And so this website will have um, links to requests for information, funding opportunity announcements, workshops, and very importantly, that March 5th webinar. So now, as promised, I have pictures of the members of the team who I encourage you to interact with today. So here's Grace Pang, who is the lead for the funding opportunity announcement. Right beside her is Jill Carrington, who's lead of the biology team. Um, I thought I saw Vina here. Raise your hand, Vina. Somewhere. Not, not in the room, I guess. Um, working on data coordination. I know Dan Tagley couldn't be with us, but here's a picture of Dan. He gets around a lot. You'll see him somewhere. And then, of course, Mary Perry, who um, helps demystify common fund for those of us who don't work in it every day. And she has several advanced degrees in cat herding, which come in incredibly useful for us. And so she can consult with you on that, along with many other things. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Greg Germino, who will give you your marching orders for um, the rest of the meeting. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. You've heard, I think, from our previous speakers the tremendous opportunities that lie ahead. I think particularly in the many of the organ systems that we in NIDDK are particularly responsible for, these are really untapped potential. And so we're very excited about participating in this, uh, this initiative. As you've heard, the goal of our SPARC program is to build detailed, integrated, functional, and anatomical neural circuit maps in multiple organs in humans suitable for guiding therapeutic approaches in the future. In order to achieve this ambitious goal, it will require the close cooperation of diverse groups of, uh, of investigators and clinicians who are not generally accustomed work to working with each other. This program will require the input of neuroscientists, of physiologists, electrical engineers, bioengineers, surgeons, computational and database experts, uh, and specialists from a variety of other medical disciplines who will all participate in this, uh, in this endeavor. We will need to draw on expertise from academia, government, industry, research institutes, research institutes, and their participation, recruiting their participation in building new teams that can work in an iterative, transformative fashion. Today's workshop is an important step in this process. We have three overarching goals for this workshop. The first big question is what information that we want to address during this, this, this workshop is what information is required to, a, to build maps that are suitable for guiding safe and effective uh, neuromodulation therapies. Specifically, what parameters of the nervous system must be defined? We obviously expect this require detailed knowledge of the neuroanatomy, of fiber sizes, fiber conduction properties, neurotransmitters, but are there any others that we're missing that we should need to think about? What parameters of the target organs also need to be defined and understood? What assays do we need to develop for measuring response? And more importantly, for, develop, for being able to measure uh, uh, effectiveness of our interventions. How can we leverage the animal and human data to build better functional human maps? The second big question that we need to address during this workshop is what technologies do we currently have that we can apply to these mapping efforts? And at least as important is what technologies do we need to develop to help promote the science and promote our mapping efforts? And finally, what types of data do we expect to generate, and how will we capture this information and share this in a way that is most useful to the broader community? We want to consider this issue prospectively, building things, and then later on trying to figure out how to connect things up. So this is really an, a very proactive step that's going to follow and is going to go along in parallel with all of our mapping efforts. 
Our organizers have carefully structured the workshop to begin with an overview of current approaches and challenges in neuromodulation therapy and a review on the autonomic nervous system. This is followed by a series of sessions that feature presentations from both a biological and technological perspective on a number of organ systems. They have intentionally selected a reasonably simple and well-understood system, bladder control, as the first, and then over the next couple of sessions, over the next day and a half, the workshop will increasingly look into more complex systems that are less well characterized. Please be assured that the organ systems that were selected are simply just examples. These are models, and really we encourage you to think broadly about where we can have the best impact, where is the greatest need and the greatest opportunity. In addition to these topics, they've included additional sessions that, in, that ad address three other uh, main themes. One addresses the data issue, featuring case studies and how diverse data sets might be coordinated and assembled into a comprehensive uh, searchable database available to others, to everyone. Another looks at how we might use studies in both humans and animal models to build human relevant maps and tools. And finally, a session that reviews parallel efforts by others to develop neuromodulation therapies and approaches for the peripheral nervous system. Each speaker has been asked to address a common set of questions that have been selected to help frame subsequent discussions. The intent is to focus on both opportunities and challenges. And of course, the entire workshop is sprinkled liberally with opportunities for discussion. We want large blocks of time where we want really all of you to engage in discussion as we try to address these three overarching questions. We also have asked our session chairs to collate important points from their sessions with our leaders, which our leaders will use tomorrow to spark, and this is intentionally a bad pun, our final discussions tomorrow afternoon before we close. Finally, on behalf of my co-directors, I want to thank Mary Perry, Christina Falk, our co-leads, Jill, Grace, Vinay, and Dan, our program staff who have also worked to help develop this agenda, and finally, our extramural investigators who have been helping us very, uh, very greatly on developing this, Drs. Uh, DeGroat and Pauli, for taking our vague plan to have a workshop to somehow kick off this very ambitious initiative and transforming this into an incredible one and a half day fusion of biology, technology, and the science of information management. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm incredibly excited to be here. Um, as a, a brief writer before I give the talk, it's also worth pointing out that prior to coming to the NIH, I was a research scientist at CBRX, which was a company that did neuromodulation for end organ function, in this case, hypertension and or heart failure. So I'm going to give a broad overview of really what's already out there in industry in this space, and there's a lot more than you might think. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about my specific experiences in designing a next generation therapy for the company and how the level of biology that we needed at the time wasn't quite there. And I think there's a perfect storm of opportunity here, uh, given advances in technology that currently have been uh, demonstrated in the brain, et cetera, uh, and apply it to this to really create an order of magnitude difference in our understanding of these therapies and their how effective they are. So as uh, Rod said, this is not an old idea. Um, this is actually a picture from a paper from Brumwald in the 1970s where he was stimulating the carotid sinus nerves in patients for angina. These actually were a series of uh, studies done from the 60s and 70s. And these were actually quite effective, I might add. Um, there were some the reason this didn't go into a regular therapy were a couple of reasons. One, there was concern about not just stimulating what you want, but stimulating what you don't want on the carotid sinus nerve, in this case, the chemoreceptors. The technology was a little bit bulky, and there were some concerns about damage of the carotid sinus nerve long term as well. But most importantly, there was a lot of advances in drugs at that time. 
and they thought they were going to solve a lot of these problems. And what turned out is they didn't solve these problems. But even before that, if you're looking at work for vagal stim to impact the spleen, that goes back to the 1870s and 1880s. This is not only not a new idea, it's a very old idea. But that being said, there's been a lot of recent success showing the promise of neuromodulation of end organ function. This is the Inspire system, recently uh, got a PMA, and the Inspire system is for sleep apnea. It stimulates the hypoglossal nerve. This is also a closed loop system where they sense when there's uh, a breathing abnormalities or airway uh, obstruction so that they know how to stimulate. This is the enteromedic system, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but it stimulates the abdominal vagus. Um, it is a blocking system for obesity that essentially blocks the signal that tells you that you're hungry. This is the CVRX Neo system, which stimulates the carotid baroreceptors for hypertension. I'll talk a little bit more about this, but it got what's called a, an HDE, a humanitarian device exemption, as their commercial approval quite recently for intractable hypertensive who were responsive in their, uh, their original trial. And then there are some older devices as well um, that have FDA approval, such as the Medtronic Interstim device. It's a sacral nerve stimulator for uh, urinary and fecal incontinence. This, for spinal cord injury, is the Fintech Brindley system, which actually stimulates motor efferents just off the sacral nerve. This was actually got an HDE in 1997. And this is really interesting when you start talking about the small market indications as well, because I believe they took it off the market in 2007 because commercial sustainability became an issue. This is another one I want to mention, which is arguably end organ function, but I think is really important. This just got a 510K. And what a 510K means, it's based off a predicate device. They did not have to do a sham controlled study and show effect. But what it is, is a spinal cord stimulator for pain, which have been on the market for years, but it's wireless. There's no battery. They just implant the electrodes. And that's the sort of technology that is coming online now um, that makes these systems potentially very minimally invasive, very minimal risk as part of the surgical procedure. I could also talk a little bit about not neuromodulation of end organ systems and mention neuropace or second sight. Um, that's a, a retinal prosthetic for people with retinitis uh, pigmentosa in case of second sight. Um, and neuropace is a responsive neural stimulation for epilepsy and seizures. Bottom line, in many of the drug and, and, and uh, biologics companies are having difficulties showing success and getting FDA approvals in these large clinical trials. We have success in humans, and in many cases, it's phenomenology. We don't know exactly how it works. It's not just the US. In fact, if you look in Europe or other countries, neuromodulation of end organ system is even much more common um, in terms of clinical practice. So for heart failure, um, there are two systems that have CE mark, which is approval for sale in Europe, which is the CVRX Neo system, which stimulates the baroreceptors, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. The BioControls CardioFit system, which stimulates the vagus. Cyberonix actually uh, submitted uh, in December, I'm not sure, maybe uh, Milton has an update for us when he gives the talk as a former employee of Cyberonix and now an independent contractor, I believe. Um, for hypertension, also the Neo system. Several companies have renal denervation systems, CE marked in Europe, Medtronic, Boston Sci, St. Jude, Covidian, which is interesting because Medtronic did an inversion with Covidian and, and the Recore system. Um, also the Medicare Diamond system, which stimulates the stomach muscles ostensibly for obesity and type 2 diabetes. So these are in human beings. These are showing effect sometimes in sham control studies, sometimes in not sham control studies but they're in human patients right now. This is much more advanced than you think in terms of clinical practice, and it's amazing how much of this is based off of phenomenology, that we just stick an electrode in, we try it, and we see an effect. I made this slide up, I'd love to say this was scientific, that I went to clinicaltrials.gov, et cetera. These are clinical studies where they're stimulating the vagus that I'm aware of off the top of my head. I only made one of these up. <laughs> and I, re I really have four points for this slide. First is that they're stimulating the vagus. In many cases, they're stimulating it in very similar ways. 
this to the laymen or to scientists who aren't in the space sounds too good to be true. And that doesn't mean there's not a lot of promise here. In fact, many of these have a lot of compelling open label data that's quite frankly probably a better than the animal data you have to support a lot of things. But what it really means is that if you're in this field, you have to be really scientifically meticulous in how you do your studies and how you convey them because you're fighting knee-jerk skepticism. And so it's not just for your particular area or interest for treatment that you have to do this, but it's for all the other ones. Because if you oversell vagal nerve stimulation and the data to support it for your indication, you bring skepticism for all these things that actually do have great promise. Secondly, so there's a lot of safety data on vagal nerve stimulation. There's hundreds of thousands of patients for epilepsy. But typically, they're not looking for side effects to this level of detail. So if you're thinking there's some promise in all these indications, the question is, what are you doing long term when you're stimulating, especially when many of these you're stimulating in the exact same location in a very similar fashion, and many of the effects are purported to be plasticity mediated, which means if you're not looking for them, you're not going to find them. The other thing that's really worth mentioning, especially to the academics, when I see, and I'm very happy to see a lot of industry representation, a lot of the data that's out there for these trials doesn't come in the way that you're used to it. It doesn't come in papers. There are PMA summaries that tell you not just the effects, not the side effects, the unpublished preclinical data, et cetera. And if you're looking at vagal nerve stimulation for hypertension or for heart failure, you really should be looking at vagal nerve stimulation for everything to understand that system very well. Um, and really, the, the, the fourth point I wanted to make is that I'm a, a bit of a smart ass. Now, this all sounds really promising, but there's a caveat. So there are several neuromodulation RCTs. These are blind, double-blinded, sham-controlled clinical trials that didn't meet their primary efficacy mark or their primary efficacy point in the US after doing an open label study um, in Europe to get their CE mark. And what an open label study means typically is you're not blinded, not always, but often. You're not necessarily randomized. Pretty much everybody knows who's on. So for the Enteromedics and Power System, they got their CE mark. They came to the US. Um, they did their RCT. And they're stimulating for weight loss. And in their on arm, the great thing about an implantable device is you can implant it and not turn it on. Um, so that's called a sham arm. So they actually had a large percentage excess weight loss in these patients in the sham arm without stimulating. Um, they were looking for a primary endpoint difference of 10% between the on and off arm. They got roughly an 8% difference. This was enough to get them a panel decision, and the panel decision was very interesting as well. This was statistically significant. So this is you know, scientifically rigorous data, but it's not quite the effect they were hoping for. They got an eight to one decision on safety, a four to five decision on efficacy, and a six to two for approval, and eventually they got their PMA. CMS reimbursement, et cetera, is going to be a different story that they're gonna have to fight with. Um, Medtronic Simplicity, this is the renal uh, denervation, and their open label trials in Europe, I wanna say they had roughly a 28 millimeter drop. They came to the US, they had a sham arm, they had a large drop in their sham arm. Boston side just had their nectar trial for cardiac, um, well, for heart failure, and they showed cardiac remodeling, open label. They showed, when they did a sham controlled study, they showed no difference between the two arms. Um, and this is a wider phenomenon, not just for um, stimulation of end organ function. The broad and reclaimed trial, there's similar data for depression, there's similar data for epilepsy from the Sante trial. So I want to talk a little bit about my personal experience and relate it to the biology. I come from CVRX. I no longer get money from CVRX right now. And what we did is stimulated the baroreceptors, and we implanted a glove on both sides of the carotid sinus, wrapped it around the carotid sinus. This is a fairly extensive surgery. The glove is also insulation that directs the current where you want it to go. We did the open label trial in Europe, got a very good blood pressure drop, and then we did a sham controlled study where at six months, we only had one third of the, or two thirds of the patients on, one third off. We didn't get the result we were looking for. First of all, we failed our safety endpoint. 
We wanted an 82% complication free rate. We got a 74.8% because we were doing roughly the equivalent of a double endarterectomy. You cause a lot of nerve damage when you do it. We also failed our what's called acute efficacy, which is the percentage of patients with a 10 millimeter drop in both arms. And what you'll see is we got a really large percentage with a 10 millimeter drop in our off arm. So we were looking for percentage of patients with a small um, drop as our primary efficacy endpoint. As a pre-specified ancillary efficacy endpoint, we looked at people who had completely controlled hypertension. And what we saw was statistically significant difference. 42% of the patients at six months in the on-arm had com completely controlled hypertension. These are intractable hypertensive on an average of six medications, many as many as 15. We're doing a pretty good job. It was 24% in the off-arm. And then you turn everybody on. And it was 50% of the patients in both arms had treated hypertension. So this is effect in humans statistically significant in a randomized controlled study. We did not um, go to a panel decision because we had failed safety and we had failed our primary efficacy endpoint. So with your CVRX, what do you do? You try to develop a minimally invasive system and you hire somebody fresh from grad school to develop the minimally invasive interface. And so that was my job. This is actually the next generation system that has shown similar effects to get a CE mark in Europe and is now in pivotal trials in the United States. And what I wanted to talk about is as the person designing this electrode interface, all the stuff I didn't know about the biology that really would have helped me design this device. And it's one of the reasons I absolutely hate this picture. This picture gives you an idea that you know where the baroreceptors are. We know the baroreceptors are on the media adventitia border. We have no idea their distribution. We have no idea the variance from patient to patient. But it's worse than that. We didn't know we were stimulating the baroreceptors. We could have been stimulating the baroreceptors, the SIZ, which is a, those are mechanoreceptors of the baroreceptors. The SIZ is a spike initiating zone. We could have been stimulating proximal afferents. We could have been stimulating the carotid sinus nerve that Brumwald was doing in the 60s and 70s. We didn't know what we were stimulating for side effects. Most common side effect was pain, which limited how much we could do our therapy. We didn't know the location of the pain afferents, whether on the vessel or off the vessel. We definitely didn't know the minimal functional unit to create these effects. And this is really important. If you're going to make a really small electrode, you need to figure out what the smallest volume you can stimulate that creates the effect you want and creates the side effects that you don't want. We certainly didn't know the locations and densities of any of this neural mapping in the canines, which were the common model we were using, or in the human beings, certainly we didn't know. This is important in terms of the mapping that we're talking about. We didn't know the location of vascular points of access. What uh, most academics don't realize is that the, the holy grail is essentially to have an implant through the venous system. The cardiac pacer is implanted through the venous system. So it's not just where there's neurobiology that creates the effect, it's where there's access points. So knowing where there's highways is important. Um, we didn't know the variance in anatomy from subject to subject. Certainly that's an incredibly important point for physiological mapping. Anchoring techniques to prevent electrode movement, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, so I won't go into it. This is incredibly important. Animal data does not recapitulate the effectiveness given multiple medications and multiple different pathologies. There's probably 40 different reasons you can be hypertensive. We did our studies in a normal tensive or obese model. And then for all of this, we really don't understand the long-term impact of uh, adaptation. A lot of these are, even if you're doing a chronic study, you stimulate for three weeks, you implant for a year. You're not looking at stimulating for a year or two and what sort of adaptation happens for the system. So there's lots of limitations in the animal model. You might ask me, can't I just create electrodes and try them in the animal model? I'm not going to go into too much detail here um, because I'm limited on time. But what I want to stress is that electric fields fall off really quickly from an electrode, and it depends on size. Um, if you have a field of strength of 1 at 10 microns, it's 1 fourth at 20 microns. It's 1 16th at 40 microns. Plus, as you get to smaller electrodes, there's edge effects. There's uh, difficulties with your insulation steering current. Bottom line, the current going to your nerves is different than you thought. Other problem is the nerves are different than you thought. The way nerves are activated depend on their size, their degree of myelination, their orientation. 
all of that changes in an animal model in a nonlinear way that's difficult to predict. There are fundamental differences in physiology. Um, many people aren't aware that there are different vagal afferents in the canine model than there are in the human beings as well, and that's really the common model. Um, side effects are almost impossible to affect in animal models. Um, when I first turned up a patient too high in the clinic, it hurt him and he threatened to beat me up. That doesn't happen in the animal model. Um, and then, of course, there's a range of pathologies that cause the same symptoms, and there's drug interactions that these don't recapitulate. So the other question is, do we need to know the maps ahead of time if we can do surgical mapping, if we can just try it in surgery? If you've ever been part of these surgical procedures, you'll realize this is much more art than science. These are end of one procedures, and a lot of times, you can't see what you're lighting up with these electrodes. And you're using surrogate biomarkers for effect. If you're using blood pressure or heart rate, they have high variance in a procedure. Anesthesia affects these, plus they affect circuit function. And the other thing from a neural interface point of view, the field's a bloody mess. Current goes in a lot of places you won't, that they're not going to go chronically. So mapping isn't the way to do this sort of physiology that you need to know. Um, there's a lot of techniques post hoc that people hypothesize where if I'm not in the right location, I can use st different stimulation ideas to stimulate what I want or stimulate, not stimulate what I don't want to stimulate. Um, there's several of these, whether it's uh, to activate by fiber type, uh, to activate by location, there's blocking currents you can do, or you could put an electrode to block what you don't want to stimulate. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Most of these techniques have never been validated in a chronic situation. Mostly modeling of which the assumptions on conductivity are questionable. Mostly acute demonstrations. Very little published chronic validation that these techniques get the specificity you want. But most importantly, even if you take them to work as well as you possibly hoped, they change the threshold differences between nerve types roughly one-fifth to 5x. Fall off of an electric field is 1 over r squared. That's very mathy. It means it falls off much faster than that. It means the dominant effect will always be how close you are to what you want to stimulate and how far away you are from what you don't want to stimulate. Um, there's one caveat to this, and I'm going to give a shout out to my colleague Milton Morris. He talked about the neural language of love. Often we do continuous stimulation, which is not really the way these things are encoded. There may be some ability to differentiate effect by knowing how the body encodes things so you only send the message to the brain or the message to the end organ system that you want and not to the things you don't want. And I just like the phrase, neural language of love. Um, so really the question is, and I'll go through this quickly, um, why weren't these biological unknowns that I really needed to design a minimally invasive system and therapy and stimulation protocol known? The tools didn't exist. There were no stains for baroreceptors specific. We couldn't record in a way where we could differentiate whether we were activating the baroreceptors, the spike initiating zone, afferents, the carotid sinus nerve. We couldn't record the nerves at all for side effects because you had to make guesses as to what the side effects were in the animal model. We had no way to determine the extent of rec recruitment, the minimum functional unit we needed to activate to create the effect we wanted or the side effects we didn't. We had no tools to modulate with cell type specificity or like with optogenetics where there's a laser where I know what's being activated primarily to a certain extent. Um, functional anatomical maps with variants just didn't exist in animals and it doesn't exist in human beings. And there, this is incredibly important, I think, for Spark going forward. There were limited opportunities to establish the animal relevance with human data. Many of these companies are making a bet on a device design and animal models and then pushing it to approval as fast as they can. The truth is the leap to human beings is huge. We saw gross differences in the obvious responders uh, in stimulation parameters, in terms of amplitude, pulse width, and frequency in the human data that from the animal models. We're really going to need to tie that, um, that reverse translation, establish the clinical relevance of these models, there's limitations to what you can do in humans, but that's going to be incredibly important for Spark going forward. Um, the great thing is, though, I do think of this as a perfect storm of opportunity. All of these things I mentioned, there are new tools that have been de developed in the brain and new opportunities that can be applied to the peripheral nervous system. These are tractable solutions. We're not going to solve everything, but if we do this, our therapies, I guarantee you, will get an order of magnitude better. Questions? And I went over on time, so limited time for questions.
<coughs> Dr. Ludwig, is this on? Yes. Uh, the carotid sinus is innervated by baroreceptors and chemoreceptors yep. in animals. And uh, do we know anything about in the model that you use the size of the axons, the thresholds for those two types of axons? And can you stimulate baroreceptors in isolation from chemoreceptors? Because chemoreceptor stimulation often raises blood pressure or activates sympathetic nerves, whereas baroreceptor inhibits sympathetic nerve activity. So the truth of the matter is you're dead right. And the idea was that when you stimulate the carotid sinus nerve, which has more chemoreceptors, that's even more of a problem. The baroreceptors would be more isolated from the chemoreceptors, but not perfectly. But the truth of the matter is, no, we can't stimulate that specifically. We're activating probably everything that is on the arterial wall to some extent, and we can't visualize what we're activating. And those are incredibly important tools to have to really understand how these therapies work. And activation of one pathway turn off, may turn off the effect of the other pathway. And because of the sizing difference and density differences, you also see very different, all you're really doing is measuring blood pressure effects or norepinephrine spillover and et cetera. Um, in human beings, you actually saw very different time courses in the effect as well, which suggested you may be stimulating different things uh, to create your effect. So I saw one more question. All right, thank you very much. While Dr. Morris is uh, being introduced and coming up to the microphone, I'll just mention that I'm the staff member who was given the charge to keep people on time. And so far, we're 10 minutes off, and it was time well invested. Um, but I will give you the sign when there are five minutes left and when there are two minutes left. And after that, we'll institute a bell system, I understand. So I'll <laughs> try to avoid that. Uh, it will be like this, five minutes <laughs> and two minutes. And um, and we need to ask everyone to use microphones. Even you, Dr. B even the chairs need to go to the microphone because people can't hear on the, and I'm not using my microphone when I say that, people can't hear on the video cast otherwise. Sorry about that lack of microphone. So uh, the second speaker in the orientation session then is Dr. Milton Morris, and, and long time of cyberonics, as we all know, and short time of MEH. Biomedical, uh, which he may be telling us about. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, have no plans on telling you about MEH Biomedical. I won't bore you with that story. It is short. Um, I have spent uh, the majority of my time at uh, in the medical device space, about 23 years, uh, the latest of which was Senior Vice President Research and Development at Cyberonics. I do want to focus a little bit our attention on some of the challenges that we had uh, it's good to be transitioning out of the company. I can now uh, explain to you some of the frustrations that, uh, that we've had as an engineering organization to this point. Uh, I know we're short on time, so hopefully this will be an opportunity to catch up. Uh, the previous speakers have actually hit a lot of the salient points that I chose to, uh, to focus on in my talk. Uh, this is just our neuromodulation uh, person. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities to plug into uh, the neural anatomy to provide therapeutic benefits. Uh, some have already reached FDA approval. Uh, there are a few that are also um, off into the future that I do want to touch upon, uh, specifically heart failure. I won't be making any announcements about the, uh, the approval status for the submission uh, for Cyberonics today, uh, but I'm hoping that that can be talked or discussed uh, in the, in the not-too-distant future. First, uh, as an industry, we do like to talk about numbers. Um, we like healthy, large problems to solve. Um, and so I just want to speak briefly to a few of those. Uh, on the epilepsy side, um, fairly large patient cohort uh, that are indicated for vagus nerve stimulation therapy. Uh, I don't think that one's working. Here we go. Uh, vagus nerve stimulation therapy uh, for uh, intractable epilepsy, patients that are drug refractory. As it turns out, if you have failed uh, two drugs, uh, anti-epileptic drugs, you have less than a 3% chance of ever reaching seizure freedom, uh, which gives an opportunity for neuromodulation to step in or some sort of an alternative uh, therapy for, for treating these patients. Uh, epilepsy is an important pathology. Uh, not that all pathologies are defined by whether or not it can uh, be mortal uh, for you, but there is a 25 to 40 times 
um, increase or fold increase in the mortality rate of, of, uh, of patients suffering with epilepsy. And it is a fairly costly um, um, burden to our, our healthcare system here in the United States. There are FDA approved uh, therapies, uh, VNS therapy that Cybronic provides, as well as uh, the NeuroPACE technology, which is a wholly in the skull uh, technology or system uh, for treating uh, epilepsy. And there is favorable coverage for the vagus nerve stimulation uh, version of this therapy. Depression is also a large uh, marketplace. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this because of the importance that clinical trials uh, play in the, uh, in the ability to treat patients with neuromodulation therapy. Some 4 million patients struggling in the U.S. with, uh, with depression. Some 25% of those are drug refractory. Again, those are the patient population. That is the patient population that is, uh, is, is uh, for indication for neuromodulation. Um, some 39,000 patients are, are uh, suicidal are moving toward uh, or, or will move toward suicide attempts. Um, many of those will be successful. Uh, and greater than $43 billion of cost, direct and indirect, mostly related to productivity or the loss of productivity in the workplace. Uh, again, I'll come back to depression when we talk about clinical trials. Um, FDA approved for, um, for, uh, for therapy on the VNS side, non-favorable coverage recommendation, which we've talked about as a company uh, publicly and uh, has actually very much limited the ability to get this therapy into the hands of patients who need it. Uh, what was interesting in both the epilepsy and the depression clinical trials, pivotal clinical trials, and um, what we're finding in, in some of the heart failure data is that patients have mood improvements. Uh, they feel better on this therapy. Talk about side effects that are beneficial. Um, that is one, and it led us to doing the depression uh, trials. Heart failure, something that Kip talked about just, uh, just a moment ago, is an emerging therapy, some 700,000 new diagnosed cases annually. It does have a five-year, 50% mortality rate and uh, is a huge burden to uh, the healthcare system uh, in the United States. Uh, at the five-year mark, you do have a number of patients who will have passed away in many cases due to uh, some sort of uh, death um, causing or sudden death causing arrhythmia. And I know that we'll talk a little bit more about arrhythmia later on in this, uh, in this uh, workshop. We are in pivotal and, and pilot trials here. Uh, they have been a little bit inconsistent. Uh, we've been successful on the Cybronic side uh, with our Anthem HF clinical trial. Uh, and we've seen a little bit of struggle on the, on the uh, Nectar HF side from, uh, from Boston Scientific, though I believe they're looking for longer-term follow-ups to finally understand how their approach to neuromodulation for heart failure will work. I won't belabor the initial point here, which I think uh, the previous speakers uh, talked about very well. It is very difficult to fashion a human clinical trial in neuromodulation if you are not uh, fully aware of the physiology and the cause and effect of, of your stimulation. Uh, it is the case that sham control trials are difficult to run. We do see a lot of movement in what we would call an underdosed population or would think or refer to as an underdosed population. In our depres depression trial for uh, cyberonics, uh, we stimulated it what we thought was an underdosed uh, um, output. Turned out that those patients felt better. Um, could be placebo could be the case that uh, those low doses are actually efficacious. The problem here that I'm trying to articulate is we don't know. <laughs> and so I think we need to get uh, that understood a little bit better. Um, the cause of or the indirect uh, impact of, of challenges associated with clinical trials is that it dampens the enthusiasm for investment and innovation. So coming to the Spark workshop and seeing both industry and, uh, and government agencies working together is actually fantastic, and I want to thank the organizers for doing that. Uh, reimbursement challenges, the FDA approvals do not uh, suggest that you will get uh, CMS or Medicare uh, favorable recommendations for, for, uh, for reimbursement, and that in and of itself can shut down a, uh, a therapy, as we saw with, uh, with VNS for depression. 
uh, looking toward the, uh, the clinical trials or maybe talking a little bit more about uh, uh, some of the specifics that, uh, that can, can curtail results, favorable results in clinical trials. Um, implantable neuromodulation therapies are typically indicated for drug refractory treatment resistant patients. We save the worst of the worst for neuromodulation. Uh, so we know there are going to be some difficult times ahead for any neuromodulation approach uh, as it relates to human clinical trials because only the most uh, difficult or most challenged patients are going to be included or be moved to an invasive therapy like, uh, like many of the neuromodulation approaches. Uh, we talked about the control groups perceiving low levels of stimulation, um, accentuating any placebo effect, uh, potentially accentuating any placebo effect, but also uh, some of these low-level stimulations uh, could be efficacious. We don't know. Uh, not always obvious what the treatment effect uh, may, may be, uh, and in many cases it takes months coming back to plasticity before you'll actually see or know uh, what that uh, end result will be for the patient that you're, you're trying to treat. We saw in some of our studies patient uh, benefits uh, increasing out to six months before they start to plateau, and so that uh, is something that uh, uh, needs to be considered when designing clinical trials. No quantitative endpoints are known available. So with, uh, with depression, very much a, a questionnaire-driven uh, endpoint. With epilepsy, we chose very arbitrarily, and I'm not sure I could use the term we, uh, uh, given that it was uh, so long ago, but uh, a 50% reduction in seizure frequency was, was a stake put in the ground uh, for, uh, as a definition for response. So if you were a patient who received a greater than 50% reduction in your seizures, during the course of, of, uh, of treatment, then you're placed in the, the responder bucket, and the therapy was said to have responded. Um, interesting. I'm not sure there's a lot of science or data behind that. Um, it does turn out to be the case that these battery-operated implants uh, have to be replaced. If only 50% of the population or 40% of the population was receiving a 50% or greater uh, benefit, then you would expect that only 43% of the population, as the pivotal trial indicated, uh, would, get a, would get a replacement device. We actually see those rates upwards of 90% with, with cyberonics. So um, I think there is more than just uh, the definition as it relates to, uh, to uh, whether or not a patient is deriving benefit. Um, and KIPP uh, really hammered home models uh, for translation, a lot of animal models out there, uh, and they don't all translate very well to humans. Uh, the human condition, particularly in these uh, drug refractory populations, there are many comorbid conditions, there are many pathways to um, how they got to epilepsy or, or depression or heart failure, and teasing them all out is a, is a, large, uh, a large task. Uh, and understanding how animal uh, models uh, can be best augmented to uh, reflect that condition is, is also a bit of a challenge. So stepping forward into the technology, science, and physiology, um, there are limitations in this space as well. Surprise, surprise. Uh, imprecise targeting, and I think Kip kind of hammered this one uh, again. We stimulate where we can place the electrodes, and, uh, and uh, whether there's a nerve there that uh, will, will, will go to the end organ that we're trying to affect or not, uh, we use basic physiology to help us understand that, but um, uh, it is the case that there is a lot of collateral stimulation that can occur as well. Uh, optimal stimulation parameters for any individual patient that's uh, being treated, uh, there are some 7,000 parameter uh, sets uh, in, a, in, a, in a standard pulse generator, and figuring out which ones are the most efficacious has been um, the lot of many physicians' lives uh, for uh, the last uh, 10 or so years. Um, may not be, uh, we talked about therapeutic responses may not be immediate or obvious, and I won't belabor that point. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit about biomarkers. Uh, it is nice to uh, be able to measure biomarkers at the three and the six month uh, timestamps. Be much nicer if we were able to do that in real time and provide some sort of a closed loop system, uh, and uh, uh, the ability to steer our stimulation in a in a uh, um, a, a quantifiable way. 
Uh, response prediction uh, is also an important thing. We seem to have about a 33% problem, uh, which is to say about 33% of our patients don't seem to respond as favorably as we would like. And uh, we need to understand the physiology and why uh, that would be the case. Uh, we believe that if we had better response prediction leading into a therapy, that patients and physicians would step into that therapy with, with greater confidence. Um, so that is a, an, an important aspect of this. And uh, I think we've all talked about the incomplete knowledge of mechanisms of action, uh, but I did want to touch a little bit upon why that would be uh, a, a challenging area and why we might still have a lack of understanding. Uh, well, if you look at just the human vagus nerve, which has been uh, the focus of our attention at Cyberonics, there are over 100,000 axons in the vagus nerve, 80% efferent, 20% efferent, 80% um, C fibers, unmyelinated, large, 20% uh, uh, A fibers and, and B fibers. Which fibers are responsible for the therapeutic effect? Um, it depends on the, the organ that you're trying to, to hit. Um, and there are some hypotheses and good uh, science to uh, depict which fibers are the target fibers. Uh, once you wrap an electrode around the vagus nerve and you deliver electrical stimulation to it, it's hard to guarantee that you will be stimulating any of those fibers or much less not stimulating other fibers. Um, where do these fibers project into the CNS and peripherally? What neuromodulatory systems are excited and or inhibited? This is a great graphic. I like to show this graphic um, just because it gives you the, uh, the, the sense that we actually might know where the, the vagus nerve goes into the brain. Uh, we think it innervates the nucleus tractus solitaris and, and, and hits very important centers of the brain like the locus ceruleus, which supplies norepinephrine, the, the RAF nuclei, which uh, supplies serotonin. Um, we can see where norepinephrine would, be, uh, would, would drive a uh, lack of excitability in the epileptic uh, patient and where serotonin might actually drive some mood improvement in the depressed patient. Um, what isn't shown here, which uh, we've had to learn over time, is that uh, before you can get to this uh, nucleus tractus solitaris uh, along the vagus nerve, you encounter something called the no-dose uh, ganglia. And that uh, no-dose ganglia has a funny way of filtering out some of the stimulation that you tried to provide. And I've got one minute to, to wrap this up. Um, so I'm going to speed this along. Uh, bottom line on that last slide is, just when you think you understand the, the, the anatomical layout and where things go, and we do have good science to, to demonstrate that they, the, the projections in the brain do hit those centers, there are things along the way that you didn't account for that might actually um, inhibit your ability to drive a one-to-one -one effect, a one-to-one -one cause and effect relationship between the stimulation site and the target uh, end organ um, that you're, you're trying to affect. This is just a quick slide that uh, um, talks a little bit about um, a, a finite element analysis uh, that was done uh, in collaboration with Helmers uh, et al., which shows uh, an electrode encompassing about 270 degrees of a vagus nerve uh, and at various outputs, both in the acute setting and in the chronic setting, um, that plasticity and uh, also fiber uh, ingrowth uh, can have an effect on how you stimulate. So changing stimulation outputs, uh, it, it is very difficult to, to use the acute settings and expect that they will have the same level of effect in the chronic setting just because you've got uh, a, a changing tissue uh, electrode interface and, uh, and fibrotic tissue that is uh, causing um, the electrical uh, fields to change locally. So how best do you activate uh, the right uh, fiber groups but minimize adverse events? We've talked about that. Uh, last slide here, uh, I wanted to end on something that was a bit of a, a, a positive upswing. We've been talking about the challenges and belaboring those <coughs> a little bit. Uh, I do believe in the neural code. I watered it down a little bit. I didn't think you guys were ready for the love language of, uh, of, uh, <laughs> of the, uh, the vagus nerve. So we, we just talked about it uh, in terms of the neural code. If you think about the amount of money that was spent, the amount of time and energy that was spent in uh, uh, decoding the, the human genome, uh, I'm not suggesting that we have to get to that level to understand or to provide uh, beneficial therapy uh, for patients. Uh, through neuromodulation, but 
uh, we could stand to understand the, the basic physiology and the mechanisms of action a lot more than we do today. And I do think that we're in, a be in the best position ever uh, to do that with some of the, the novel technologies and tools that are coming out. Um, you'll see those tools on the right side just for the people who are remote. I'll walk through them very quickly. Advanced brain imaging technologies, fMRI, SPECT, PET, some of these imaging techniques are, are allowing us to understand uh, uh, um, uh, where uh, uh, blood flow, cerebral blood flow uh, is, is occurring and, and uh, in conjunction with stimulation and helping us to feel more bullish that we're getting the end result or at least touching certain uh, anatomical locations in a reliable way. Optogenetics, uh, very promising as it relates to diagnostics and understanding cause and effect. Uh, the promise of big data, and we'll get into that later in the workshop, nanotechnologies, and signal processing methods and adaptive algorithms that can be used and brought to bear in just understanding uh, in, a, in a more full context the evoked potential that is, a, that is uh, the result of, of stimulation. Um, and I think with that, I'll just uh, call it. Thank you for your time. Milton, that was a very nice presentation about where we are as far as heart failure. I'm going to talk briefly in my presentation on Anthem, Nectar, and possibly Innovate, depending on the time. But I, I, the only point I want to make the comment to this group is that some of these trials that failed, presumably failed, should be used as an opportunity to learn rather than Correct. to defeat the purpose of what we're trying to do. Uh, also, with regard to Kip's comments on animal models, I agree that it's not always translatable to the human. But depending on the model and depending on how it's being used and depending on the ability to replicate the human condition in terms of background therapy and what have you, one can get closer to what it might turn out to be. Yes. Uh, in the end, we have no choice. We cannot use the human as the as a replacement for the animal. But, uh, right. Just just so that we are all on the same page. And I agree with those points 100%. And if you look at uh, my old company, Cyberonics, uh, we continue to move forward with the heart failure trial. Anthem is now moving into Encore. Uh, we've started a, a uh, preserved ejection fraction patient population uh, as well and are not dissuaded by the results of Nectar. We do think that that has a lot more to do with the study design. And uh, we'll look forward to their, their 12 and 18-month and, and results uh, as well. Two more cents on the animal model is you don't have to worry so much about the placebo effect with the animal model. Uh, Dr. Yvette Tache of UCLA is going to take the daunting task of telling us about the autonomic nervous system, bringing us up to speed on it in 15 minutes or 20? Yes. 10 minutes now, <laughs> to be in time. <laughs> so I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to give this overview, So, which is a quite a daunting task indeed. So if we go back to the term of autonomic nervous system that was coined in by Langlais in 1898 to describe the sympathetic system and the allied nervous system of the cranial and sacral nerve and the local system of the gut. Uh, so the autonomic nervous system obviously encompasses now the sympathetic division, the parasympathetic division, and the associated vagal afferent neuron and also the enteric division, which is the largest component with 200 to 600 millions of neurons. These enteric divisions uh, actually um, is organized in the myenteric plexus, which are between the circular and longitudinal muscle, and the submucosal plexus, which is uh, near the mucosa under the muscularis, um, above the muscularis uh, mucosae. The integrative action of the autonomic nervous system was extensively dis described by Wilfried uh, Janning in a single authorship, 600 pages that I recommend you to read to get more insight, which I apologize, I did not get the time to do it as I was preparing for that talk. 
So, but what we could say is that almost all bodily functions are under the control of the autonomic nervous system, which actually adjusts the activity of organ or tissue, not under overt voluntary control. This is a key, um, key point. And there is a lot of examples that you will hear uh, throughout the workshop in relationship with the cardiovascular system and the gastrointestinal system. However, there was uh, some debate about whether to classify some neurons that carry the afferent information to the brain as they were autonomic because at the same time, this afferent uh, neuron carry some information, for example, related to pain uh, from the viscera or from the digestive tract or temperature, and we are not really classified as uh, autonomic afferent, and the name of visceral afferent is more largely uh, used for those type of afferent sending information to the brain. This is a lingering list of major functions which are under the control of uh, autonomic nervous system. Uh, which go from the heart rate force and conduction, the arterial diameter, the mesenteric venous capacity, the pupillary diameter and accommodation of lens, all the exocrine gland secretion from the lacrimal, salivary, gastric, exocrine pancreas, sweat gland, and from genital organs. The endocrine gland are also under the control, which includes those from the pancreas, the adrenal gland, and the liver. Secretions that relate to um, organs like intestinal uh, water or electrolyte secretions. The, all the motility of the gastrointestinal tract, the gallbladder and biliary tract. The regulation of the bladder that you will hear in the next uh, uh, workshop. And the control of micturition, tracheal and brachial diameter, contraction of vasiferant vagina and other internal genitalia. Mobilization of energy store, for instance, fat deposits, pillow erection, and the modulation of autonomic nervous system. So this really shows the importance of this autonomic system in relationship with a lot of uh, functions. What's important from an anatomical point of view is uh, that there is a lot of difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic division. And it must be said that while well, um, the sympathetic and parasympathetic have been uh, named as opposite system based on the early demonstrations that the sympathetic activates the cardiovascular system while the uh, cranial nerve or sacral uh, cranial nerve have an inhibitory effect on cardiovascular function and so like counteract the effect of the sympathetic system, this opposite action of these two system is no longer um, a, a dogma and should not be viewed that way. Actually, both the sympathetic and parasympathetic division act in concert to uh, regulate um, visceral function and the, <coughs> and the vasculature. So they have, um, however, they have very much difference in their origin whereby the sympathetic nerves are uh, mostly originating from the uh, thoracolumbar part of the uh, segment of the spinal cord, while the parasympathetic originate from the uh, craniosacral region. There is also difference in the location of the ganglia, whereby the sympathetic uh, are close to the uh, spinal cord and form a chain, uh, while the parasympathetic um, ganglia are close to the target organs. And obviously, this leads to a very much differential length in the postganglionic fiber, whereby the sympathetic um, are long fibers and parasympathetic postganglionic uh, are short. Uh, one uh, exception is in relationship with the sympathetic innervation of the adrenal medulla, where there is a direct projection from sympathetic neuron into the gland. And so, therefore, uh, we could look at this um, activity in this nerve as a reflect of preganglionic output. Also, interesting work done by uh, Bronstein, first at the NIH and later um, in Germany, clearly established that the um, uh, medulla gland that secrete the norepinephrine and epinephrine in response to sympathetic output 
actually uh, interact with the uh, adrenal cortex that release the uh, cortisol and mineralocorticoid, whereby the activity of this uh, cell in the medulla um, promotes the synthesis of glucocorticoid, showing a very strong interaction between this um, sympathetic outflow and the endocrine um, endocrine response of the adrenal cortex and this autonomic and endocrine system in many ways are uh, intimately um, working together and should be considered as an important uh, function to uh, regulate um, most of the viscera. So this is like a, an overview slide that will be um, mostly um, more detailed by each speaker as they go along with the specific uh, target organ from the bladder to the, to the cardiovascular system, the lung, and the uh, GI tract. But it just um, outlined more clearly the sympathetic autonomic um, pathway uh, in relationship with the preganglionic sympathetic neurons, which are along this uh, thoracic lumbar segment of the spinal cord, the overall projections that go into the different um, a sympathetic uh, trunk or uh, uh, vertebral ganglia, and those projections that go um, along the uh, prevertebral uh, ganglia, which compose the inferior, superior, and celiac ganglia, and their projection to target organ, while the uh, parasympathetic originate from the uh, cranial uh, nerve and the sacral, um, sacral parasympathetic um, nerve along the intermedulateral colon and mostly uh, innervate the uh, lower uh, GI tract, uh, the bladder, and the reproductive organ. Some detailed information will be given as along, uh, but what it shows is how much uh, nerve there is um, in terms of modulating the um, endpoint uh, organs in each part. And there is also um, a very nice um, set of afferent information that come from all those viscera and going either through the spinal cord or uh, through the vagus afferents going to the nucleus tractus salutarius. So now I will uh, switch uh, uh, gear in relationship with targeting a specific organ for which there is a large number of neurons, as I have mentioned, millions of enteric nervous system neurons neuron, and there is a lot of information that has been acquired in relationship with this um, innervation of the gastrointestinal tract. It's, um, first of all, I think the, the group of um, uh, Dr. Furness um, in Melbourne have uh, established that there is what we call intrinsic primary afferent neurons that could sense the information coming from the gut lumen and, and do a reflex arc uh, within the, the GI tract. A group including um, Dr. Shushevsky have established um, this uh, intestinofugal neuron that go either to the uh, uh, sympathetic pathway or to other target organs, including the pancreas or the, um, uh, the airway. And um, th this shows that there is a possibility of interaction uh, between organ to organ in relationship with this communication of the um, um, gut uh, innervation to other uh, target organs from the pancreas, uh, uh, gallbladder, or, or airways. There is uh, the information about their function and their modality of action. It's still not well established. However, they must be very important to integrate the overall activity of the GI tract in connection with other organs. There is also... Um, a number of extrinsect afferents which reach the CNS or efferent um, parasympathetic either at the level of the vagal or lombosacral and sympathetic pathway. So this shows that this gastrointestinal system is extremely um, well uh, innervated at the, at the different reflex arcs that still uh, need to be uh, further assessed. We have talked a lot already about the vagus, so that has been a subject of uh, interesting um, uh, research for many years, and there is now clear evidence that the preganglionic motor neurons that contribute axon forming the vagus have uh, formed three branches which innervate either the liver 
or the, um, the which is a liver branch. There is a gastric branch, which mostly innervates the, the stomach, and the celiac branch, which um, mostly innervates um, uh, uh, most of the intestine. And this, um, there is also the nucleus ambiguous, which contains the preganglionic motor neuron that also uh, uh, go back to uh, the vag vagal trunk and uh, innervate either the lung, the heart, and the um, larynx, pharynx, and the esophagus. Because it was mentioned that actually this efferent component of the vagus, only 20% of the fiber are efferents and 80% are afferents, and there is millions of neurons in the enteric nervous system, the original uh, dogma was that there is this efferent pathway going to the gut related to this bionteric neuron that I mentioned previously as the one common neuron that transmits the information on other neurons. However, the very uh, elegant uh, tracing study by Dr. Pauley and Bertou clearly established that vagal axon ramify extensively contacting large number of gastric myenteric neurons with, with network of varicose ending, investing almost all those neurons. And this is uh, illustrated here. And this uh, demonstrates how much when you have refined a mapping technique, you could go from one uh, concept to another and completely uh, change the overall understanding the way that the vagal uh, innervations uh, modulate uh, the enteric nervous system. So we uh, have been interested because of the fact that these uh, preganglionic um, motor neurons are so important to regulate um, uh, gastric and uh, intestinal uh, motor functions through their projection. We have tried to establish what are the overall mechanisms that activate those neurons. And we were able to show that this uh, three amino acid peptide thyrotrophin releasing factor which is located in the medulla in terms of expression of the, the peptide and also contains very rich um, expression of TRH receptor. When you, we use this um, peptide injected into this nuclei, we are hosting a vast um, array of response uh, in relationship with increased uh, vagal efferent activity that uh, lead to uh, increase in liver growth, blood flow, a lot of motility in the stomach and secretion. And what's interesting is the fact that the secretion encompass all the endocrine uh, gland of the stomach, including uh, release of ghrelin and serotonin and histamine, uh, epithelial cells that secrete acid, pepsin, uh, mucus. And um, also we demonstrate an anti-inflammatory effect of this um, activation of this cholinergic pathway in line with the uh, early pioneer demonstration by Dr. Tracy. The pancreatic exocrine and um, exo endocrine and exocrine is also stimulated, intestinal motility and secretion, and colonic motility. So showing how much this um, vagal activity could contribute to the host of uh, change in uh, uh, modulating the gastrointestinal function. But more importantly, was the fact that by identifying this TRH as a physiological stimulant of the vagus, for instance, during the cephalic phase, we were able to inject this peptide at different doses to modulate the efferent activity of the uh, vagus. And there we were able to demonstrate that there is a completely different effect, opposite action, depending if you have a low stimulation or high stimulation. Under low stimulation, for instance, in the stomach, you increase the overall um, defensive mechanism of the gastric mucosa, which protect against erosive agent. And this was brought about the increase in blood flow, mucus, uh, nitric oxide to increase the uh, blood flow, and also by recruiting the efferent function of capsaicin-sensitive afferents, releasing this peptide, uh, calcitonin-related peptide, which influence also blood flow. However, when we had maximal stimulation, we could, within one hour, lead to gastric erosion. So it shows we could really... Um, sort of a map of the overall impact of different level of activation on the uh, peripheral function using a physiological stimulant of preganglionic uh, motor neurons. 
Now, when we, um, as another example, how uh, important, for instance, it is uh, to uh, record both afferent and efferent signaling in this vagal, um, vagovagal reflex. And this is illustrated by this elegant work uh, done by uh, David Adelson at UCLA, where he was able to record simultaneously from the distal uh, gastric, uh, ventral gastric branch and the proximal, which are uh, depicted here uh, from the uh, beautiful um, afferent uh, tracing done by Bertou and the Pole. So he was able to regard from those uh, two branches at the same time as recording change in the overall uh, luminal pressure in the stomach. And what's very interesting is the fact that when we use a physiological stimulant of, of uh, gastric vagal afferent demonstrated by Ellen Rebold early on, which shows the um, activation of um, vagal afferents by this uh, cholecystokinin, when we look at the heart reflex, when you go in one part of the stomach, you have um, a dec an increase in uh, vagal efferent activity, which release nitric oxide and induce gastric accommodation. But in the distal part, you reduce the uh, vagal outflow uh, to the uh, iron stomach, which uh, grinds the overall, which has a motility uh, action to propel the content into the iodenum, so you achieve what we call, what the CCK is known for, which is to delay gastric emptying and relax the stomach and also induce satiety. So this uh, outlines the importance to be able to record at a different part of the um, um, terminal of those uh, vagal efferents at the target organ along with functional response to have a better understanding about those uh, vagovagal reflex arc. Another illustration which has been recently uh, established by the group of Dr. Little at Duke University in relationship with all this sensory signaling coming to the gut is an important aspect which is related to how the uh, endocrine uh, cells, uh, which are all along the overall uh, gastrointestinal tract that contain gut peptides sending signaling information uh, to the brain or um, sampling the um, content of a meal or the bacteria uh, which are in the, um, uh, in, GI, uh, in the lumen of the GI tract. And what was uh, the previous um, understanding what actually when you activate those cells, uh, they release their content, could be peptide, serotonin, and then they are, uh, uh, par pa by paracrine mechanism, uh, influence the vagal neuron or spinal neuron or enteric neuron or go into the circulation. However, recent study using a very uh, transgenic mice along with very uh, refined um, um, mapping uh, study establish uh, actually that this um, endocrine cell um, uh, form what we call neuropod. This neuropod contains filaments that are um, neuron like uh, which uh, per allow to establish some kind of synaptic contact between uh, nerve. It's still not clear uh, which nerve could be uh, influenced if it's uh, the synaptic contact is with efferent or afferent nerve, but it's, I think, a very promising, important field that needs to be further developed because this, uh, this will allow to really um, have a, what we call a precise topographical representation of sensory signal from the gut and also um, the potential of having viruses in the lumen to go into the gut and get access to peripheral or central nervous system. There is a theory, for instance, for Parkinson's disease that it starts all in the gut and moves away up to the dorsal motor nucleus, which is why you have constipation for five or 10 years before the motor symptom. So this um, change in the overall articulation of this um, neuropod with endocrine system in relationship with sampling what's happening in the lumen under pathological condition could be extremely uh, important to understand. So um, finally, I think um, I would like to mention another example for which how important the vagal system, and this will be probably uh, well detailed by uh, Tracy, who have hammered this new concept, the important role uh, of the vagus as an anti-inflammatory um, uh, regulator. 
And this is brought about by uh, what he call an immune reflex, whereby you have a number of pro-inflammatory cytokines that could interact with vagal afferents at the level of uh, chemosensing paraganglia or uh, through um, the nodos ganglia that contain the uh, cell body of uh, vagal um, afferents that project both to the stomach and to the brain. And uh, this um, activation by the cytokine is able to uh, modulate the efferent activity of the vagus, leading to a um, so cholinergic pathway and alpha-7 cholinergic receptor modulate the overall um, uh, reactions of um, the inflammatory um, cell. And um, there is also a lot of work that needs to be done to understand this uh, communication between the vagus and the celiac sympathetic ganglia, showing that maybe this celiac ganglia could be a mixed ganglia, sympathetic and parasympathetic. So in closing, so this was a, a quick survey with the different aspects that I wanted to outline. But um, I think at the structural level, uh, it's, it's clear that we need um, a more detailed map to drive this high resolution uh, tracing of afferent and efferent nerve fiber at various levels of target organ and also the interspecies differences. And this really uh, highlighted by the work of Dr. Pollet, who by this new approach of uh, tracing was able to completely reverse the previous dog dogma of understanding of the articulation between the vagus and the enteric nervous system. So this needs to be more uh, developed in different um, target organs. At the functional level, um, I think it will be very important to generate simultaneous recording of neuronal signal and organ function and uh, to um, associate what we call end organ marker in response to physiological stimuli. So we have a better understanding of how a, a neural signal um, target uh, this, um, how uh, the uh, neural signal end up to uh, modulate um, uh, end, end organs and uh, what are the biomarkers that are uh, signaling of this neuronal uh, activation. We uh, need also to investigate at the molecular and cellular level the mechanism through which autonomic nervous system efferent signaling at of different intensity translate into change of organ function uh, using, as I have mentioned, maybe some specific uh, brain peptides that are targeting uh, specific uh, neuron uh, of those uh, extrinsic um, uh, nerves. So we have um, a better understanding how different intensity of uh, nerve stimulation resulted in um, translating to change in the end organs um, release of uh, neurochemical and the implication uh, on the organ. And also our afferent signaling arising from change at target organ transfers the different autonomic reflex locally with their interconnected organ or the integration at the spinal and supraspinal level. And this is uh, really highlighted by this um, interaction between this endocrine cell and the nerves that are now uh, could be a mixed um, enterocrine um, neuronal uh, interaction, as I have mentioned with this neuropod. So I think um, um, some of the work that I have mentioned has been supported by the NIH, and I thank you for your attention. Hi, Juan Inca Pierre from Boston Scientific. Thank you for a very nice review. Um, one question that I have is you made an important point in the anatomical difference between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, where the sympathetic has short uh, preganglionic neurons um, and long pulse ganglionic neurons, and the parasympathetic has long pulse ganglionic and very short uh, uh, long preganglionic neurons and yeah, very short and pulse, pulse ganglionic at the yeah. organ. Um, Kip made an important point about an important um, issue when you're targeting um, neuronal targets with neuromodulation is how close your electrode is to your target 
And the second important element is how big your, your axon is in terms of diameter. The dogma is that uh, preganglionic neurons have larger diameters than postganglionic neurons. Um, is that the current belief? Is that what we think uh, it's happening with all of these systems? So that will have very important implications for how we design our systems and which targets uh, do we go for. Yeah, I think it's a very um, important point. I don't know if Dr. Paul has, has more um, insight into this, uh, but uh, from your tracing study that you have done. I'll say something Yeah. So it is time for a break. It's a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, to chair the next session, which is entitled Neurocircuits and Organs and Disease, Opportunities for Neuromodulation in the Lower Urinary Tract. My name is Helen Raybold, and I'm from the University of California in Davis and the School of Veterinary Medicine. And um, I've long been interested in the autonomic nervous system. And it, when I first met Chet de Grote at the University of Pittsburgh, he certainly has inspired many uh, young scientists like myself at that time to, to come into this field. So it's a pleasure to introduce the first speaker, um, uh, Dr. Chet de Grote, who's going to talk about neural control and neuromodulation of lower urinary tract function. I've talk to the other speakers in this session and what we would like to do as uh, Dr. DeGroote is going to talk about the biology and then the second two speakers are going to talk a little bit more about some of the bioengineering issues that we would have a short period of time for discussion after Dr. DeGroote's talk, move on to the technology and then have an integrated discussion uh, at the end of the session after the last speaker. Okay. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Helen. Um, the uh, mic is not working, so I'll try to um, talk into this. And um, I'm going to have a, um, a topic that uh, was initially described as being simple. I'd like to respectively disagree with Dr. Gimeno. Uh, I think it actually is more complicated than some other functions in the body because in contrast to autonomic control of the cardiovascular system, this is under voluntary control as well as autonomic control. So at any rate, well, I will uh, discuss a number of different topics, anatomy and functions of the lower urinary tract, peripheral innervation, efferent and afferent nerves, central neural control, dysfunction, treatment of dysfunction with neuromodulation, and research opportunities. <clears throat> So the, I agree that the functions are relatively simple. There are just two. It stores urine and releases urine. That's the lower urinary tract. And there's a reservoir where the urine is stored, the bladder, and an outlet, the urethra, where urine is released. And interestingly enough, there is a necess necessary integration between smooth and strided muscle which, again, makes it a little bit more complicated than many other visceral functions where they're purely smooth muscle. And um, these uh, functions are controlled by the central nervous system. So the gut and the heart can really function quite well without central control. This depends on central nervous system control. You can't empty your bladder without the CNS, brain and spinal cord, playing a role. The other thing that you should recognize is that there are different types of voiding. There is involuntary voiding in infants and even in the fetus, and that goes on for several years after birth. And eventually, we bring that involuntary control under voluntary regulation by the brain with maturation of the nervous system. So there's a lot of interesting issues related to the development of voluntary control. If we're fortunate, it remains that way throughout adult life. If you're unfortunate and encounter Parkinson's disease or multiple sclerosis, stroke, brain tumors, spinal cord injury, et cetera, you can lose voluntary control and cycle back somewhat to what you were when you were first born. And there's reflex control emerges. And the goals of therapy are to re remove or eliminate reflex control reestablish normal voluntary control, and neuromodulation can be effective, and drugs can be as well in promoting that uh, change. 
So the urinary tract is innervated, as, as vet said, uh, by sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves, and also by uh, uh, somatic nerves. So you have the bladder innervated by parasympathetic, which releases acetylcholine, excites uh, muscarinic cholinergic receptors that cause the bladder to contract. Uh, innervated by sympathetic nerves, <clears throat> which can activate beta-3 receptors and turn the bladder contraction off. The sympathetic pathway can also innervate the uh, alpha receptors in the urethra to cause the urethra to crack, contract, and promote urine storage. And the pudendal nerves and other nerves that arise from the lumbosacral cord can innervate the pelvic floor muscles as well as the external urethral sphincter. Now, we should recognize that this is a textbook picture. This is a traditional view. And as Vet pointed out, there are autonomic ganglia, which are intervening between the spinal cord and the end organ itself. And we really don't know very much about the function of the ganglia, which are involved in bladder control in humans. But in, in animals, these ganglia can be quite complex. They can modulate in very uh, complex ways the signals coming from the spinal cord out to the end organ. In addition, this is uh, a very uh, a simpl simplified version of the innervation because the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves can interact, and we probably will hear something about this in the heart. But one transmitter can act on the presynaptic or postganglionic terminals and affect transmitter release. In addition, in the ganglia not shown here, the sympathetics can also modulate uh, parasympathetic ganglionic transmission. Nothing is known about this in humans, so this is an area that should be studied. So, so we have over here the brain, which is necessary for voluntary voiding, sending information down to the spinal cord and going out to the lower urinary tract through the three sets of nerves, hypogastric sympathetic, pelvic parasympathetic, and somatic nerves uh, going out to the uh, strided muscle, the sphincter, and the pelvic floor. So the brain's ro role is to coordinate the activities of all of these three organs uh, and three nerve supplies to those organs. <clears throat> so you should also remember, as Yvette pointed out, that autonomic nerves contain afferent as well as efferent nerves. So there are motor pathways mediated by efferents, and then sensory pathways and reflexogenic pathways mediated by afferent nerves. And in the viscera, there are generally two types of afferents, small myelinated A-delta fibers and unmyelinated C-fibers. And this is similar for bladder and for bowel in terms of the lumbosacral innervation. These fibers have different functions. We believe, based on animal work, that the A-delta myelinated fibers are mechanosensitive and, and tell you that your bladder is being filled and induces sensations of fullness and overactivity. The C-fibers are thought to be mechanoinsensitive, at least in some animals, and may be also present in this way in humans. And these fibers can be activated by nociceptive stimuli, like bladder infection or chemical irritations in the urine, and trigger urgency, frequency, and incontinence, and, and pain. So the C-fiber system is often linked with pathology. And by that means, then, is a target for various types of drugs and for neuromodulation. So the important take-home message in terms of afferents is that this is pathological-induced activity. This is normal mechanical-induced activity. So uh, there are a couple of interesting, unusual characteristics of the afferents to the lower urinary tract. Uh, one is that the C-fibers can actually receive information from the epithelial lining of the bladder by the release of chemical messengers. This is similar to what Yvette talked about uh, in, in the gut, where there may be epithelial cells that communicate with afferents and tell you something about the composition of the food. Uh, and we'll probably hear from Dr. Canning that this may happen in the lung as well. So the C fibers uh, are able to uh, receive information about the contents of the bladder lumen through urethelial afferent signaling. 
And the bladder urethelium is a multi-layered structure. The outer part of this, the umbrella cell layer, has uh, tight junctions and uroplacans, which prevent the per, uh, diffusion of substances from the urine into the bladder. And so this is a, the, the well-known barrier function. But the urethelium also receives an afferent innervation. And this innervation then can be subjected to a variety of chemical modulations. And this just shows you some examples. Here's the urethelium. Here are the nerves coming up. Here's the muscle down here. And the urethelial cells can release ATP, nitric oxide, uh, neurokinins, acetylcholine, neurotrophic factors, and can release those in response to various stimuli, like uh, changes in mechanical stretch, uh, acid in, uh, conditions in the urine, uh, capsaicin or temperature changes in the, in the, uh, in the bladder. <clears throat> and so the, the urethelium then, as I said before, can send signals to afferent nerves through chemical messages. Uh, in addition, the afferent nerves can release chemicals, and efferent nerves can release chemicals, which may actually act on receptors in the urethelium to change urethelial properties. So I think we want to emphasize that there's a bidirectional communication between afferents, efferents, and the urethelium, and this may be playing a very important role in bladder sensations, particular in, particularly in pathology. And this is something that could be pursued further in humans to determine the important uh, role of this in both physiology and in pathophysiology. So there's another interesting aspect of the afferents, and that is the afferents from adjacent pelvic organs can send signals to the same population of second-order neurons in the spinal cord. And therefore, something that happens in one organ may affect the processing of sensory input coming from another organ. And this would be called convergence. There's a relatively small area of the spinal cord, just a few segments, that receive input from these various pelvic organs. And there's a lot of overlap with that uh, type of uh, sensory input. So the other is dichotomizing afferents. And uh, this has been recognized in the last few years that afferent neurons in the dorsal root ganglia can innervate more than one organ. So the bladder and the colon may receive inputs from one sensory neuron. And we'll hear more about this from Jay Pashrika, I believe, tomorrow, uh, where the pancreas and the intestine may uh, interact or communicate uh, via these uh, dichotomizing afferents. And so some point along the pathway, there's a branch point, and nerves go to the two different uh, structures. Whether this happens in humans, not known. It's been studied mainly in, in cats. The other thing is that uh, recently colleagues in Pittsburgh have shown that viruses injected into one organ can transport back up to the dorsal ganglia, come back down again, and go to the other organ and infect the epithelial cells. So this raises the possibility that you could have co-infection of different uh, organs uh, through this dichotomizing afferent system. And as a matter of fact, convergence may contribute to uh, visceral referred pain. That is, the in intestinal afferent shown here may converge onto the same population of neurons that are innervated by skin. And uh, pain in the intestine can influence the processing of input from the skin and therefore induce a referred pain. So this system can be very important, and obviously if we're trying to treat pathological conditions with neuromodulation, it's an uh, anatomical system that needs to be taken into account. Can you hear me back there? Am I close enough to this? Okay. All right, so now let's go to the central nervous system and uh, try to understand in a very general way how the CNS controls uh, lower urinary tract function. So as I said, um, the, the functions are simple, storage and release. And we can go from storage of urine to release of urine in a very rapid fashion. And so I've often uh, proposed and like to think that this works like the switch, the switch on this pointer, on or off. 
And so it's not a gradual control of blood pressure raised at 10 millimeters of mercury, as, as Kip told us, or lower it a little bit. This is an all or none switch, and that's the way it normally works. And so you have various elements of that switching circuit. And for years, we've been interested in defining the anatomical and functional properties of that circuit. So you have the organs themselves, the reservoir, the outlet. You have afferent input to that switch. And that level of input determines how that switch is thrown or also how it's controlled and how it provides information back to the organs. With a low level of afferent activity in the human infant, as the bladder's filling, the afferents drive the switch into a storage mode. Storage is on, elimination is off. As the bladder fills up further, the afferent activity increases and eventually the, reaches the level of the threshold for the switch, turns the storage off, turns the elimination on, and urine comes out, and then it starts to fill again. So the micturition switch is a large challenge to understand how lower urinary tract functions. And the switches are, are shown in a very general way on, on this slide. It turns out that storage reflexes and voiding reflexes are organized differently in the central nervous system. Storage reflexes are organized in the spinal cord as uh, segmental and driven all by bladder mechanosensitive afferent input. When the bladder's filling, it drives the pudendal nerve to cause the sphincter to contract. This is called the guarding reflex. And it also generates a intersegmental reflex from sacral cord to lumbar cord that activates the hypogastric nerve, sympathetic input that causes the bladder to relax, the outlet to contract, and this promotes urine storage. Whether this occurs in humans is not known, so this is definitely something that should be studied in the future. Uh, there is an area in the, in the cat called the Pontine Storage Center, which facilitates these spinal reflexes. Now, in the infant, as the afferent activity increases further, more information is sent up to the brainstem, to the periaqueductal gray, and to the Pontine Micturition Center. And when that activity reaches a critical level, it turns on the descending pathway to the cord. It turns off the sympathetic inhibitory input, turns off the pudendal somatic input to the sphincter, and turns on the input to the bladder to cause the bladder contract, and that is the supraspinal voiding reflex. In animals, you can remove everything above the periaqueductal gray. That switch is functional. You cut the spinal cord at any point below this, the level of the pons, and that switch fails. Spinal cord injury, as we heard earlier today, has an important uh, downside, and that's loss of bladder function. So voluntary control now is built by higher centers, which impinge upon and control those basic switches. And this is a, uh, 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 based on a series of studies using functional magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, this slide was prepared by my colleague Claire Fowler, which shows the PAG Pontine Micturition Center and how afferent activity is increasing as the bladder fills and is received by these areas up in the brain. Uh, these areas in the brain are in turn controlled by four brain structures, um, uh, <coughs> prefrontal cortex, which during urine storage automatically sends inhibitory signals back to these reflex centers to keep them silent. So that's what's happening in theory during urine storage. And during voiding, that inhibition is turned off and voluntarily excitation is turned on, sends facilitatory signals to these structures, and then those signals are sent back down to the spinal cord and coordinate bladder contraction and urethral relaxation and voiding. So this would be the basic central circuitry which regulates lower urinary tract function. And uh, the circuits, I won't I'm going to run out of time, so we'll just say that a number of different circuits have been identified. Thalamus and insula are visceral sensory receiving areas 
which then impinges upon the medial prefrontal cortex, which then feeds information back to these circuits in the PHE and PMC. And then the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex and uh, supplemental area provide motor control that, that regulates the, the avoiding function. So pathophysiology, in theory at least, and here's where we really are weak, we don't really understand the etiology of overactive bladder or uh, even the etiology of uh, uh, multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease. But in theory, you could have uh, multiple factors that contribute to overactive bladder. One, the smooth muscle can be overactive itself, which gen then activates sensory input. Sensory input then can enhance excitatory transmission in the CNS or can reduce CNS inhibition. Uh, in addition to something happening in the periphery can be purely central. In Parkinson's disease and MS, you can uh, remove central inhibition and make the bladder storage mechanisms uh, decline, make bladder voiding mechanisms increase, and produce uh, incontinence as well as urgency and frequency of urination. And so <clears throat> as the bladder fills, these central processes within the brain and spinal cord are receiving excessive afferent activity and the bladder reflex becomes enhanced. So high level of afferent activity can impinge upon the switch, and uh, that in turn could be modulated by electrical stimulation of nerves. So afferent nerve stimulation, uh, either sacral root stimulation called inner stim, uh, stimulation of the tibial nerve, the pudendal nerve, the skin of the perineum, the vagina, the urethra, the penis, all of these afferent stimulations have been used experimentally and clinically to try to modulate that switch. And we know that, at least with sacral neuromodulation and tibial stimulation, that the sensations of, of urgency and the overactivity of the bladder can be downregulated, but the avoiding efficiency is not changed. So, for, to understand neuromodulation, we have to understand how it can change the afferent or sensory limb without affecting the um, efferent limb of the micturition reflex. Another challenge for, for the future. So at any rate, just emphasizing that many different afferent inputs are playing a role in neuromodulation of the CNS switch. So inner stem or sacral neuromodulation is an FDA-approved therapy used for urinary urgency incontinence, urinary urgency frequency, non-obstructive urinary retention, fecal incontinence, and experimentally for bladder pain, interstitial cystitis, or pelvic pain. Catch the unusual paradox here. The same stimulation with the same frequencies, the same nerve, can promote storage or continence and can promote voiding a real challenge to understand how you can treat two different diametrically opposed functions with the same stimulation. And there are speculations about how that can occur. Okay, so what are we stimulating? With interstim, we're stimulating afferent nerves in the spinal roots. Those afferent nerves carry information into the spinal cord, and there they release neurotransmitters, and that leads to modulation of central nervous system function. When these stimulations were first uh, studied, they thought maybe it was activation of the efferent outflow to the sphincter. Now it's pretty clear that it's afferents which are being targeted. And just as Kip talked about, the sizes of the afferents are very important. We're stimulating at an intensity which does not produce pain. So we probably are not activating visceral afferents. We're activating somatic afferents. We're activating large myelinated afferents, which can modulate visceral function. And so those then can release transmitters and produce something in the CNS, which really depends in part on the activation of intact pathways. Um, unless we're treating pathology, and there we can have uh, pathways which are normally not present but are being activated, which may be super sensitive to the effects of this stimulation. And 
<coughs> so sacral nerve modulation is applied here. Uh, tibial nerve stimulation is applied more into the periphery in the nerves that innervate the, the, the lower leg and foot. And pudendal stimulation uh, innervating the pathways to the urethra, the perineum, to the penis, the vagina. I'm just going to tell you about these two and what little bit we know from animal models about the mechanisms of action. You've heard uh, one of the top priorities is to understand how does neuromodulation work. All right? And I think the first approach is to use animal models to see if we can work that out and then see if we can do this same kind of experiment in humans. So questions about neuromodulation. What types of axons are activated? We touched a bit on that. What transmitters are released? I'll tell you about that in the remaining two minutes. What transmitter receptors are activated? Where does neuromodulation occur? Does it occur in the periphery? in the urinary bladder? Does it occur in the spinal cord, in the brain? Does it occur in sensory pathways, motor pathways? Do different types of neuromodulation act by the same mechanism? So here's a whole list of experiments and questions that can be explored in the SPARC program. So very quickly, pudendal neuromodulation studied in cats by the Pittsburgh group shows that, uh, at least in part, the site of action is in the spinal cord. Pudendal nerve stimulation sends input to the lumbosacral cord. One, in the cat, it activates the hypogastric inhibitory input to the bladder, and it also inhibits the ascending pathway to the pons. And finally, it inhibits the descending input coming down from the pons to the bladder. Uh, the act mechanism in part, is activation of GABAergic inhibitory receptors and activation of the sympathetic pathway to the bladder. Properties. The stimulation is effective over a narrow, narrow range of frequencies, like 3 to 10 hertz. And its effects require continuous stimulation. The effects are, effects are rapid in onset and recover or are eliminated very soon after you turn the stimulation off. Okay. In contrast, studies in cats show that tibial neurostimulation produces effects by action in the brainstem. You stimulate tibial nerve here, but you inhibit synaptic transmission up here in this reflex circuit. This is a mechanism that's dependent upon opioid receptors and encephalinergic inhibition here, in contrast to GABAergic inhibition down here. The stimulation is effective over a wide range of frequencies, 3 to 30 hertz, and persists at least for two hours after termination of the stimulation. So very different mechanisms and properties. And this fits with the FDA-approved uh, therapy, which where you have 30 minutes of therapy administered every week for 12 weeks, and then booster treatments over a month. So in clinically, Tibial nerve stimulation can last for a long time. Pudendal nerve stimulation doesn't. And um, I'm going to skip spinal cord injury. Maybe Graham Creasy will talk about this. But uh, with spinal cord injury, you have the, the bladder unable to store, and it doesn't empty well. And uh, we can talk about how neuromodulation can affect this and how pathology uh, induces the emergence of these defects after spinal cord injury. And then finally, um, we will talk about research opportunities at some point during the general discussion. Sorry for running over. Thank you. We do have time, I think, for a few questions for Dr. DeGroat. <coughs> you wanted to know about the lower urinary tract. So I can I ask one question? Identify yourself. Yeah, my name is Stefan Schirr. I'm, I'm from the University of Miami. I'm here to um, think about like data integration and um, you know how to bring all the different types of data together and not really knowing much about this. Uh, um, it may not be a very smart question. My question is, so those fantastic diagrams that you showed, those models that were worked out, to, to explain uh, the various types of functions and how they, how they interact. 
So how much of that is, is somehow formally modeled or available in some kind of information system versus just in a picture or in some human human's mind or brain? <laughs> <laughs> I, I came up close to you because old age is affecting my hearing. Um, actually, I've been fascinated by how one would model a switch, a neuronal switch. So recently we've collected and others have collected enough information, especially about the Pontine Micturition Center and the PAG, that we've been able to put a, an excitatory and inhibitory model together. We published it in Acrophysiologica about a year ago. And when we fill the bladder, it, it functions very closely to what we see in the normal animal and in the human. It stores urine, and then it reaches a critical level of bladder distension, and it triggers an all or none response to induce voiding. So whether that is a realistic model, I don't know. Some of this is based on electrophysiology, some on uh, uh, brain imaging, etc. So at least we've reached a stage where we can model the switch. I'm asking this more like to perhaps, you know, think a little bit about, about that problem, you know, how to store the data, how to bring the data together, how to model all that data. Because it's like all connected, it's, gonna, it's fairly yeah. complex, so. Yeah, well, you, you, you can't build a model without having data. So the data has been collected by single unit recording or intracellular recording uh, and uh, pharmacological data. We mm. know that if we inject uh, chemicals which can modify synaptic transmission, in the yeah. Pontine Micturition Center, we can do something like neuromodulation. We can make the bladder store more urine, but empty well. We can now inject other agents which make the bladder less uh, storage and will still empty well. So by manipulating the circuits within the brainstem, we can, in an all or none fashion, change avoiding uh, properties in the lower Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. You show that the uh, bladder afferent fibers, the myelinated A delta fibers, have you know, at least three roles. One, they seem to trigger micturition. Uh, they also, though, seem to activate the sympathetic pathway. They also seem to activate the uh, pedendal sphincter motor neurons. Um, is there any evidence of whether or not there's the same population performing all three of those functions in coordination, and what happens to the uh, myelinated A delta fibers that activate the bladder pathway when the cord's cut? Yeah. Do they lose that ability completely, or are they just hanging out there uh, looking for something to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we don't know whether these myelinated fibers are made up of different populations. They, they seem, it seems that these spinal storage reflexes, which are driven by them, uh, all seem to be driven by the same population, that is, with conduction velocity and electrical thresholds. It seems like the population that goes up to the brainstem to trigger voiding also has the same uh, electrical thresholds. But it, we can't exclude the possibility that there are different populations distributed at different sites within the bladder wall. When we cut the spinal cord, which was shown on that slide that I eliminated, we, we have the uh, spinal storage reflexes maintained. And so the bladder doesn't empty well because those afferents are still functioning. But the voiding response is completely eliminated because that's dependent on structures in the, above the spinal cord. The micturition in the spinal cord injured animal is driven by C-fiber afferents, which don't seem to play a role in normal voiding, but are activated and probably sensitized by the release of chemicals like neurotrophic factors after spinal cord injury. And that's something we can talk about a bit later. So neuroplasticity is playing a key role in the emergence of micturition responses after spinal cord injury. Uh, Shimmy I from Brigham and Woman. Uh, I have a general question about what is known of the effect of aging on the uh, urinary tract reflex. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I, most people would believe that aging is uh, something that's occurring independent of disease. And if you're going to evaluate the effect of urging, you have to separate disease from the basic uh, properties of aging itself. Uh, it seems like in animal models that there are changes in the peripheral nervous system. A group in uh, Wales studied uh, this a number of years ago in, in rats and found that the number of neurons uh, in the major pelvic ganglia was reduced in aged animals. And then there is also uh, some change in the properties of the epithelium, and that may lead to changes in urothelial afferent signaling. Um, there are, there are changes also, in, in, at least in some studies, in the ability of the efferent system to contract the bladder muscle. In other uh, studies, it seems like the, the contraction is, is quite normal. The central pathways, which are involved in uh, the switching function, have really not been studied, as far as I know, in, in aged animals. So. <clears throat> there is another point, I guess, I should mention that aging is associated with another condition that I didn't even mention, and that's called the underactive bladder. And that's receiving a lot more attention recently, where older people just cannot empty their bladder. They can't contract it a long enough time so that they get urinary retention. And this is a, a major issue in people in nursing homes and in very old people. Nothing is known about the, the pathology. Can I suggest that you hold your question and for a more general discussion after we've heard something from the uh, technology uh, folks? Okay, so uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Graham Creasy from Stanford University. Uh, Dr. Creasy is a surgeon who has a strong interest in spinal cord injury and uh, biomedical approaches and bioengineering approaches in that disease. Thank you. Well, thank you. As uh, Helen said, since I'm a surgeon, I, I look forward to learning a lot more about technology at this workshop from some real engineers. And um, since this is the first technology response of the workshop, I'll mention a few general principles uh, and then try to illustrate how these uh, have been applied or might be applied in the lower urinary tract. I've taken the uh, title of this initiative to indicate that uh, we're interested in stimulating peripherally uh, as opposed to stimulating the brain and the spinal cord, which have been mentioned earlier. But also that we're, we're interested in peripheral activity in the peripheral nerves and organs, which importantly includes, as Dr. DeGroote just mentioned, somatic as well as autonomic in some cases. Uh, but obviously we have to consider this in the context of all the control and activity happening in the central nervous system, even though in some conditions, like spinal cord injury, there may be substantial disconnect between the central and peripheral nervous system, which is what makes spinal cord injury such a, a difficult problem to solve, particularly for restoring bladder empty. I'm conscious also that at NIH, there is a long uh, history of electrical interaction with the nervous system, going back at least half a century to the laboratory of neural control uh, the Neural Prosthesis Program, and currently the Neural Interfaces Program. And I think that uh, this uh, activity here and throughout the world has led to two main approaches to these uses of electrical stimulation, which I think it's useful to draw the distinctions between, partly distinctions of scale, in that neural control activities have been mainly concerned with understanding and controlling molecular mechanisms like voltage-sensitive ion channels in the cell membranes of nerves and muscle cells, and then controlling these and using them to generate or prevent the generation of action potentials and their propagation. And so this has led to some useful products, uh, usually known as neural prostheses, motor prostheses. Of course, the cardiac pacemaker is the prototype of these, but also motor prostheses for st stimulating the phrenic nerve to the diaphragm and getting people off ventilators. The system mentioned earlier for the bladder and bowel control and, and for limbs, particularly paralyzed after spinal cord injury. And sensory neural prostheses, uh, the most commercially successful one being the auditory prosthesis. So these, or this approach is really uh, focused on control or restoration of specific functions. 
and uh, was described once by Tom Mortimer at the Applied Neural Control Lab in Cleveland as the controlled and targeted release of neurotransmitters. And it's largely been driven by bioengineers who have focused on this uh, very specific uh, understanding of mechanism. And by contrast, a lot of neuromodulation work has been driven by clinicians who are interested in a beneficial effect for a patient, even if we don't understand the mechanism. And this, I think, has typically been operating more at a circuit or even a, a system level. And the neuromodulation devices that are out there, uh, as we believe, probably uh, their mechanism is mainly by stimulating afferent uh, fibers to, to produce stimulatory or inhibitory reflexes. In the process, it may well be that efferent nerves are also being stimulated, and we don't always know what effect that's having, but it's, it does... Uh, inject signals into these neural networks and uh, probably alter the network activity. So very often this view of neuromodulation is that the effects are more systemic and therefore somewhat analogous to chemical neuromodulation, which we carry out with drugs and pharmaceuticals. And in fact, the North American Neuromodulation Society defines neuromodulation as the therapeutic alteration of activity. So clearly a, a much larger scale and complex thing to understand in terms of, whether of electrical or neural networks. Now, as has been mentioned, the, the two main uh, devices that have uh, been applied to the uh, lower urinary tract have been uh, fo really falling into these two categories for emptying the spinal cord injury bladder, the Fintech Vocare system shown on the left, and uh, the, for improving storage in the overactive bladder, the Medtronic Interstim, shown on the right. The, the Fintech uh, was developed in Britain and started to be used there in 1982, received FDA approval in this country in 1998, and is no longer commercially available in this country, although it is in about 20 other countries. And the Medtronic Interstim, I think, was first FDA approved in 1997 and has had subsequent indications since. So these uh, are able to produce bladder emptying in spinal cord injury in addition to bowel emptying and penile erection and uh, to produce or improve storage of the overactive bladder. It's a different question trying to produce storage or improve it after spinal cord injury <coughs> and uh, trying to improve emptying with uh, the interstim device. Some patients may not need emptying, but as Dr. DeGroat mentioned, there are some patients whose emptying is improved by the interstim, particularly patients with Fowler's syndrome. Uh, it may be that the mechanism here is reducing overactivity of the sphincter as opposed to the usual use for reducing overactivity of the bladder. But the real challenge in restoring function to the lower urinary tract is being able to produce both emptying and storage in the same patient and preferably with the same device, uh, particularly a problem after spinal cord injury. So how can we advance the field, particularly taking advantage of the kind of mapping that Dr. de Groot has uh, described and studied uh, so thoroughly? I've uh, simplified some of the, the, these things down to a very simplified uh, um, circuit just at the sacral segmental level and lumped all the afferents together in, in one color there and maintained the same color coding that Dr. DeGroat used for the preganglionic parasympathetic efferents that cause contraction of the smooth muscle of the bladder and the somatic efferents that cause contraction of the external urethral sphincter. I haven't attempted to include the sympathetic system uh, and uh, the internal sphincter. And the neural control approach was initiated by uh, Brindley in Britain in the 70s with sacral anterior root stimulation, which admittedly stimulates both the efferent fibers to the bladder and to the external sphincter. Uh, he was nevertheless able to produce effective and safe voiding by using intermittent uh, stimulation, which sustained the pressure in the bladder while allowing intermittent relaxation of the external urethral sphincter and intermittent uh, elimination of urine. Uh, not how humans usually void, but how some species void, and it proved to be safe and effective. 
Um, we did try some other techniques uh, in the 90s, uh, which I'll mention later on a nodal block and collision block, to try to uh, uh, produce isolated contraction of the bladder. And it, it was possible, but it uh, didn't prove really to be necessary. The intermittent stimulation and post-stimulus voiding was adequate. And it was not sufficient to deal with the other problem, namely storage. And in the 80s, a German neurologist named Sarawine introduced posterior sacral rhizotomy to interrupt these sacral reflexes, primarily from the, for the purpose of uh, reducing the overactivity, hyperreflexia, of the detrusor muscle of the bladder, which is an important problem that otherwise not only causes reflex incontinence, but causes uh, uretic reflux, hydronephrosis, and kidney damage. And this was uh, very effective in improving continence and protecting the kidneys. However, it had the disadvantage of interrupting desirable reflexes like penile erection and ejaculation, even though the device itself could restore erection and there were other means of producing ejaculation. So the goal has been to see if we can get rid of cutting these nerves, particularly in an era when patients are hopeful that stem cells may become available to them. And one technique that is potentially promising has been developed by Kevin Kilgore in Cleveland, who's, who'll be speaking at this workshop, using kilohertz frequency alternating current block to prevent transmission of, or propagation of action potentials. And uh, this has been shown by him and his uh, colleague Gustafsson in Cleveland to, when applied to the pudendal nerves, to be able to prevent external sphincter contraction, and in conjunction with anterior root stimulation to be able to produce very effective voiding in animals with chronic spinal cord injury who are awake and, and behaving. Uh, if the afferents are maintained intact, that also provides the opportunity to apply neuromodulation to them uh, if we can find the appropriate uh, uh, mechanism, pathway, and parameters for that kind of neuromodulation, and thereby potentially to be able to use neuromodulation for continence and block and anterior stimulation, and thereby to produce both storage and emptying uh, after spinal cord injury. And, and we're just starting a phase one clinical trial to test this in humans for the first time. Neuromodulation has been traditionally applied to the sacral nerves, as you've heard, uh, but it's beginning to be applied more to the uh, pudendal nerves using similar electrodes. Uh, Warren Grill, when he was in Cleveland, became interested in interactions with the pudendal nerves and particularly the, the different components of the pudendal nerves, which may provide afferents from uh, different parts of the lower urinary tract, such as the proximal and distal urethra and the bladder neck. And... Uh, it appeared that certain, uh, certain uh, different parts of the, uh, the urethra in particular evoke different mechanisms for guarding and continence and potentially even uh, reflex activation of the bladder. So by being able to identify those afferents as fascicles within the pudendal nerve, the hope was that by using cuff electrodes with multiple contacts placed around the nerve, it would be possible to activate certain contacts and not others, and thereby selectively to activate certain fascicles and produce more selective uh, activation of parts of the pudendal nerve. And there, this also took advantage of the fact that the frequency of uh, stimulation appeared to have an influence, uh, the lower frequencies being more effective in inhibiting the bladder and higher frequencies sometimes producing reflex contraction of the bladder, also depending on the state of fullness of the bladder, so probably involving afferents from the bladder uh, interacting with this neuromodulation. There's still something of an open question, I think, whether we can get adequate reflex inhibition of the sphincter by, uh, by neuromodulation, but we do still have the high-frequency block as a potential. So this is another potential avenue for restoring storage and emptying by neuromodulation. So looking to the future, what do we need to advance the field? I think, as, as somebody else mentioned, we need better targeting, better selectivity, whether this is at the level of the nerve or the fascicles or even individual axons. For the nerve, of course, we can put cuff electrodes on any, uh, many of these branches, but too many electrodes means too many wires, increased complexity of technology, increased risk of infection. And so 
one approach is to move proximal and put on these multi-contact electrodes and attempt to activate different fascicles within a larger nerve trunk. And this is a diagram by, from Dustin Tyler in, in Cleveland showing different uh, strategies for activating these fascicles, either with a, a cylindrical cuff or a flattened cuff, since many of these nerves have a naturally flat profile, and it's perhaps a little easier to get access to the fascicles if the nerve is flat or flattened. And uh, ultimately, getting at the axon level may require different kinds of technologies, such as these penetrating electrodes. So there are commercially available electrodes such as this, uh, the flat interface uh, nerve electrode, and the Utah slant array and other similar techniques for uh, getting at individual axons. But I suggest that uh, while this kind of technology may be useful for mapping and uh, electrophysiological research, it's often not what we need for restoring function or relieving conditions. We really want to get at populations and axons, so, such as, for example, distinguishing the parasympathetic preganglionic fibers from the somatic efferent fibers to the sphincter. And normally, as you turn up the strength of stimulation, you will activate the large fibers before the small. It's possible to reverse that recruitment order by using a nodal block, and we, we applied this uh, to the sacral anterior roots to activate the bladder by itself. We also, uh, this is just an illustration of the tripolar uh, configuration used to obtain that and distinguish between large and small fibers. We also could make the electrode asymmetrical and produce unidirectional propagation and therefore apply this to the videndal nerve and block efferent traffic in the somatic efferents to the sphincter. Yeah, there may be other approaches, though, that, that enhance our repertoire, particularly use of optogenetics, where you can insert different light-sensitive ion channels into different populations of nerves and then uh, stimulate them with different wavelengths of light. And uh, so back in about 2008, I suggested this to Carl Dyseroth at Stanford, who had largely been working in the central nervous system, and proposed that we should apply this to peripheral nerves, potentially to be more selective for sphincter and bladder, also, there are inhibitory as well as excitatory opsins, and, so, and, and also shortened long time scales. So we might be able to switch off the sphincter for short periods for voiding and the bladder for longer periods for storage. Uh, there's a group that, out there that's been working quite hard on this for several years now, and it's so, so far found it difficult to get adequate gene transport by the viral vectors in the peripheral nerves and adequate gene expression. So... Uh, it remains to be seen whether this can be made to work in these peripheral nerves in the lower urinary tract. I think it raises the question not only of how much selectivity is possible technically, but how much do we actually need? In the case of neural control, we may want very selective activation for uh, research as well as for relieving conditions. In neuromodulation, we may want to activate large populations of nerves to get the largest effect. A few other priorities just to, to touch on briefly. We're talking about stimulating peripheral activity. I'd suggest it's at least as important to stop peripheral activity in the case of hyperreflexia of the sphincter and the bladder. And there are ways we've touched on for doing that by block uh, or by inhibiting activity, whether the bladder or the sphincter. And I mentioned that optogenetics has ways of stopping peripheral nerve activity as well. This may, of course, also relate to uh, pain, spasticity, and other issues we want to control. The other th thought is that existing devices tend to have been developed for a particular single application and may not be compatible or, or usable for other applications. And uh, I think in the future we need to think of more modular systems which can function within the body and without as a distributed network which is scalable, upgradable, according to the patient's condition, whether the patient gets better or worse or whether the technology advances, and can be adaptable to different needs and applications. And uh, that not, would not only include the bowel and sexual function, but other applications we've mentioned before. And the system being developed in Cleveland, the networkable neural prosthesis, is a potential example of this that may also solve some of the orphan technology problems. Dr. Rykoff, who will be speaking now, will say more about sensing, um, whether natural signals such as the EMG and uh, one of our students took the anal sphincter EMG as a trigger for neuromodulation. 
Uh, electroneurogram is a little more difficult, and I think Dr. Rykoff knows more uh, about that. But of course, we have a burgeoning world of artificial sensors, and in particular for bladder pressure, which we can't otherwise easily get. A device being developed in Cleveland, shown here. Another one being evaluated in, the Nether in uh, Norway, shown here. And we may want sensors for other uh, fact, uh, other issues in the bladder as well, with allowing us to then apply our neuromodulation conditionally and not continuously, as is usually done at present, and to develop closed loop systems. Finally, we should think about synergy with drug delivery. After all, the body uses both electrical and chemical control systems. And uh, we've had a lot longer in the pharmaceutical industry than we have had in the electronic, let alone the electroceutical industry, to apply to this. So given similar time in the electronic industry, it would be interesting to see how far we can take uh, this kind of synergies. It brings back, me back to what uh, Dr. Tom Mortimer said about controlled and targeted release of neurotransmitters. And finally, um, smaller or smarter implants. Battery-powered implants have often been limited by the size of the battery, particularly if, if it's a battery it has to be replaced, so you want a, a large battery that doesn't have to be replaced so often. Now we have more rechargeable batteries, but they still have a limited number of recharge cycles. RF-powered systems um, aren't, don't have that limitation, but they may be limited by the size of the antenna. In this case, the Vogue-Hair system had receiving antennas of this size, just over a centimeter, uh, the same size as transmitting antennas outside the body. The Bion had very small receiving antennas, but required very large transmitting antennas uh, and to, to get the energy in and uh, the limited efficiency. There's a prototype being developed at Stanford by Ada Poon, which uh, uses very small receiving antennas and then uses a high carrier frequency of 60 gigahertz, which allows you to focus electromagnetic beam within the tissues and to steer this to target very small implants, such as this shown here. So in summary, those are some of the technological needs that I think uh, we might apply not only to the lower urinary tract, but I hope to other systems like the bowel and other parts of the autonomic and somatic nervous systems. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We'll move uh, right along to the next speaker, and um, uh, Dr. Nico Reikoff uh, from the University of Aarberg is going to talk uh, about his uh, work with biosensors. Thank you very much. Um, as a, a few of the uh, earlier speakers, I want to spend a few fl slides on um, differences between human and animal work. Um, you know, a lot of groups have tried in animals to optimize uh, current treatments. Um, and I think this is very difficult. Um, and very, the results are very limited uh, of use. For example, this group here in Germany, they, um, in, um, uh, okay, um, in, um, in anesthetized pigs, they, um, uh, they irritated uh, the bladder to generate uh, bladder contractions. Um, and you can see here the number of contractions uh, per minute, um, which is actually rather high. Here we have the different animal numbers. Uh, so there are six animals in total. Um, and then they placed a cuff electrode uh, around uh, the dorsal sacral roots and stimulated it. And stimulated one electrode or did also bilateral stim stimulated, uh, st stimulation and saw that uh, upon stimulation, the number of contractions was reduced and with bilateral stimulation, uh, the reduction was larger than with unilateral stimulation. From that, they concluded that bilateral sacral normalization is better and should be tried in patients responsive to unilateral stimulation. Um, I think this conclusion cannot be made at all from this experiment. Um, this is an inflammation model. This is not uh, an, an overactive bladder. Uh, we're looking here at an acute effect, while usually the effects of uh, in the patient of neuromodulation comes on after some time. 
uh, relying on some plasticity. And also the stimulation amplitudes that they use here is too high to be used in patients um, and not applicable in uh, patients. Here we have another experiment. Uh, we're looking at uh, tibial nerve stimulation. This is from uh, Ty, uh, Mr. Ty from the Pittsburgh uh, group from uh, the growth. Um, they looked at uh, tibial nerve stimulation um, and in a cat they also have rhythmic uh, contractions here and apply different stimulation uh, amplitudes to the tibial nerve and uh, above, I think this is one time motor threshold, this is two time motor threshold and then you see that some of these contractions are inhibited uh, for a while and then it starts again. And with increasing amplitude, uh, these contractions uh, are gone. Um, now, we have done something similar actually earlier uh, in MS patients. And this acute effect was not seen in MS patients. So here we have eight patients and we fill the bladder, and each time at the onset of a contraction, we start at stimulation on the tibial nerve with an amplitude as high as, pos as, as, high as possible so that the patients were just able to tolerate, um, and no effect was seen on bladder pressure uh, in none of these patients. Um, however, all these patients responded very well to genital nerve stimulation. So this uh, it is not that the MS disease in these patients caused damage to their peripheral nerves. So again, uh, animal work here on tibial nerve trying to optimize uh, uh, therapy outcome, um, you know, may be very limited because tibial nerve stimulation acute effects are not seen in patients, at least not with the amplitudes that can be used. So uh, to sum this up, now, it is very difficult to create an animal model with a relevant disease. OAB, as mentioned, you know, we don't really know what it, what it is. It is a symptoms. Um, um, neuromodulation may affect um, extensive networks, uh, but these networks are not necessarily the same in um, animals. Also, in patients, uh, as has been said before, the effects, they come on after some time. Uh, relying on plasticity, uh, while necessarily in most of these animal work, it is all we're looking at acute effects. Uh, in addition, results may be obtained in these animal models with parameters, stimulation parameters, not possible to be used in patients because uh, they will cause pain or other side effects. So um, I therefore think that where possible, we should use human experiments. Um, and this is uh, possible uh, in patients with uh, urological problems. Animals, of course, can certainly be used to look at more simple problems. For example, the effects of a nodal block, uh, the effects of high, high frequency stimulation um, before we go into the human. But also their simple effects are not always replicable in uh, patients because par parameters may be very different. Okay, um, we have heard about some of these devices that are available um, in the clinic for um, uh, urinary disorders. Uh, we have the uh, Interstim, um, it's used for both uh, overactive, overactive bladder and retention. Um, and if you look at the literature, then you can read that it means 60, of, 60 to 80 percent of the patients, they respond successfully. However, what is the definition of a successful responder? That is that they have a larger than 50% improvement. Okay? So if this patient has 10 uh, incontinence episodes a day and goes down to four, you know, this is successful, still incontinent. Um, only 10 to 20% of these patients who are implanted are actually symptom free. Um, but then you also need to realize that these numbers are after a test. You know, all these patients, they have been tested, they are fit with the system, are stimulated for a couple of weeks. If they respond, then they receive an implant. So these numbers are not, you know, uh, based on the number of patients where you have the intention to, to treat. Um, 
these numbers are actually better for, uh, for fecal incontinence uh, and also for retention. We also have the, uh, the urgent PC uh, for uh, overactive bladder, uh, which is basically stimulation of the tibial nerve, uh, where stimulation is not continuously, but it's in a re repeated fashion, uh, and there the, the outcome is somewhat similar. So how could we do better? Uh, because I think we really need to do better. Uh, more patients need to be dry, need to be cured, need to be symptom-free. Well, one possibility is to do uh, on-demand genital nerve stimulation. Um, what happens if we stimulate the dorsal genital nerve, which is a branch of the pedental nerve? That is, but then we evoke a reflex that is present in all of us and is uh, active during sexual activity. During sexual activity, the dorsal genital nerve is activated and inhibits, inhibits the bladder because during sexual intercourse, you don't want to lose urine um, because urine kills sperm cells. So during sexual activity, uh, the bladder is inhibited. Well, this is something that we can use in a system. So we can uh, stimulate this dorsal genital nerve, this traffic will go up to the cords, and then in return it will go down to the bladder to suppress it. This is something that we can do on demand. So here we have a bladder trace, these spikes are bladder pressure, these bars here are that when the stimulation is on. So what happened is stimulation starts to rise, we switch on stimulation, and in response, immediately the pressure falls down. Uh, and this can be repeated. And in, here we can see the increase in uh, bladder volume, indicating that uh, we can increase bladder volume and therefore uh, uh, prevent the incontinence. Only at the end, after a certain vo volume, the system is no longer able to suppress the contractions and uh, leakage will occur. Um, Besides the bladder contraction, we also can suppress uh, the urgency. In this way, we can affect fully restore the incontinence because we can warn a patient after a few contractions uh, or after, after first contraction and tell them, well, you know, now it's time to find the bathroom or the toilet. Um, and in that way, you can prevent that the bladder becomes too full, full and thereby the patient will be continent. Uh, this may also prevent habituation, which can occur with these systems where there is continuous stimulation. So, um, in that way, we have a kind of closed-loop system as depicted here. Uh, we need uh, to wait for an increase in pressure in the bladder that needs to be detected. Then, in response, we can switch on stimulation, which will lead to inhibition. The pressure will drop again. Stimulation will be turned off and just wait for the next contraction. This is something that we tried in, uh, well, first, first in spinal cord injured patients uh, with an external system here where we recorded bladder pressures um, and we filled the bladder and then with an external system to, re to record these pressures and after a certain pressure switch on stimulation here on the uh, dorsum of the penis overlying these, uh, the dorsal genital nerve. Um, here we see what happens in a particular patient uh, when the switch system is off. See here, this is the spikes are bladder pressure. Uh, this line here is bladder volume. There's a spike here in the pressure. Uh, there's actually leakage because the volume drops and then starts to increase again. So there are contractions and at each contraction there is uh, leakage. Uh, you can see here there's only 15 minutes of filling before we have a contraction. Now here we switch on this, this, uh, the device and you can see there is no leakage whatsoever. There are many small contractions, but each is detected, stimulation is switched on, and the pressure goes down again. Uh, you can see instead of 50 minutes filling, this patient can go for about 50 minutes before there is leakage. Uh, summarized here in 13 patients, uh, we see in each patient an increase in bladder capacity uh, compared to without st stimulation. 
So this ID works. Uh, but, um, you know, service electrodes, they cause problems. So we need an implanted ele electrode. Now, this is rather simple, although this may be in a sensitive area uh, and is also ad adipose tissue where we need to place an electrode. But this can be done, and we have already implanted electrodes uh, for up to two weeks in patients. Um, but the second thing is long-term uh, pressure recording is not possible. So we need some other way of sensing. Uh, and we can do this by a secular route, uh, ENG, artificial sensors, or we can also do this patient-controlled. Now, we actually did six uh, patients where we investigated where these uh, signals are available. You know, there's animal work which, uh, where with recordings from individual sensory fibers which indicated upon bladder filling uh, there is an, uh, there's an increase in neural, tr neural traffic. But if we record here from a Sego route, potentially we also have a problem with, uh, with noise from other sources, from the skin, from the genitals, from the rectum, because all these fibers converge here into the sacral roots, and uh, we may have a problem with selectivity. And we record something, but how do we know that it is from the bladder? Um, I'll skip this one. Um, so when we fill the bladder uh, without doing any other stimulation, we could see here in a patient that uh, upon blood increasing bladder pressure, there was also an inc increase in the signal. But, you know, the signal is very, very small. So we concluded from these experiments that it is possible to record ENG from um, uh, the bladder with a couple of trout in patients, but it's very, very small, and the signal-to-noise ratio is also very small. So we need to improve uh, upon the cuff trout that we used. How can we do this? Well, perhaps a smaller cuff um, on intradural roots. Uh, then we have a smaller diameter that would boost the signal. Um, but it is very invasive to do so. Um, yes, I know. I, yes. Uh, we can, re can record from the dorsal gang ganglion. We can record uh, with an intravesical uh, electrode. Uh, we can also use a multi-cuff electrode. Uh, I've, unfortunately, have no time, no time to go into this. But with this configuration, we could, in principle, record from all different fiber uh, diameters simultaneously uh, um, and also in different directions. Uh, this is a sensor that we have used. Um, there's another thing, these patients could also control it themselves uh, because a lot of these patients can actually feel that there's a contraction coming and then they could activate the system themselves. Um, but fast detection uh, intent is important. So in summary, um, Limited usefulness of animal work for therapy optimization. Um, on the month stimulation of the DGN may fully restore uh, continence uh, in these patients with o who are OB wet. Um, most simple would be patient controlled, but I think automatic control is most likely preferred, but it requires a sensor. Um, and then general, you know, the, in order to make this uh, product fly, you know, it needs to be le as less invasive as possible. Also, the complexity, complexity needs to be as low as possible, and user interaction, if possible, um, should not be there. You know, it should, it should run automatic. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll have 10 minutes of general discussion. So I'd like to ask uh, the two other speakers maybe to come to the front so that you can, we can have a, a discussion. We have a question from the Videocast website. So the question is from Dr. Susan Harkema from University of Louisville, and the subject is uh, collaboration for bladder neuromodulation. The message is the seemed contradiction of modulating two opposing mechanistic control of the bladder may be explained by complex processing within spinal cord interneurons. All information such as state of bladder filling, neuromuscular activity, such as whether you are standing or walking versus sitting, the state of sphincter activity and others is interpreted, and then a network of interneurons then execute bladder emptying. 
This may be supported by the preliminary efforts we are observing in epidural stimulation with bladder changes in voiding efficiency, with epidural stimulation and changes in recognition of fullness of bladder and control with those chronically implanted with epidural stimulators, even when the stimulator is off with motor complete spinal cord injury. It may be an advantage to form collaborative groups from multiple disease states and approaches to stimulation to collate the information to better move towards understanding of the underlying mechanisms. I don't know whether any of our speakers would like to address <laughs> no. that. Well, I, I definitely think uh, interneuronal circuitry in the spinal cord is an important target for various types of neuromodulation. Uh, in contrast to what Graham said, um, Claire Fowler's most recent speculation about the effectiveness of uh, uh, sacral neuromodulation in the treatment of Fowler syndrome, that is idiopathic urinary retention, is that it intercepts the uh, sphincter afferent entering the cord and inhibiting bladder sensory pathways and that neuromodulation turns off that inhibition. So essentially, it's disinhibition. In Fowler's syndrome, there is probably a faptic connections between the strided muscle cells. And that, that activity is maintained even during neuromodulation. But that contractile activity of the strided muscle activates afferents, which then go into the spinal cord and turn off the ascending sensory pathway. So these people with Fowler's syndrome not only can't empty their bladder, but they don't have the sensation of bladder fullness. And the sacral neuromodulation or inner stim restores that along with the ability to empty the bladder. So inner neurons are probably a key site right. where one input interrupts the inhibitory interneuronal pathway from another type of afferent input. Um, Ardell from UCLA, I'd, I'd like to re, uh, just emphasize the concept that peripheral ganglia also have incredible capabilities for reflex processing. Uh, my specific question was you, Chuck, in terms of when you talked about two of your different types of stimulation, one had memory, one didn't, in terms of the time after effect afterwards. Um, what did you find? Did you find with long term stimulation you actually changed the dynamics of the processing between central and peripheral in terms of efficacy of maintaining effectiveness with your bladder control? Because remember, you showed one thing, you turned it off, and you only had to have it on for short periods of time. And you, would, you lost effectiveness as soon as you turned off the stimulation. The other one lasted for a very long period of time. Or did I misinterpret what you were saying? I think that was... Dr. Doak? Dr. Doak? Dr. Chuck? Yeah. Yeah. For some of it. Oh. It's okay. tibial nerve. Okay. Okay. All right. I, tibial thought, nerve. I thought you were talking. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. All right. Basically, your, your memory function difference between stimulation to your peripheral nerves. One... You lost effectiveness immediately after turning it off once yeah, yeah. for a long time. <clears throat> My question is uh, efficacy with long-term stimulation reorganization in that circuitry. Have you mm -hmm. looked at that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that the, uh, the tibial, long, tibial nerve stimulation long-term effect is mediated by something that's happening in the brain and that it requires a more prolonged stimulation. Uh, about 30 minutes is necessary to drive this. Uh, whereas the pudendal inhibition is a spinal reflex mechanism mediated by fast inhibitory transmission through GABA release and activation of GABA receptors. And within uh, 20 or 30 seconds after you turn that stimulus off, it is, uh, it's, it, you know, the hyperactivity of the bladder is back. So I think you know, depending on the site, uh, you have different types of inhibitory circuits. Uh, these brain circuits um, are somehow sensitive to plasticity that's induced by high frequency, prolonged stimulation. And I agree with Nico that the acute effect of tibial nerve stimulation is relatively a relatively small effect comparison to the more prolonged or persistent effect of tibial nerve stimulation. So we don't know anything about the neuroplasticity or what we would call post-tetanic uh, inhibition or the high-frequency stimulation inducing uh, changes in synaptic efficiency. We don't know anything about those mechanisms. The but reason I bring this up is uh, in terms of our antiarrhythmic effect and cardioprotective effect. Can you use the microphone, yeah. please? Yeah. 
the reason I bring this up is because when we've used vagal stimulation or spinal cord stimulation in the, at least for our cardiac control, three minutes of neuromodulation can exert protective effects for 30 minutes to an hour afterwards. And huh? we think a large part of this has to do with changes in processing within the peripheral ganglia with obviously some influences at the end organ itself. Yeah, and this is in the uh, autonomic ganglia. Autonomic ganglia. Because someone mentioned this morning about how changes in the dorsal root ganglia might alter the response to vagal stimulation. I forgot who it was that mentioned that. And that's something that we should pursue further in, a, in the discussions later in the meeting. But the, the effects on autonomic ganglia of, uh, of hypogastric activation are something that occur for a relatively short period of time. They're reversible but uh, maybe in the uh, cardiac ganglia, this is something that's more uh, or longer lasting. Uh, I'm Mark Okusa. I'm a, a nephrologist from the University of Virginia. And my question is, is it relates to Dr. Ridgecoff's um, presentation in which he um, talked about animal and humans and uh, mentioned that we should stick with simple experiments for animals and more and then move to humans. I guess what I would like to know from uh, anybody is that uh, how do we move from animal studies to human studies? How do we transition um, from these mechanistic studies? Do we use large animals? Um, are large animals, or which large animals are more representative of humans? Yeah, I think this is very difficult to answer. Um, um, you know, if you want, if you have developed an electrode uh, and you want to stimulate structures, um, then you would like to stimulate uh, structures that have similar size than in uh, in humans. Um, so for that reason, we work a lot with pigs. Um, but uh, how we move from the pig to the human, uh, you know, we, we use it for for safety. Uh, and sometimes uh, demonstration of principle, uh, and when it works, uh, it may work somewhat. I don't think we should use uh, the PIC model for uh, optimization of stimulation parameters because it could be very different in the patient. So as, uh, as soon as it works, I I'd rather go for a patient to see whether we can get the same effect. If we assume that neuromodulation is mediated at least in part by a chemical process, that is, release of neurotransmitters and activation of those receptors in the central nervous system. Then, then we have drugs which are available to either enhance that chemical process or block that chemical process. So those drugs, in some cases like naloxone blocking opioid receptors, are, are often used in humans. So we could actually evaluate the chemistry of neuromodulation in humans using drugs which are currently available. And I might want to mention that if we think that a GABA receptor inhibition is important for pudendal nerve stimulation inhibition, there are agents not necessarily to block the GABA receptors like we did in animals, but to modulate GABAergic transmission. And we know various drugs like diazepam and alcohol and various other you know, more synthetic drugs uh, can alter GABA inhibition and alter it in either up or down direction. So you can use this chemistry, that is pharmacology plus neuromodulation, to evaluate the similarities and differences between animals. The other thing that we're considering is that you might want to consider in the future using drug combination with neuromodulation. If you know that X transmitter is involved in producing the beneficial effects, use a drug which enhances the action of the X transmitter, and therefore you might increase the efficiency of neuromodulation along with determining the mechanism by which it works. Finally, then, if we think neuromodulation targets pathophysiology, which ideally would be the right way to go, we don't want to affect normal function, we want to affect pathological function, that kind of study might give us insights into the etiology of various types of bladder diseases. 
Okay, I've been told that we have to wrap up the discussion. Um, the three people who still have remaining questions, can you come and see me and I will note down your questions so that when we come up for the final discussion, I can make sure that your points are reflected. Okay, yeah. thank you very much to the speakers and the discussants. Okay, it's time for lunch break. This is the data coordination panel and uh, the reason we have uh, this panel is because we're trying to figure out with so much unknown about the field and we're trying to set up the field, what amount of data coordination and integration will be required so that we can be successful in 10, 15 years that we don't have to recreate all new big data knowledge centers or something like that. So what I've done here is I try to invite people who have attempted successfully to develop integration models across academic uh, research programs as well as through interagency initiatives and have them give like rough, roughly five minutes introduction sort of like where they come from and what they bring to the table. And the hope is we can use the rest of the time to get input and feedback from the biology and the technology people as to what they believe is the type of data, the data that they need to look at and what type of data needs to be shared within the community and in what formats. So we're going to begin with uh, Dr. Raja Mark um, from MIT. He has been um, working with PhysioNet, which is a physiological network, which is a free database that has been established for more than 15 years, I think. And he's also running MIMIC, which is the multi-parameter uh, intelligent monitoring for the signals from the intensive care unit. And this, these are uh, networks basically demonstrating how open sharing of data, a concept which was really foreign in 15 years back, which is now taken as a matter of fact. And he will show us like what can be done in that space and what do we need to have established for getting that done. Roger. Thank you, Vinay. And while you eat your lunch, I'll try to transmit a few things. Uh, so yes, PhysioNet was established here in, in 1999. Uh, its official name is a research resource for complex physiologic signals, supported by NIBIB and NIGMS. It's basically a web-based resource. It was designed to support both current research and to stimulate new investigations in the study of complex physiological and clinical data. It has four closely interdependent components. One is a, is a data repository, which we call PhysioBank. It makes available more than four terabyte worth of collections of physiologic and clinical data. It's uh, completely open, internet accessible. Second, it has a library of related software, which we call Physio Toolkit. This software is primarily for data exploration and analysis. Um, <clears throat> and let me say that the data and the software uh, that sits on PhysioNet comes from all over the place. Many people have made contributions, uh, both of data and of software. And the third piece is something called PhysioNet Works, which is, the, is, a, is a new experiment um, it's a private shareable incubator for ongoing research, which I'll speak to in just a minute. The impact of open distribution of this data is really impressive. We have at least, <clears throat> excuse me, 40,000 users from all over the world. And if you look at the number of visits per day, it's more than 5,000. There are more than 700 gigabytes of data that are downloaded every day to users all over the place. Uh, many of these people, of course, use the data to do their own research, much of it biomedical engineering, uh, signal processing, et cetera. And out of that comes, according to my most recent search, somewhere in the order of 130 uh, articles published every month. I have a strong bias about sharing research data and sharing research results. Uh, as we all know, we were all supposed to do this. 
We say we're going to do it, but the amount of research data that actually ends up being available to the research community is a small fraction of what's generated. And um, my theory is not that investigators are proprietary and they don't want to share their data. My theory is that when the work is done and the postdoc or the graduate student has left, no one knows where the data is. And even if they could find it, it wouldn't be annotated. There wouldn't be sufficient metadata for anybody to make any sense out of it. So my theory is, I should say my belief is, <laughs> that if you don't store, archive, and annotate your data in real time prospectively, it will be gone from the face of the earth, and the money spent to develop that data has been wasted, except for the publication that comes out. I'm over-exaggerating, but I mean, basically, that's the idea. So we set up Physio Networks, and the idea here was that um, you would have a, uh, now, I don't know, this thing is going to really be bad news. How do you make, see, I knew it. How do you make the red light go? What do you want? I want a red light. That's right. That is your this one. Ah. Okay. So the idea here was that during active research, what you want is a private place that's secure, that's protected, that's backed up, that's controlled by the PI, that is open to collaborators, and both the PI and the collaborators can take their research data and put it into the vault. They can invite people to use it but not contribute to it. We'll call those reviewers. And during the active research, that's what you do. But you make sure that the data is here, that it's organized, that it's understandable. And when your papers are written, and when the time comes to release it, you turn the switch on and make it available to the public. These are some of the challenges that uh, I think we all face, and this program will face. I mentioned already data is not shared because it gets lost, and it's not annotated with high-quality metadata. Often the data are not searchable. It is true that developing and managing a, an archive, an open archive, is resource intensive. And PIs in general are not motivated, they're not equipped, and they're not funded to do this kind of work. And of course, there are long-term support issues if you want to have such a resource. My last point is that in thinking about this general problem in the context of our university, I became convinced that this is a job for the university library. I think it's the future of the library. And I think the library, which is an institution that I know because I can walk down the hall and talk to them, is a place where I could comfortably put my data. They know how to archive. They know how to catalog. They know how to share. The only thing they don't know how to do is how to acquire the data. And so building uh, interfaces between investigator laboratories and the library is a, is a research question that needs to be solved. And of course, the issue of motivating comes from the Office of Sponsored Programs, I suspect. Or it comes from the uh, review committees for grants who ask the question, well, where is the data that came from last year? I'm done. OK. Thanks, Roger. Uh, so the next speaker is Mark Newson, who's flown all the way from Stanford and just landed. So, Mark has been working on uh, ontologies for quite a while, and he had uh, the National Center for Biomedical Ontology, which was funded through the NCBC program at the NIH, and he has now got a big data knowledge center for developing ontologies for big data. So I hope we can make a brief talk. Use acapella if necessary. <laughs> there we go. Uh, thank you. And Vinay has encouraged me to be brief, and I will. But I want to give you an overview of what the National Center for Biomedical Ontology is and what I think it might be able to offer the SPARC initiative. 
I think in this room, when most of us hear the word ontology, we probably think of the gene ontology, which has done a remarkable job of categorizing a large fraction of what we think of as basic biology and allowed us to be able to do all kinds of experiments, primarily in the, uh, related to understanding gene sets and gene expression, and uh, has sort of become the poster child for, ont for ontology in the biomedical community. That said, there are, there are hundreds and hundreds of such ontologies that are used uh, to deal with problems that run the gamut from molecular biology to clinical medicine. And at the NCBO, we are uh, at NCBC, and of course in our, in our, in our fading last year, uh, where we have been developing a program where we create and maintain a library of all the world's biomedical ontologies, the ones you know and love, ontologies like the gene ontology, ontologies like the International Classification of Diseases, and of course a lot more, more obscure ones. We build tools and web services that help people access these ontologies and use them to help analyze their data and to make their data more accessible on the web along the lines that Dr. Mark just discussed. And we have a major collaboration component. So one of the things that we are eager to do is to work out collaborative projects where we might be able to in integrate with the Spark community, for example, and to do just that. We have lots of people who come to us and lots of people who use our services, many academic groups, many commercial groups. Our website gets about 10,000 unique visits a month. We have about 4 million uh, API calls a month. And so we're really a very, very active site. And what we have is primarily this resource, which allows us to categorize and, and serve up all the world's biomedical ontologies, all the way from the Allen Brain Atlas Anatomy Ontology, all the way to the Zebrafish Anatomy Ontology. Uh, right now, we have about 420 such ontologies in our, in, our, in our repository that you can access either online through the web or through an API. You can search them. You have ways of referring to each term individually, and there are mappings between them. So basically, you can think of BioPortal as offering 420 ontologies that gives you the equivalent of the UML, UMLS on steroids. So we have lots of ontologies that may be valuable to the Spark Initiative. We have the gene ontology, obviously. We have clinical ontologies like SNOMED. Uh, we have all the ontologies that have come out of the neuroscience information framework. And we have a lot of resources that may, although perhaps not ideal to be used on block, may have terms and pieces that can be pieced together in ways which may be very valuable for the kind of research that's going to be done here. The other thing we have, and I can only show you a small piece of this, are ways in which we can use ontologies to annotate text. Give, give, give uh, uh, BioPortal some free text. Uh, what we will be able to do is then tell you what are the ontology terms that relate to that text. What ontology mentions might there be in that text. This is really great for taking metadata and linking it directly to ontology terms, making uh, data discoverable, and all kinds of things. I'm going to skip over things because Vinay is already holding up his zero slide uh, and just tell you that basically NCBO really has lots of uh, ways in which we can interact with this group. And we're very excited about the possibility of doing that. As you can gather, there are lots of ontologies in BioPortal for anatomy, for neuroanatomy, for de developmental biology. All of this stuff will be important uh, to the Spark Initiative. I can actually say most of the neuroanatomy work is not so great, and so there may be opportunities in this community to actually do a much better job, particularly as we understand more about neuroanatomy through the experiments that will take place in this community. Uh, we have services that use ontologies to annotate data, to search data online. Uh, and as uh, uh, Vinay mentioned, we have a new BD2K grant that is going to actually take this kind of capability and make it even more, more exciting, I think, in terms of allowing us to annotate data with more informative metadata. And uh, obviously, we are mandated to collaborate, and we're eager to develop those collaborations. And I'm getting the hook, so I'll stop there. Sorry for the really lightning talks. Um, <laughs> the next speaker is Stephen Schur from University of Miami. He's uh, he's working with the laboratory uh, library of integrated networks-based cellular signatures, and he's been building the data coordination center for this library as part of the BD2K initiative too. So, Stephen. So hi, pleasure to be here. So I'm one of the three PIs of the Data Coordination Center for the Library of Integrated with Cellular Signatures. And um, what I wanted to do is um, just take a step back, you know, and think about if Spark uh, wants, to, wants to deal with the issue of bringing all the different data together and with the goal to build like a, a, a really an integrated model of all of these data sets and be able to then leverage it within Spark, within individual labs, but also beyond that, you know, how, how you approach this. And I think some of the experiences that we had in Lynx and others can probably be uh, at least 
I would hope somewhat somewhat helpful. So if you think of data standards, so you can you can typically divide them into like reporting guidelines. Those are checklists, and they define and specify what information need to be captured about an experiment for a particular purpose, right? So, so, so what do you need to capture to accomplish a certain goal? And then you have controlled vocabularies. Mark just talked about this. Um, these are the, the terminologies, the terminolo terminolo terminological resources that provide identification and definitions of those entities that you want to define, right? And then you have, of course, the data formats. I want to talk about this. These are specifications of how the data are encoded to be computer readable and processable. And then if you think about, like, uh, you know, lots of different types of data, and there are also data structures that refer to the organization of the data, the data schemas, and the entity relations. So there are several resources. You know, BioSharing is a great resource that has uh, data standards, um, um, the file formats, uh, terminologies, um, and reporting standards. So talking about reporting standards, um, reporting guidelines, there are uh, tons of those already developed um, for the in the minimum information guidelines uh, bioscience project. This is the MIBI, and um, uh, you know, lots of things are there. If they're not there, they can be developed. So I was involved in a project at the University of Miami region base, and uh, there wasn't a standard for what to report for spinal cord injury experiments. And um, basically, it was developed. You know, and to do this, you know, it was kind of like a lot of work. You have to bring all of the people together, have a workshop have people agree, but then an outcome can be that there's a new reporting guidelines for those type of things. So I'm going to talk briefly about vocabularies versus ontologies. So controlled vocabularies to describe what, describe what things mean. They link terms to human descriptions and um, have entities with identity criteria. They're sh there to share knowledge in a common language and um, natural language synonyms and are used for text and so search and text mining and ontologies contain the entities and their relationships and object called object properties. The entities are called classes, object proper, relationships are called object properties, and they capture and abstract knowledge using axioms. Right? And then you typically have an explicit specification, some data format how to do this. And this allows to build formal computable models, compute with knowledge, do reasoning, and, and of course is a foundation for semantic web kind of information systems. And Mark Musen is an expert in this. They developed like, tons of tools, um, not just uh, the BioPortal. Uh, but you know, if you listen to those talks here, right, there's so much knowledge everywhere here. Ontologies may be a very useful way to capture this kind of knowledge so that then can be incorporated into models. So ontology, ontology resources, NCBI BioPortal is one of the most important resources. And I have to say it again here with the NIH folks in the room that I think this is really um, a critical resource to maintain. Um, um, you know, I'm certainly not the only pe person who says that. The EBI has an ontology lookup service. It's also like other approaches, like the OBO Foundry, that take a little bit of a different approach of how to deal with ontologies. Whether one um, agrees with that or not is up to debate, but those are resources for ontologies. And now I want to talk briefly, like take like two more minutes to talk about this metadata, how to, how to approach the whole problem with metadata and try to specify metadata. So what, what are metadata? If you want to just say it in, like, really in, in one sentence, it's everything that's not directly measured in your experiment or obtained in a study, right? And why do we need this? These are the obvious things, you know, facilitate replicability, reproducibility, reuse of data, interpret results, repurpose data, and build information systems. So now, what metadata do we need to capture, right? So for us, a useful distinction was to have model metadata. So those model metadata are required to understand, interpret, and integrate results. And they would be typically queryable in a software system. And are these important parameters that describe conclusions, for example, that you have in data visualizations and figures, right? Versus the other data, data confounder metadata, are non-model metadata required to replicate and reproduce results. They're kind of needed for forensics, right? If something goes bad, have the batch information, you know, experimental equipment and stuff like that, right? So now, and what the approach that we're taking is capture everything, you know, in text somewhere, your experimental procedures, SOPs, and make the model metadata explicit, right? So controlled vocabularies and, and standard formats. So, but now if you think about this a little bit, right? What really are the model metadata, right? Because depending on what your problem is, this can, this can be very different, right? So that brings us to the use cases, data and informatics use cases. And Dr. De Grout, he had a bunch of questions in, in his slide, which are actually use cases, you know, for those type of ontologies. 
And, and so what types of queries and analysis do I want to do? What kind of integration with other data sources? What kind of in information systems and UI components to build? And then what should also consider reuse um, of data for other projects? We published this last year for links. And finally, I want to mention one other thing for data coordination. So typically what people think is, oh, we're going to have this, we built this huge centralized database, you know, and all the different groups here put their data in and they build a nice UI on top of it and it's great, everything is perfect. Um, but really today, where data is produced in so many different areas and so many different um, repositories and they somehow have to all fit together, right? We, we are more, more, um, approach, more moving towards an approach where there are already repositories for certain types of data, or right? different types of data. And then the data coordination center is more like a place that builds um, kind of a loosely integrated framework to make all of this data queryable, indexes all of this data, and, and makes, makes sure it can all be accessed, but it doesn't do the data replication where everything goes into this repository and then has another repository that has duplicate information, needs to be maintained, potentially will run out of funding, right? But more like uses those, and, do, and builds a, a light kind of search engine, loose integration framework to access all of this and make it useful for the community. And so kind of like in a way bringing your data, bringing your tools to the data rather than doing data replication and trying to do those things again with potential replication. So I stop here. Um, I, didn't, I won't talk more about um, provenance, but um, the slides can be shared and then maybe people can look at this. Um, because I think people are also asking about provenance, but I don't think we have more time. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so I have Matthew McAuliffe, who's coming up to talk. The question is, uh, do people have questions they would like to discuss before that? or Because Matthew presents a, presents a different point of view, which is uh, uh, he is representing FITBER, which is a federal interagency traumatic brain injury repository, and uh, this is a collaborative between the Defense Department and NIH. So... Yep, I'm all done now. Uh, no, okay, so um, my background here, I'm, I'm here at NIH, and I su I've supported a number of programs. One of them, which started out with the NDAR, which is the National Database for Autism Research, which was collecting data from uh, autism researchers who were doing um, data collection. They were required to submit that to a centralized database in a consistent way using um, common data elements. We took that idea to support FITBER and Parkinson's, or FITBER, which is traumatic brain injury, as well as Parkinson's uh, uh, disease biomarker program. So what we did was make a new version of NDAR, which was much more modular. Um, this is the motivation. Why do we want to collect all that data in a local place? You want to accelerate discovery, essentially. You also want to be able to re replicate um, uh, experiments or papers. Um, so uh, this is the motivation why you want to put or collect that data in a consistent way, whether that's a federated source or collect it all in one warehouse. Uh, well, when we re redesigned um, NDAR, uh, we built a system called Biomedical Research Informatic Systems that could be instantiated for different disease categories. It has some basic cornerstone pieces uh, here. One is the data dictionary. Uh, which supports the common data elements um, as, well, um, as well as the form structures that go with forms. We have a unique way of identifying the subject and tracking them over time with a random ID using a, a GUID system that was developed for NDAR. We have an electronic data capture tool, querying tool, which allows you to query across different studies. But the reason you can query across different studies is that people have collected their data consistently and submitted their data uh, using the common data elements. We also have an imaging tool. We, we collect imaging um, uh, and put that data into the uh, database or informatic system as well as genomics data. Just a real quick, this is the flow. They enter data into the um, electronic data capture tool. Some people are familiar with REDCap, same thing. It's ProForms, but it's integrated tightly with the BRIC system in that it interacts and validates against the common data elements within the data dictionary to make sure that you, if you're saying the Glasgow Coma score is uh, total score should be between 3 and 15, it makes sure that the data you're submitting is between 3 and 15, is not accidentally negative 1 or, or whatever. It goes into a long-term repository. There's a workflow that uh, was mentioned earlier. The data first goes in as private. Only the PI has access to his private data. After some period of time that either publishes the data or the grant ends, that data goes then into the shared repository. Only people who have gone through the access committee have um, to get an account to get into the system. 
they have access to only their data and all shared data. Um, so this is the query tool. You can identify the different studies. So you can say, I want to go and look at study A, B, but not C, and I want data from uh, study E. You can go and get that data and then um, download it and analyze it locally. Um, so the cornerstone is our data dictionary. We have a number of systems that connect to the NINDS uh, data dictionary. Or their, It's our data dictionary that supports the NINDS common data elements for, uh, I think, 11 different diseases, stroke, ALS, traumatic brain injury, Parkinson's disease, et cetera. Um, we've also been, this is their website, we consume their uh, data elements and support them in our data dictionary, which then allows you to submit data into our system. Um, then uh, right now we're also working, NLM is actually working on a project to expose and eventually harmonize NIH CD efforts, CDE efforts in um, uh, at NIH. I forgot to one, mention one other thing. We support common data elements, but sometimes people's research is obviously unique. We support the ability in a workflow process for people to enter in their own unique data elements. They go in this draft, we get curate with them, uh, and then they get published and then data can be submitted against them. And we're almost done here. This is just a quick view of our data dictionary, nothing exciting. And this just shows you the query tool that, again, allows you to query across the different studies because data has been collected consistently across the different studies using, the, again, the data dictionary. And that's it. So that's a bit of, sorry. So that's a bit of a flavor of things that we might have to look forward to. Uh, Jill? So I just learned a lot from all those quick talks, so thank you to all of you. And one of the things that I'm struck by as I try to think about this is as we start up projects, it's, it's more than a commitment on the part of a data center. It's a commitment on the part of the investigators in terms of perhaps specialized knowledge, uh, time, uh, capturing all data. Uh, um, even that that's outside of published data is something that people don't normally spend time on and aren't necessarily funded for. So I'm, I'm curious to know if you have any recommendations for what does that look like from the side of the um, investigating project? What, what resources do they need? Do they need devoted time? Do they need a specialized person who can interact with the data center? What's, what's that look like? So this is for... Uh, Anyone who wants to tell okay. me. I can jump in there first for Fitber. We actually have an operations team that actually... Your mic, I, I oh, can do sorry. I'm not talking into it. Sorry, turn it on. Okay, so we actually have an operations team on the our data collection center, I guess you could call it, um, that helps researchers and works with their data managers to get the data properly collected and then submitted into our system. So for Fitber, which supports 50-some grantees, we have a team of six operations team. I think the question more is for the <coughs> academic or industrial uh, researcher, what what kinds of people do they need on the other side? And you alluded to a data manager, and I guess the, the question would be, do people see that as sufficient, or do you need 10 data managers, one and a half? Probably depends on the, the project, but um, I, I think that's the kind of feedback that we're, we're trying to get at. Some programs call these data wranglers, too, if you're familiar with that term. Yeah, so it's certainly the case in Lynx, you know, that there are um, people who are informatics folks and know the data are in the, in the data producing centers. They're called data and signature generation centers, right? And, they, um, and there needs to be really developing those standards really requires quite close interaction of informatics people and domain experts. So they really need to work together um, to make this work. And this is, this is, and I have to say, this is quite unglamorous work, you know, but it just has to be done, you know, so. But it's usually one to two people that we found with our grantees. My suspicion is that um, you need almost to build a specialized interface between the data resource and the investigator or the type of research that's going on. And then the investigators have to use it, almost like an electronic notebook that's set up specifically for your type of a lab. Setting it up is not going to be done by the investigators. I think it has to be done by the resource that's providing the interface. But within the group, uh, A, 
everybody could learn how to use it. All the postdocs and the graduate students can learn how to put stuff, who put information into it, such a resource. But <clears throat> developing the interface, the, to me, the question is, can you develop one interface that would match 20% of all the labs in your university and another interface that would interface with another 20%? Labs tend to be somewhat similar. There are imaging labs. There are, there are waveform processing laboratories. There are biological type laboratories, and so on. And I wonder if you couldn't have a generic interface built by whichever the resource is. Maybe it's the library. Maybe it's another center. But uh, yeah. But I think each group would have to take the responsibility of getting their experimental data and documentation into the system, designing it so that it's searchable, using the right ontologies and the right vocabularies, that's a separate issue. That's a, a separate task, not to be done by individual investigators, probably. Sorry, you had a question? Sorry. Uh, I'd like a little bit of discussion about, no one has mentioned uh, intellectual property and putting things into public databases before their time, so to speak. And the other thing, what do you do about early stage experiments where you want to go back and repeat it a few times before you want to release it to public uh, scrutiny? I think Roger uh, had some discussion about a privatized sort of database. It doesn't stay open for a while or something? Well, what I said was that there's a period of time when it's private. But if it's government funded, and if it's supposed to be made public at some point, that shouldn't be too long, right? Maybe one year, maybe a year after you publish or something. And if it's intellectual property, then you better protect it, you know, before it's made open. We use that almost exact same model, where it's, it goes into a private, and then after some period of time, either the grant ends or the researcher is published on that data, and then it becomes available is shared. It's not public. I try to use the word shared in our case because you still have to go through a data access committee to get access to the, for example, Fitbird database. I guess I had a question for the community is like, I mean, the biologists in this room, I mean, what do they feel the technology people should be providing them? What kind of data they would need and vice versa? I mean, what would really help them is, I guess, my question. I'm not sure if anybody wants to answer that or not. I'd be really happy if we had an electronic lab notebook that we could get that was useful for us, um, that was supported by the NIH. And I think the other thing that is missing is um, something where you can um, incorporate the scientist's view about whether the experiment worked at a technical level. It's, a, it's one thing to just kind of dump data hmm. and images into um, a, a system, but um, so many of the things that we do fail because the antibody was bad, we forgot to add a reagent, uh, the cells died, the incubator ran out of CO2, who knows? Um, there, um, I, I, a lot of what we do as scientists is look at the data for quality and then decide whether or not we're going to, to count, measure, analyze, interpret. And I, I would love to have a uniform way just in my own laboratory to record and keep data, so I, I like this idea. Thanks. Um, I guess one thing that I would really like to see, that uh, my name is Heather Orser, I'm from Medtronic, um, is a way to help pool all the data together. Because I think all of the systems that we're discussing and talking about are very large nervous system functions that no one laboratory is no. going to be able to investigate everything. And a way to pull that data together so we have a cohesive story would be fantastic. And that's a huge problem and, and, and question and challenge. But that's what I'd like to see. Okay. Thanks. I was just going to make the comment that one of the categories of data that we've found people find particularly helpful are the control data. So whether it's from control animals or control subjects, having a large 
um, repository with well um, you know, standardized phenotypic data for whatever it is, whether it's your, your mice or your rats or the, the age-matched control patients for a particular disorder. So Matt was talking about our um, Parkinson's disease biomarkers repository, and that's one where people are able to gain access to a standard set of information about both control patients and people at different stages of Parkinson's disease. So the, the goal of this particular project is to identify biomarkers that will tell you very, very, very early when someone is, has Parkinson's or is at high probability of having it. And what we found is that often it's the control data that people are finding particularly valuable. It's from University of Minnesota. Uh, in, in, in addition to just putting data in, you're not sure. Technically, it was correct. There's also reproducibility. Yep. I mean, one lab can do an experiment, come up with an interesting result, and years later, somebody else tries to reproduce it. They can't. So I don't know how you deal with that issue in terms of one lab is working on one model, one disease, and then how is that reproduced? That's, I think that's a critical Problem. And some, um, I think that's a really good point about reproducibility. I know in some common fund programs, we've actually done what, what we term benchmarking, where if we have, for example, four centers, they'll each get an unknown sample and analyze it and then compare the, the analysis, or they'll, um, the group will exchange samples or, or analysis tools. There, there are many, many different ways of doing that, but that, that is, that's a problem that, that we, we do have some ways to try to attack. One, once you have dumped all this data in your in your <clears throat> safe, how is that going to be used? I mean, what what, what are you going to make use of that data? There's even if we do a clinical trial and it's done in five countries, say at least about fifty countries, you have totally variable stuff coming from one country versus the other, depending on what the PI is doing there, even though the end result ends up being sort of summed together. How would you deal with that when you're with hundreds of institutions doing mice studies or rat studies or dog studies or whatever? How, how, how is it going to be useful? I guess I'm not getting it. So um, for PDBP, the Parkinson's disease, everyone's collecting ah. the same, da same data and yeah, and so it's a multi-site study that's collecting the same data and putting it into the database right. using so, the same common data elements. FIPR. So Project-specific, I am all on board. Right. So um, I was just trying to say that was that's one case. The other case, FIPR, which is very heterogeneous research, I think which you're, you're starting to address, <laughs> is that there's still a lot of commonality of the kinds of instruments and data that's collected, while sometimes the, the goals are different. They're, again, required to collect that data consistent with the common data elements that helps support some of the, the QA, QC process. Um, but again, if you find data in a particular study, it doesn't appear to be accurate in your analysis. You, when you do your queries, you can exclude that particular study from your, from your um, goal. Another feature that we're going to be adding into the, the system soon is what's, what we call a meta-study um, uh, bin or, or package where you do your queries across the different studies. You save your query, you save the data, and you um, indicate, um, uh, provide an abstract what that data was about. And so it does a snapshot of what was done so that you could go back and revalidate that data in that particular study. Mm -hmm. So if you wrote a paper on it, you would get a DOI that goes with that meta study that describes how you queried it across the different studies and the data, the exact data that you used for your analysis in your paper. Um, but it really comes down to whether or not you can get people to cons consistently collect data using a standard library ontology uh, common data elements. Add to this, uh, to this um, really quick. So at Lynx, for example, we would, we would do things like trying to link uh, gene expression profiles to drug side effects, right? Or to, um, or um, for example, we in, in, in Illumina the druggable genome, you know, we would develop tools to try to rank um, the novelty of a target by their drug ability and, and their drug ability and using all kinds of different data sets like genome wide association studies, all kinds of different data, and then link that up with, for example, data from the mouse, uh, from the comp mouse knockout project, right? So it's completely like a feasible thing to try to integrate completely different types of data sets. There are always common elements. For example, in clinical trials, you can, there are standard ways to capture side effects, right? And to um, record those, you know, and if you, uh, if, and, and if that data is, if there's a large data set for those, then 
um, that can be linked to other data that's known, uh, for example, that where, where a cellular system or something else has been exposed to the same compounds, right? And, and then certain correlations, certain, certain connections can be made that then could be useful to um, perhaps later um, identify side effects or predict them in some way with simpler model systems, right, that are less expensive than clinical trials, for example, right? Okay, so. we, for sake of time, we're going to stop the discussion here. If you have more questions, you can just email me or just reach out to me and I'll take them forward. And you can also email the Spark Symposium site. Okay. Uh, Jelly, you want to take over? Or uh, let's see, Terry. Okay, we are running 15 minutes late. I'm Ranu Jung, I'm a biomedical engineer at Florida International University. And after the wonderful discussion and presentation, enlightening all of us about the lower urinary tract and bladder and bowel and, and this morning, we are just moving up a little bit into the gastric system. And so the next, uh, two spe uh, next speaker is going to talk about the same, same structure as morning, um, a, bio, a bio person, and then a technology response, which will be followed by a 15 minute discussion. So um, with no, um, no more delay, let me introduce you, Dr. Terry Pauly, for his presentation. Thank you. In the next few minutes, what I want to do is, is sort of make two or three points. First of all, just remind you that, that uh, there are refractory GI disorders which would be candidates for neuromodulation if we had the neuromodulation in place. Secondly, I think that the visceral atlases of the GI tract are now coming online and become available, and there are some interesting new observations that may help design that neuromodulation. And with that redesign, neuromodulation, perhaps remediation uh, with that modulation will be practical. And this summer in Montreal, the International Mod Neuromodulation Society is having its 12th World Congress. They've been busy for quite a while. And if you notice, uh, the GI tract is actually in the sort of second tier, as is pelvic organs, as is cardiac function, the second tier of focus at the neuromodulation conference. Lots of reasons for that. And we could spend all afternoon probably discussing the multiple reasons. I want to just mention two. One of them is that perhaps there aren't any disorders of the GI tract that could be, uh, would benefit from neuromodulation. That's not the case. And in fact, if you, as you see, they're the classic kinds of disorders, the esophagus, a larger list perhaps for the stomach, and a list for the intestine as well. Most of these are incompletely or imperfectly controlled with present technologies and therapies. So in fact, the possibility of applying neuromodulation as a supplement or as a primary kind of, of manipulation is, is really there. So we do have the disorders. Uh, well, let me just, just say, I, I was going to talk about gastroparesis, but do, Dr. McCollum is going to talk about that. I do want to say a few things about obesity as an example of a disorder that I think neuromodulation has a role in already and it should have a larger role in, in the future. I guess everybody is, who hasn't been comatose is well aware of the, the, the uh, obesity epidemic. 30% of, of the folks in the, this country, adults in this country are obese. Maybe 25% have real medical complications of that obesity. And we've been trying to treat this love affair with extra calories and lack of exercise for a long time. Pretty unsuccessfully, actually. If, if you think about it, drug therapies have been woefully unhelpful in some cases and have had serious compli complications. As you know, the gold standard is uh, the bypass surgery, and, and there's, it, based on the ruin y procedure and other kinds of, of derivative procedures from this, it's gold standard, but when you think about what the gold standard has, it turns out that it doesn't cure obesity by any means. The remission or, or the reduction in overweight and obesity may be 25% on average, something like that, depends which review you read. And it comes at a considerable cost in terms of side effects, morbidity being not the least of which. And so, so if this gold standard would answer our questions for obesity, that would be one thing. But the fact is, it doesn't, which is a reason why I think neuromodulation, again, looks like a more appropriate kind of prospect. I do want to say, too, about, about the, the bypass procedure, that it has some disconcerting parallels with the old, old adoption analysis for the frontal lobotomy, if you think about it. 
If you, if you took the time some time ago to read Elliot Valenstein's book on frontal lobotomy, The Great and Desperate Cures, forget a minute what a cure would be, <coughs> Valenstein actually listed why it was that the frontal lobotomy was so prematurely and unsuccessfully adopted. And what he lists here is a list which I think you could apply with just a little imagination to our treatment of obesity with the bypass procedure. The first two fit the popular medium is all over the bypass and selling it as, as a, a kind of cosmetic surgery, practically. Uh, we don't understand the mechanistic basis of it and so on and so forth. So I think, I think one has to step back from, from the bypass procedure, decide whether it really is the future of obesity or whether in 20 years we're going to have serious misgivings about what may be a partial misstep here. Clearly appropriate for, for the very morbidly obese, clearly appropriate for the extreme cases, but cosmetic surgery, minor cases, I don't know if so. So, so we have a need, certainly obesity being a case in point, we have other disorders where we think uh, neuromodulation may make some sense. I want to return to this issue of complexity, and we are now taking a, about a quantal leap in terms of complexity. The enteric nervous system in the gut, and here you can see it with green fluorescent protein, a gene marker that's been used to insert the green fluorescent protein. It's often called the little brain in the gut. It is so complex. It is massively distributed through the whole gut wall, and it, is, it uh, has no pacemakers as such in it, but it is a distributed neural network. If you put your electrode here and stimulate, there's some chance it'll propagate and do what you want it to do. There's some chance it won't propagate very well and won't do what you want it to do, and will have counter-regulatory responses that it elicits as well. So how to stimulate this thing and de deal with this complexity is a real question. It doesn't respond to the same kind of logic that we talked about this morning. Straight up pacemakers probably aren't going, going to work. There's no on off switch. So what we need is some different way of, of, of addressing the system, I think. And this postdoc is wrestling with, with what, what I think is really the question, how do we make that complexity more tractable? And like this postdoc and his, it has, and his epiphany, I think that the Vegas may be part of the answer for making that complexity more simple or more tractable. And, and here's why I think that. If you go back to your vagus anatomy and dust it off, there are a couple of things about the vagus which make it a very attractive candidate for doing this kind of neuromodulation. The first is that it, it of course, connects the big brain in the skull with the little brain in the GI tract, and the other viscera too, by the way. So it potentially uh, is an obvious candidate where you can put your electrodes and stimulate at different sites. More than that, it is already doing neuromodulation. So the CNS is making decisions about nutrient intake and so forth, and it is modulating by way of the vagus, the GI tract. So if we could tap into, hack if you like, that neuromodulation that the vagus is wired up to do anyhow, potentially we would be on track to have some sort of neuromodulatory programs down here. And these would be programs that would have to be on the time scale of digestion, orders of magnitude different than the time scales of, of micturition. So it is a different kind of thing. The programs are going to be very complex, probably many of them initiated up here. But if, as I say, if we can actually tap into this program, and the vagus, we may be able to make something of it. The other thing I want to tell you about the vagus, which I think makes it a candidate as well, and this is where, uh, if you learned your, your textbook anatomy a few years ago, it was probably incomplete and, in a sense, wrong. If the vagus comes down here. It doesn't end in simple fashion in this region, but rather it has a very intelligent or smart architecture that it invests into the wall of the gut. And if there were a way to stimulate, so as to take advantage of the programs up here and the programs in the terminals of the vagus, we might have a, a serious neuromodulation therapy that we could use. So uh, to zoom in on one area, the vagus, as far as the stomach, and that's where I'm really going to be spending my time, uh, is, uh, ends in five different branches. You can go down here. You can find the branches. If you do the EM work on the branches, admittedly, this is not pot boiler kinds of plots that would keep you awake all night. But that said, this is, is if you do these kinds of things on each of the five branches, as Jim Prechtel did a number of years ago, and you do fiber caliber spectra on those branches, what you find is each of the five has a different fiber caliber in it. Almost largely C fibers, they're not wholly different kinds of distributions, but there are differences. 
If you could tune your stimulation of the vagus to take advantage of the local kinds of fiber calibers that you find in the different branches, you might be able, in some limited degree, to be able to talk to your organ, your organ of choice down here in the GI tract, or your site of choice in the GI tract. Uh, in addition to those green fluorescent proteins kinds of strategies, the, the neural markers in the recent years have gotten very much better, and you can use those to illuminate the pattern of the vagus in the, in the organ. And you can actually actually see the pattern of the vagus in the stomach wall here in, without even doing any, any kind of histology on, or any kind of section and sectioning. And what you see, if you hark back to that green fluorescent protein slide, is that this vagal innovation is essentially mapping itself onto that enteric nervous system. And it is plastering itself on that entire enteric nervous system in the wall of the stomach. If you do this kind of thing and you go to, go to histology and you go to dark field illumination, you can see the fan of the vagal fibers, the lightning strikes coming out across the stomach, and they form a very rich kind of, of network of endings in that diffuse nervous system. To take one step back and, and visit our friend the bypass again for a minute and compare it with this, there's an instructive point, which is that your bypass, when it excludes the stomach and the, and the duodenum from the food channel, is basically denervating this wall as far as the extrinsic innervation goes, completely denervating it. You couldn't really put the bypass back together, but if you could put the bypass back together and resuture here, you wouldn't be able to cause regeneration of these nerves. We, we and others have shown that the motor fibers don't regenerate into the organ. The sensory fibers regenerate, albeit quite abnormally, into the organ. So the bypass is really a critical kind of thing, a massive denervation. It also excludes the largest endocrine organ in the, in the body. So it has some, it should give one little pause to think about the bypass. If you zoom up in the microscope and look at this vagal innervation a little more carefully, this is the motor innervation. So this neural label is in the motor fibers. What you see is it is such a dense network that the vagus establishes in the wall of the stomach that virtually the cells aren't stained here, but virtually every cell is silhouetted in every ganglion by those motor endings. And the way it does that, at one time when people first saw that, that pattern, what they thought was, well, perhaps... Uh, those fibers are just passing through. Those fibers do not just pass through. What they do is form very beautiful contacts on each individual cell. There's another thing going on here, which is this is a, a myentary ganglion here. Only one cell is stained because we stain for catecholaminergic fibers, NOS stain. And what you see is that this vagal ending is interested in NOS neurons, but not in these unstained cholinergic neurons on either side of it. So these vagal fibers, when they come down, are organizing an architecture in the wall of the stomach that is just not random or stochastic contacts all over all kinds of cells, but rather is picking out certain kinds of cells. If you go over to the right, same thing. The brown is vagal endings. The blue is sympathetic endings. And what you have here is, again, an unstained silhouetted neuron sitting right here, and there are vagal contacts just all over that cell. And similarly, there are sympathetic endings all over that cell. So you're getting a convergence of sympathetic, parasympathetic. You see it in the connectives as well, where it's still brown is vagal and blue is sympathetic. That kind of convergence gives you a headache when you try to stimulate the wall of the stomach because, in fact, it's very hard to, you can't stimulate just the enteric nervous system, you can't stimulate just the parasympathetic or just the sympathetic, you're stimulating all of the above at the same time. Oops, sorry. And this, oops, I may have just aborted here. This slide was shown this morning. The only point I would make is as you go down the whole GI tract, you see a very similar pattern. It falls off somewhat. It's clearly there in the stomach. It's clearly there in the duodenum. As you go down here, fewer and fewer cells in the ganglia are actually contacted, but there's still a very healthy number of the total ganglia that are, are contacted by those vagal projections. Jump from, from the motor to the sensory for a minute. And, it, and the sensory endings do the same kind of thing. They are providing, again, what you might think of as a smart architecture in the wall of the stomach. So you have these fibers as they come in, and as when they start to bifurcate, they'll bifurcate a dozen, two dozen, three dozen times. The motor fibers do the same thing. And these, as these sensory fibers bifurcate, 
excuse me, bifurcate, what they do is throw off an interganglionic laminar ending, an IGLE, on each of these successive ganglia as they go through the stomach. They provide an innervation, an innervation field, and the way the stomach is organized, you have these innervation fields of the different fibers that are tessellated with one another. They're tiles in a mosaic, and that mosaic is the whole wall of the stomach. And these interganglionic laminar endings have an exquisite architecture, actually. These plates, of the, which is what they are, are made up of these lamelliform endings, contacts, and you can even see the dendritic spines all over these things as they hang down on the myenteric ganglion. And they do another thing as well, although this is only based on circumstantial evidence, but there's evidence that, that the IGLEs on a single afferent, and they come in, uh, basically create a kind of axon reflex arc. So the, if we stimulate this IGLE, as that fiber is activated, its, its sister on the same fiber is also activated. Circumstantial, but there's considerable circumstantial evidence for that kind of function. And IGLAs do one other smart thing, if you will, which is that they're selective. These are catecholamine NOS neurons, again. All the very lightly stained cells that you see here and the rest of the ganglion are cholinergic. This interganglionic laminar ending likes cholinergic cells, and it doesn't like NOS neurons. It is, it is selecting and targeting neurons as it sets up the program that the CNS is sending down. There's one other kind of ending that Hans Bertu and I described, actually, I guess, about the first time about 20 years ago, which is called an intermuscular array, an IMA. The fiber comes in again, and when it decides to bifurcate, it bifurcates profusely, but into a laminar, a rectilinear set of parallel neurites. These things lie in the smooth muscle wall of, of the GI tract, and particularly the stomach. <clears throat> and when you look at them, more carefully, you see more and more architecture in terms of what they do. This purple cell is an interstitial cell of Cajal, an ICC, and you see plastered on that ICC and the rest of its network of ICCs, these IMAs, which are, the, again, stained in brown in this particular case. If you go to ultrastructure, you see that the interstitial cells of Cajal actually have appositions or contacts from these IMAs as they lie in the smooth muscle wall of the, of the stomach. And so you have another kind of ending. Uh, the IMA has one other really interesting feature, I think, whereas the IGLE, the previous afferent, was, was basically universal in the stomach, the IMAs are a little more regionally and specifically specialized. These, this is the form it takes in the pylorus and in the LES both. In fact, the only after an innervation is in the pylorus. And if you were designing a neuromodulation scheme, what you might want to do is either monitor or talk to these only kind of sensory ending you find in the pylorus and in the LES. In other regions, like the fore stomach, they take a slightly different shape, a longer, more, a more elongated shape. And where you find them in concentration tend to be where food pockets sit in the stomach or where food pockets in, in the stomach, suggesting that they are stretch receptors. I guess that was on the previous slide. It's certainly the case that the vagal therapy is already being done for obesity. So when I say obesity is a disorder that we needed to attack and that the vagus might be one, one way to get purchase on, the, on obesity, the one that, of course, has already been discussed today here somewhat is the V-block therapy, which has had FSA uh, or had Food and Drug Administration approval. What they do is show that it's very practical to go in and find the esophageal body, put, put cup cuff electrodes on, on both of the, of the vagal trunks, this being the, the ventral one, and stimulate. So it's very practical to get in at the lower levels of the vagus and do some stimulation. In the case of the V-block therapy, as has already been pointed out in the early, earlier talks, it isn't stimulating, and in a sense, it isn't really taking advantage of those intrinsic programs that are hardwired in the vagal system. What it's doing is a reversible, very transient kind of, of vagotomy, if you will. So it's basically, it's the logic of this kind of therapy is very, very different than what I've been suggesting. It may work. The original trials, albeit justifying its adoption, are pretty marginal, I think, in terms of the success of the technique. Maybe a matter of tuning, tuning the thing somewhat differently. Um, since the time is ticking, I, I, I don't want to go on to the other things. I want to remind you, what, the, what I've been really talking about so far is the stomach. A lot of what I say though, extrapolates up and down the rest of the GI tract. So in the case of the esophagus, 
you see similar, similar kinds of architecture, this massive kind of bifurcation in the innervation fields with, with end plates that, that tell the system what, what to do. And these same endings actually talk to other kinds of, of, of tissue in the esophagus as well. So the visceral atlases that we're now getting for the esophagus, the stomach that we've been talking about, and for the, uh, the mucosa are, are really, I think, getting, getting uh, much better than they used to be. And in the mucosa I mentioned, I'll show you the slide momentarily, I want to remind you that I've only been talking about, about these myenteric ganglia in the smooth muscle wall. But of course, and obviously, the, the system is, is three-dimensional. And although there isn't time to go into it, I want to show you that, that, in, that in fact, if you go to the mucosa, you can find the, the architecture of the endings there in the, in the wall of the villi. You find what are presumptive chemoreceptors in this vagal system. And if you go and look at the, the uh, intestinal glands or the crypts, what you find is that vagal afferents ring those crypts and look at what's going on in the neck of the crypts. And so, so both in the esophagus and in the stomach, and in the stomach both smooth muscle and mucosa, the architecture is, is very well organized and to support very specific kinds of responses. This is where I started. I, I think there really are multiple refractory GI disorders which are candidates, the obesity being a case in point. I think the vit visceral atlases are really getting better. If you put those together with, with the next generation of electromodulation tools, I think the possibilities for remediation are really very bright, uh, in fact. Now, the Institute asked us to uh, bring a priority slide. Here would be, I guess, the priority slide. These two disorders, I think, are front and center because of their, uh, their, how universal they are or how frequently they occur. We've talked enough about obesity. Uh, I, I would say on the technological needs that we really need the next generation of stimulators, which, which basically are there. It's a matter of applying them. Most of the vagal stimulation work done to date is put electrode on, stimulate with very arbitrary frequency and, and amplitude, and hope for the best. But in fact, what we should be able to do, uh, that EM slide I showed you early on, is calibrate or tune our, fiber, our stimulation to our fibers to varying degrees. Some of the complexities of that were alluded to this morning. But to a first approximation, we can do much better than the work that's been done in the last 10 or 15 years. This stuff should really be closed loop. It really needs to be closed loop. And, and we should be able to, to use these microchips to do self-programming in real time. Take, take your, your biomarker that you want to program, whether it's smooth muscle activity or it's endocrine activity, CCK. For things like food intake with a very long time frame, the whole choreography of nutrition, we're talking a long time frame. And no biomarker is going to be perfect, but any of these biomarkers would be better than none, just putting on in an open loop system. We also need, I didn't dwell on what we don't know about vagal integrative architecture, but there are holes in what we do know about vagal uh, integrative architecture that we should, that we need to fill in order to really understand how that choreography occurs. So, thank you. We'll, we'll hold questions and do during the discussion time. Um, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Richard McCollum, and he's going to give the technology response. I want to thank the NIH uh, for inviting me to um, participate in this uh, very interesting development in neuromodulation. I've been, I'm a gastroenterologist, and we've been playing around, I suppose you could say, with this area for about uh, 20 years. So I'd like to share with you uh, a little bit of what's um, happening, perhaps in some of the fields, what could be happening, and some theories about what could make it better. So starting at the top, um, gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD, uh, is a huge challenge. Um, based on the PPI industry, uh, it's inexhaustible. And uh, yet you could argue, could there be some other ways of augmenting, perhaps uh, supplementing the deficiencies that may lie after anti-reflux therapy before we get to surgery or instead of surgery? And so these colleagues um, are developing a neurostimulation approach laparoscopically 
attaching electrodes uh, to the uh, GE junction. And uh, with these parameters, very low energy parameters, um, they are stimulating it on the basis that uh, this could lead to increased lower esophageal sphincter pressure. Uh, we, we, we actually don't believe that lower esophageal sphincter pressure predicts reflux. That's sort of days gone by. We now know that the major cause of reflux is a condition or a situation called a transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation that we have every day, particularly after meals and at night when we're asleep. And if the sphincter is opened, um, then it's a chance for a sudden reflux event. It's an unguarded moment. And the trouble and, and the goal would be for this device to stop those transient relaxations and to lower the overall 24-hour pH data that we obtain in these patients. So that'll be work in progress. The goal would be that some would have to be a GABA-related mechanism. G GABA uh, receptors promote transient relaxation. So I'll have to see where neurostimulation goes in GE reflux, but that's a, uh, an evolving area. Uh, the world of gastroparesis, 10 million people have gastroparesis. Uh, they're mainly diabetic, idiopathic, or they've had post-vagotomy encounters. And these people are struggling depending where they are. In mild and moderate worlds, they're responding to prokinetics, antiemetics, nutritional uh, approaches, and, and maybe okay, functioning. This group here we call severe who have very delayed gastric emptying and symptoms that are not responding to standard therapy, which has a very limited menu, many adverse events happening with the therapy. Up to 2,000 were living on jejunostomy tubes, maintaining nutrition. In 2000, uh, we were approached by Medtronic to form a team to develop um, a, a multi-center protocol on gastric electrical stimulation, the Intera device, uh, which is attached here um, to, um, which is usually about eight or nine uh, centimeters from the pylorus um, and connected by 35 centimeter leads to the gastric um, pulse generator up in the right lower quadrant typically, and uh, low energy uh, neurostimulation takes place. Now, you could argue really back in 2000 we were a little crazy because the stomach normally has three cycles per minute activity. Uh, why would one even imagine that 14 cycles per minute, uh, would, uh, 12 cycles a minute would make much sense? Uh, 0.1 second on, five seconds off. In actual fact, this device... Uh, Medtronic was using it for um, spinal cord stimulation and it was recycled into the stomach and some of us foolish enough to buy into this uh, did this double blind study and we got some interesting results. Uh, this is the device here uh, with the battery pack uh, which goes in the right upper quadrant and which can be programmed uh, and is usually upgraded as far as energy over time, depending on patient symptoms. Well, in 2001, this multi-center study was positive. This is vomiting. So people were vomiting over 20 times a week, and they came down to two or three times a week. Diabetics in red and idiopathics in, in, uh, or in yellow and the total amount in blue. This was significant. This was um, one month on, one month off, randomized at surgery and then later on connected for 12 months. And by 12 months, you were doing very well. You had a 75 to 80% improvement. 80% uh, of patients uh, had a, had a, 50 of patients had more than 80% drop in nausea two or three times a week. And it was approved by the FDA. And there are 1,000 of these being put in annually in this country. Over here, we tried to reproduce the data in subsequent years but probably not with the right study design. We turned patients on for six weeks, more or less out of sympathy, and then we said we're going to randomize you to sham or on, on or sham, after six weeks. The problem was, 
After six weeks, they were doing very well. They'd been entrained and they had a great memory because when we turned them off, they somehow remained fairly good. Perhaps not the idiopathics wandered away a bit, but not significant. And then after, after that time, they were all turned on for 12 months, did very well. So the feeling we got from, from this era is that personally it works. We know it works. I put in over 300 myself and so has many of my colleagues in the country. It's just not been easy to do the perfect double blind study. Uh, one of the problems is that you can't do a double blind crossover. That's the message. The, 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 the message is to randomize the patients at the time of surgery and go for three to six months on or off. That'll make it easy. But we did learn along the road there is a memory, there is an entrainment, uh, there's sort of a, a plasticity that's going on here that may be important to remember, and that um, hopefully the next study will overcome the inherent defects that we found here. But this is neurostimulation, uh, low energy uh, trains, and what it did uncover, uh, as we can see, is a very, very powerful anti-emetic effect that was heretofore unforeseen. It was similar in, in uh, diabetics and post-surgical. Idiopathics were not quite as good after a year. Be and it was nausea and vomiting that got better. This is the total symptom score. So what we learned is that other symptoms remain, bloating, fullness, pressure, pain. So when you go back to it, we decided let's do a study to find out what actually is this device doing. And so what we found is the, pr is the following. It does not change electrical activity one iota. These patients could have electrical dysrhythmias, tachygastria, nothing changes. Gastric emptying does not change. So why are they better? Well, the company serendipitously and very fortunately uncovered a unique centrally mediated pathway to control nausea. We believe that afferent stimulation is going up and with PET scanning, we showed the thalamus and the caudate nucleus, et cetera, lit up when you turn the device on for a month. The other thing we found by doing RR variability on cardiograms is that this was a major vagal nerve stimulation event. There was some relaxation of the fundus, which is vaguely mediated. You could eat better. But uh, the most redeeming and unifying feature is it's a powerful antiemetic, but it doesn't improve gastric emptying. So... Why, what could that, how could we sort of explain all that? Well, if you go back to the enteric nervous system, which um, has been described already today, and this is a more sort of uh, personal drawing of mine and from Ken Sanders, these are the muscles. We have the enteric nervous system, and then we have the interstitial cells of Cajal, the ICC. And these interstitial cells of Cajal at three cycles a minute entrain the smooth muscle. And if you, if you do depolarize and have a, an action potential, have a contraction, you can only do it three times a minute. Now, when, in gastroparesis, the problem is we've learned through hemoxygenase issues and nitric oxide issues in, in animal models that you lose the interstitial cells of Cajal. These are studied by CKIT, and here in a gastroparetic with human biopsies at the time of surgery, the muscularis propria shows a 40% 40, 40 of the time, even half the time, you've lost your ICC, meaning that you've lost coordination, you've lost gastric motility, and neuromodulation is not going to restore that. It may take away the nausea centrally, but you've still got a problem with the organ. So there's a couple of ways of approaching that. You could look at neuromodulation as being supplementary and complementary. We went ahead and started doing surgery doing a pyloroplasty. We would empty the stomach, normalize gastric emptying, and at the same time use the benefits of the neurostimulator to block nausea in the brain. And that's what we're doing today. And it's a very, very effective method of treating gastroparesis, and for that matter, treating nausea and vomiting of unknown origin, uh, very similar to or mimicking gastroparesis. This is a powerful antiemetic. That's the bottom line for neurostimulation of the stomach. This empties the stomach if it's slow. The other way of doing it 
is to go back to basics and say neurostimulation is okay. It's low energy, high frequency, more than the intrinsic. Let's go to intrinsic frequency and high energy. Let's pace the stomach. So we started putting electrodes on the stomach back in 1988, 1998. This was doing a jejunostomy. We put four sets of electrodes. And we stimulated from the proximal and we recorded from the distal. And then we stimulated with this homemade uh, pacing device attached uh, here to this uh, series of electrodes coming out of your tummy. And what it shows is you can take tachygastria, more than 3.5 cycles a minute, and normalize it. But that was a lot of, uh, that, that's, a, that's a lot of power going into one place. So we decided to use the best of both worlds. We started to put in a Intera device here, and then also put in four pairs of electrodes and paste from the first and the third. And also use that as a way of provoking or promoting the, the gastric emptying. This is again the wires coming out. This is a homemade device or electrically engineered device that the patient took home, turned on for three hours after every meal, charged up at night, and did that for a couple of months. And what, what we did is we took tachygastria and electrical dysrhythmia and regulated it. This is the second and fourth channels regulated after about 10 minutes of stimulation. There's the pacing spike uh, in those leads. So I think the message we, we found here was that neuromodulation may be good for symptoms like nausea and um, vomiting, but maybe for gastric motility and contractions and emptying motor activity, we may have to consider a stronger so-called pacing scenario. Another way of looking at nausea and vomiting is let's go back to even more basics. Let's go back to Chinese meridians and look at P6, the point just below your wrist. Or let's look at uh, ST36 right below your patella, which is another nausea point in the Chinese world. And we did that. We did cutaneous electrical stimulation, not with a needle, but with, with, a, with a, a, a wrist-like watch device over your wrist. Same time, we measured your electrogastrogram, and we did electroencephalogram studies on your brain. And what we found is that as nausea got better during electrical stimulation, so did the activation of the right inferior frontal gyrus become very apparent, as, and, some, and some also in the parietal lobe. So here's an example of centrally mediated effects of electrical stimulation of the wrist, acupuncture. At the same time, the patient's nausea gets better and the gastric rhythm gets better and vagal nerve activity goes up. All right. So let me just touch on obesity. We talked about the vagus nerve, but we've lost some faith in the vagus nerve. I have anyway. So I'm looking at some other ways. Another way of doing it is to actually induce dysrhythmia in the stomach by doing six to eight cycles a minute, yours are three, and pace backwards, either in the stomach or the duodenum, and that will make you nauseated. And by titrating that, going backwards, you could actually minimize oral intake or the interest in eating, particularly if turned on right before the meal is planned, and potentially in the future, endoscopic electrodes will help us understand uh, maybe some preliminary data, which patients will respond. Not all obesity patients will probably respond to this. And the final thing is just to touch on fecal incontinence. This is being done every day. So it's a great method uh, that we've de that's been discovered. The surgeons place them either colorectal or urological or gynecologic surgeons. And here is the device present uh, after one day or after a week or so, it's a trial, then it's placed permanently, and you see a major improvement in symptoms. What happens? Why does it happen? Well, the only thing we've found is that rectal threshold changes. You become more sensitive. Your rectal mucosal sensitivity is greatly reduced to balloon distension, and you sense things much quicker and much better. That's the only unifying thing that we've found so far. Muscle strength doesn't change much. So in conclusion, I, I tried to run through the, upper, the gut a little bit, give you an update on what's happening. 
I think a philosophical take-home message is that this is a wonderful way of reinvigorating, re-energizing some tributaries in the nervous system that may need to be sort of improved compared to drug therapy, where we leave behind a lot of footprints, adverse events, and sometimes unexpected adverse events. Here we don't have many adverse events, if any. It may not always work, but it is a very well-tolerated and, uh, I think, important advance. Thank you very much. Can I invite Dr. Pauli to be here, come here, too? Uh, so we have um, about 10 minutes for discussion. We'll chop off five minutes. And so um, questions from the floor. Very nice discussion. I was happy to see the slide of the varicosities of the vagus coming next to the lexi in the gut. Is that what it was? You showed the slide. I was sitting in the other room, so. And, and I didn't hear your question, I'm sorry. Uh, you showed the slide where you had the varicosities of the vagus nerves going next to uh, plexi in the myenteric plexus. Yes, yes. Okay. So essentially, my point is there is one element that's really missing. And I think uh, Yvette this morning alluded to you that you need a, a, the levels of neurotransmitters are extremely important. And people talk about brush over nitric oxide and all the problems. Essentially, it's due to the lack of secretion of these, neuro, of these factors. And my point is that there is the possibility of putting in enteric neural progenitor cells to increase the levels of the neurons in the gut that are able to secrete these neurotransmitters. Like, you can either, two ways to do it. Either you find a way to probably electrically stimulating the release, the uh, differentiation of in situ leftover cells that are not killed, some, some uh, uh, stem cells, that, adult stem cells that are not killed due to the disease in case of diabetes, or bring in from another part of the intestinal tract new uh, stem cells, either differentiate them in the lab and inject them, and that the technology is available. I mean, in my lab, we can take neuroprogenital cells and in vitro selectively differentiate them into either relaxing NOS neurons or cholinergic neurons. And the idea is that to be able to reach a point where you can inject, put them in so that, I mean, the analogy is no matter how much you bring in electricity in the room, if you don't have light bulbs, you won't have light. <laughs> and that's that's, no, that's yeah. how I look at it. No, no, I take, I, I take your point. And I'm, uh, as to the stem cells, I think somebody more knowledgeable about them than I should comment on that. But, but I, I would say that I appreciate very much and, and do take the point that you bring up about the neurochemical phenotypes, that those were slides that got tucked into the end of the talk and I didn't have time for. But certainly, as Yvette said this morning, there, there, there is a very uh, uh, well-developed and well-understood, actually, uh, profile of the neurochemical phenotypes in, in the GI tract. So uh, that just didn't make the talk, that was all. Uh, Simon Gibbons, Mayo Clinic, Rochester. Um, I think that uh, Richard made some interesting points uh, that relate to how what's happening after electrical stimulation, but the question that um, Dr. Pauli made about uh, pointing out about the different distribution of the vagal afferents relative to ICC and myenteric plexus raises the question, what's true for the human stomach? I think a lot of your data are from rat, or are some of those human as well now? Because that it, seems to be a really key question. Right, it's a great question. It, it, that is all rodent, it's my, mouse or rat. Uh, actually, my take on that, uh, though again, somebody in the room may want to take a different tack, is that uh, if you go into the human stomach and, and uh, stain with less specific stains that you're probably going to have to use in, in postmortem tissue and so on, uh, can't use tracers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's very difficult to find your way around from the forest and the chaos. But, but I think one of the things we've been trying to do in the last couple of decades 
is work out th this analysis here so we know what plane to section in, so we know what to look for. And so with the information we now have, I think you can go into the human stomach. You can do the search for the IGLE distributions and so forth. I think 20 years ago that would not have worked. But I do think we can give you a prescription for the topography of these different afferents. Work has not been done, though. Thanks. Gary Ma, University of Vermont. Um, as an enteric neurobiologist, I want to try to underscore something that has come up in Yvette's talk and in the talks that, that we just heard. And that is that the, uh, the stomach and the distal large intestine are pretty richly innervated by extrinsic nerve fibers. And I think they're ripe for being regulated, possibly, but by stimulation uh, strategies. But once you get into the small intestine, the proportion of myenteric ganglia that are innervated by uh, preganglionic nerves drops off. And within those ganglia that have innervation, the percentage of neurons drops off, off dramatically. And if you look at the submucosal plexus, there's little or no innervation at all. So the, within the 30 feet or so of intestines that we have, the secretory control the vasodilatory control and the motor circuitry is probably mainly intrinsic to the enteric nervous system and being regulated a bit by the sympathetic nervous system. So that stretch of GI tract is probably kind of outside of uh, the domain that we're talking about at this meeting. On the other hand, there are two things that are going on potentially with the, with the vagus nerve that are worth mentioning probably, possibly. One that um, Yvette mentioned, and that's anti-inflammatory pathways that seem to be involved in the vagus nerve. And there, there are a number of labs that have shown decreased inflammation in the gut with vagal stimulation. And the other is this uh, really interesting phenomenon where by uh, gut microbes can affect brain neurochemistry and behavior. And a lot of these changes are uh, eliminated by vagotomy Wolfgang Kunze at McMaster's has shown that, um, that the transmission of that information from the bugs in the gut to the vagus nerve probably involves enteric neurons and a nicotinic synapse. So that's, I just thought these were worth mentioning. What, what is the mechanism that causes the Yeah, well, I'm not promoting that one, but but uh, in fact, I, I think it is uh, f from the the way I've read the literature, and of course I don't do it. The way I read the literature, it is basically a transient vagotomy. If you do it for a few hours a day, you don't get much effect at all. If you get up to about 12, as those as those randomized trials suggested, maybe you're getting a marginal effect. And I think what you're doing is superimposing on the the patient quite a bit of, of vagal blockade, vagotomy, and then o over the uh, off 12 hours, there's some recovery. But but again, that's that's just one interpretation of those data. I thought one reason we stopped eating is that the stomach is distended and there are afferent fibers yeah, right. that go to the brain and tell us to stop eating. Right. Now, if we block those fibers, it seems to me we wouldn't eat less, we might even eat more. So we, Paradox is there, and that paradox, or the other, the other side of that argument, has been used to spawn just the opposite predictions and to, to suppose that vagal stimulation, even short of the vagal block, will, will have just that effect. It'll increase eating. So it's one of the treatments for anorexia, for example. So that occurred to me when Dr. McCall was talking about this that uh, you stimulated the pathways from the stomach to the brain, and you reduced nausea and vomiting. So are there multiple vagal pathways, some of which actually have a negative effect? They may suppress the satiety pathway, and therefore when you block that, then satiety is actually enhanced. If it's to me, that's why I emphasize the two kinds of afferents, because I think the one kind of afferent... Uh, the intramuscular array is really a stretch receptor, and it has some spindle organ characteristics. And I, and I think it operates very differently uh, by a different set of rules than the IGLE. So indeed, you, you potentially could come up with a, with a fit to your, 
model. Maybe an, another uh, possibility could be the fact that the ghrelin, uh, the ghrelin hormone has been shown to promote eating and its acting through vagal afferent stimulate the reward center and then uh, uh, increase the, the food uh, intake. So if you uh, bypass this um, orexigenic hormone that is acting through vagal afferents, you also uh, negate an orexigenic signal that is very powerful to induce this reward system to eat. This could be also another um, blockade of this uh, signaling, orexigenic signaling, through the lack of ghrelin release, which is under vagal control. To test, but... <laughs> Last question. Okay. Uh, Andrei Pachomov, Old Dominion University. And about neuromodulation, something that is, to me, most fascinating and also most surprising is that how do you navigate in that multidimensional space of different parameters of the stimuli? How can you choose pulse duration, number of pulses, electric field, current, how many bursts per minute, etc., etc.? And I don't see any studies which would compare the impact of one parameter or another. And it seems like the same parameters can work here and work there. And so far the impression is that the organism just needs some electricity and it gets rid of any condition. Well, you know, we're mostly focused on, uh, on uh, microseconds. That's what the Intera device does. Uh, this works at uh, 330 microseconds. Uh, five seconds on, uh, five seconds off, and 0.1 second on. It's basically vibrating your stomach. It's very, very low energy, and it was, it's a powerful antiemetic. They didn't know it, but it fortuitously bailed them out. <laughs> they have a great device, not through science, through luck, and it's a great device. It blocks nausea and vomiting. Now, if you want to go beyond that and turn up the heat, you go to milliseconds. And when you go to milliseconds, you start to actually induce contractions. You can actually induce contractions and make the stomach empty. Microseconds uh, don't do anything to electrical slow waves or contractions. So you, you can't have it both ways, as it were. You have to maybe have a device that's turned on half the day for nausea, microseconds. Maybe you could switch the device to... Uh, to then to um, milliseconds and, and uh, have an, a prokinetic motor effect with the meal. So you could have a, a dialable device that uses central neurostimulation at one time and motility contractility at another time. You could actually save uh, battery, battery power and energy by switching it on and off when you need it. So, so you have to sort of work up the scale from uh, low energy to high energy. Yeah, I take it, but just for the argument, there is, aside from the pulse duration, yeah. there are multiple other parameters right. that are used there, like burst duration, pulse rate, and just the energy there is just one parameter out of 25 different parameters maybe. And uh, there should be some master plan or how to study is to know what exactly are we exciting. Are we exciting the nerve terminals within the organ or are we exciting their targets? Or are we doing something else? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pauli and Dr. McCullum. Uh, we will start the next set and we are going further up the axis and now all about the heart. And uh, we will start with uh, Dr. Kalyanam Shivakumar and he's going to talk, um, talk about the regulation of cardiac excitability. Thank you so much. And uh, it's, it's a great privilege to be at the NIH, which has uh, uh, been a major source of funding for some of the science you'll be seeing at this presentation. So let me start off with our patient today. And I'm actually going to show you how neuromodulation actually is helping and saving lives. 
Here's a 32-year-old male with arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy is the diagnosis that was given, uh, presence with incessant VT, multiple morphologies, and received about 160 shocks, has skin burns, is intubated, and of course, this is uh, one of the most nausea-inducing ECGs that a physician can actually see in the ICU. Um, th th these are patients, uh, death is imminent. So using this as a segue, let's go to the bench, and then we'll come back to this patient. So I want to briefly touch on physiology, talk about neural response to cardiac injury and neuraxial therapeutic strategies, and set the stage for the next talk that will be given by Professor Zucker. So the brain-heart axis is very important in evolution. When you look at this, this is a modified slide from Wilfred Enig. And when you look through evolution, it's only recently in evolution, about 200 million years ago, that you actually see sympathetic fibers enter the heart. Until then, you see all is only parasympathetic fibers. And indeed, when you look at uh, mammals, mammals that are closely related to us, the land speed record for heart rate is actually held by the bat, which can increase its heart rate to 1,300 beats a minute. And it's very closely related to us. And this just goes on to show that there are so many mysteries that we still haven't figured this out. So I've been counting that this is the eighth time in this meeting already that you're seeing this particular slide. <laughs> And there's one difference among all these slides. If you look carefully, it doesn't show afferent pathways. And other than Professor Tache's slide, there is no other description of a cardiac ganglion. And I'm going to be talking to you a lot about the nerves coming in and out of the heart. And we owe a lot to the gentleman shown in this picture, one of whom is here, Professor Ardell and Professor Arma, who are our colleagues who have joined us at UCLA. So it's very important, and we don't teach this well in medical physiology, and that is you have to look at any innovation, and especially the heart. It's all been cardiomotor work. People have never stopped to consider the afferent systems of the heart. So the heart actually has its own intrinsic nervous system, and it has these nested feedback loops of reflexes in the heart, heart to spinal cord and back, heart to brain stem, and of course to the higher centers. So the autonomic nervous system regulates all cardiac physiologic functions, chronotropy, dromotropy, inotropy, lucitropy. And traditionally, the way neurocardiology was taught, neural control was taught, was along these lines. You had arterial receptors, vascular receptors, and then you had cardiac information that went to the spinal cord, to the higher centers. And people were teaching about these uh, efferent uh, relay stations as passive relay stations. And we now know, based on the fantastic work that came mainly out of the neurogastroenterology literature, that this is completely wrong. That's not how you look at it. As it turns out, the system is way more nuanced, and the heart actually has four major pathways, if you will, of afferent information that goes uh, via the vagus uh, through the nodos and the higher centers, through the DRG, then you have afferents that actually go to the intrathoracic extracardiac ganglia, and last but not the least, the heart's own nervous system, the little brain on the heart. So there are so many pathways of afferent information, and each one of these sets the stage for reflex control. And the exciting discoveries in the past a few decades have been the discovery of local circuit neurons within the nervous system of the heart itself, and also in the autonomic ganglia, which are fascinating uh, relay stations and which function essentially as miniature brains. So uh, how do we study this? Uh, it can be studied both in animals and in humans by direct nerve recordings, uh, direct neuronal recordings, which I'll allude to in my talk, direct spinal cord recordings um, and brainstem recordings and fMRI in animals. And in humans, interestingly, you could do uh, direct neuronal recordings, uh, direct recordings of the stellate uh, ganglia, and of course, functional studies of the higher centers. What underlies all this is going to be a lot of network modeling and analytics that is going to be needed for this uh, area of research. For cardiac mapping itself, uh, what in the world of electrophysiology that we do is we have high resolution arrays, and there's a whole array of mapping opportunities all the way from destructive to non destructive. In the world of cardiac uh, autonomics, we've actually gone with types of testing that does not interfere with excitation, contraction, coupling of the heart. So that is one reason why we do not use optical mapping, which 
uh, obligates the use of uncoupling agents because it just makes the heart electrically silent, at least from the afferent uh, direction. Uh, one of the big um, advances that has occurred uh, of late, and we had to incorporate this in our lab, is to use cardioneural mapping where we actually have neural arrays that record neuronal information and cardiac information goes through A to D converters. And so this is a way of integrating both electrical and the electrical propagation of the heart. So I was uh, hoping to briefly fly you through key aspects of the two major nerve pathways of the heart, the parasympathetics and the sympathetics. We'll start with the parasympathetic system, which of course has, uh, it, which runs along the vagus. And the vagus continues to be an incredibly in interesting nerve for uh, cardiologists too, because uh, it's more correctly viewed as a cardiopulmonary nerve, and it has a huge amount of afferent traffic that goes from both the heart and the lungs. And the data that is being sent to the brain includes ventricular mechanoreceptor information, coronary uh, uh, mechanoreceptor information, and of course, a whole lot of information on the atria. And this data is thought to have very important roles in volume regulation, sensing blood volumes in the atria. And this area is now uh, quite exciting because it may give us some new insights into arrhythmia such as atrial fibrillation. Now, what about the efferent direction? So what happens, there's been a lot of talk about vagal stimulation, which is the efferent stimulation uh, parts of the vagus. So when you perform vagal stimulation, and of course we can't you know, do pure efferent stimulation unless you cut the vagus and stimulate the downstream. But when you do vagal stimulation in the efferent direction, it actually has very important effects on ventricular action potentials. ARI is activation recovery interval, which is an index of the uh, APD duration in the heart. And as it turns out, it actually has a very important effect of prolonging the action potential duration. And the exact ionic mechanisms of this is still not fully understood. Sympathetic stimulation shortens the action potential, whereas parasympathetic vagal stimulation lengthens it. And of course, um, uh, there are uh, important uh, regional uh, differences in what is accomplished by these uh, effects. This slide has been put up here just to highlight the fact that we need mechanistic understanding of vagal stimulation because we have sort of had discouraging results from some of these studies. And the data, this actually was a slide created by Dr. Ardell showing the various trials that have been done in humans. And as it turns out, it's a complex three-dimensional surface, if you will, of what happens when you stimulate the vagus at least in in the sort of in terms of what it does to its cardiomotor effects. So it's quite likely that in various stimulation regimes, you could actually put the heart in a very unfavorable location, which perhaps was what happened in the Nectar trial, where there was actually a change in heart rate, which was in the opposite direction. And it was probably showing you the side effects or the negative effects of neuromodulation, where without the lack of mechanistic understanding and a way of tuning the system, you could easily uh, have adverse effects. Um, so now let's switch to the sympathetic uh, fibers and talk about what they do. Sympathetic fibers are very important because inotropy and contractility when they go up is when you're getting up and running, the fight or flight response as it was said. So when you stimulate uh, the sympathetic efferent fibers, typically uh, it's, this can be achieved by stimulating the stellate ganglia. Uh, it has profound effects on the cardiac action potential. Here's data, which is part of a doctoral dissertation of Dr. Ajijola in my group. And here I'm showing you a uh, SOC array like the one I showed you before. And this is the action potentials. And you can see that when you perform sympathetic stimulation, that is a dramatic control of the cardiac action potential. And when you look at this more carefully and distribute this regionally, you can see that there, is, there are regional differences in how the action potential is regulated in a normal heart by the nervous system. So there are differences. There are regions of the right ventricular outflow tract, for instance, which um, seem to have a bigger impact and a bigger response to the gas pedal with sympathetic stimulation. And some of this may actually have arrhythmic implications, too. 
And as it turns out, propagation is also very powerfully regulated by uh, the fiber orientation, and sympathetic stimulation adds to the dynamic component. So there are static structural components and dynamic component, which is controlled by the nerves, as shown in these electrical maps. Nerves are very powerful. You can take a completely normal heart, electrically stimulated, and what you'll see over here is you can actually precipitate a lethal arrhythmia, and this is VF. So nerves have enormous control over electrical propagation and what happens. Uh, can this be, can low-level stimulation, since SPARC is an initiative that talks about stimulation, can that be achieved in humans? Yes, here's a feasibility study that's just in press a few days ago where needles can be placed near the stellate ganglia and you can directly stimulate this in humans. Using electrical recordings, you can actually show that the APD shortens along with the appropriate hemodynamic response. So sympathetic stimulation at a low level can safely be achieved in humans, and this is done during an EP study in the lab uh, in our patients here at UCLA. So what about the, the most interesting, the last part, which is the heart's own nervous system? The heart's own neurons sit in these fat pads that uh, sit around the heart, and these are referred to as the intrinsic neurons of the heart, and they are a very important relay station, and it's actually the miniature brain on the heart. It has the entire components of afferents, efferents, and local circuit neurons. And as it turns out, using microelectrodes, we can actually record electrical activity from these neurons. As shown over here, this is a paper published in 2013, recently in JFIS. You can actually record neuronal activity and overlap that with cardiac activity. And you'll find that there are some neurons that are sensitive to periods of the cardiac cycle, such as systole. So every heartbeat is sensed by the nervous system. Here's an example where the heart is just being touched, and you can see that some neurons are being shut off by touch, whereas others are activated. So there is ongoing beat-to-beat -beat sensing of what happens in the heart. So the heart is a sensory organ, essentially. And uh, a word about neural injury, so response to cardiac injury. So the biggest problems that we have, uh, heart failure and sudden death, is due to cardiac injury, be it commonly due to an infarction, but it also could be due to myocarditis. This sets the stage for changes at the level of the heart itself. There's neural remodeling at the level of the organ, but this also sets the stage for activation of afferents that go to the higher centers, which increases the central sympathetic drive, and it's the confluence of these two effects that results in changes at the level of the organ. And of course, arrhythmias and heart failure have a massive societal impact. So. Uh, about 7 million sudden deaths a year in the world, and something like 5 million patients with heart failure and 60% die suddenly. Is this real in humans? The answer is yes. Uh, Homo sapiens are the ones who sign the checks, so it's very important to get data in humans. Here's data in humans. This was another doctoral dissertation from one of our assistant professors when she was doing her PhD in our lab. And this actually shows in a patient with a scar in the heart during an EP study, we were able to show that there is neural remodeling of scars in human hearts. So there is neur neural remodeling in humans with scars, and this is confirmation of animal studies. And as it turns out, it's a very nuanced process, and as disease progresses, the type of innovation patterns change, and at the very end stages of disease, you can actually even have functional anatomic denovation. More on this in this review that's in press and circulation research. But the story doesn't end there. Extra cardiac structures also undergo remodeling, as seen over here. So when you have a cardiomyopathic heart and you look at what happens to the stellate ganglia, they undergo remodeling. This is one of the fascinating discoveries that uh, came about from our patient experience. And when you do neurochemistry and look at what happened to these neurons, they actually physically become bigger. And when you do the appropriate stains, you can see that there's trans differentiation and also changes in neuronal firing patterns. So extra cardiac structures are undergoing remodeling. Why is this important? It has a lot of therapeutic importance because afferents, when they go from the heart, is what starts the whole process. And if we can get a handle of what happens over here, we may be able to monitor disease. You'll be hearing a lot more from Dr. Zucker about what happens to the other types of afferents that run along the sympathetic fibers 
to the brain um, and what it does to the heart. So during cardiac injury, this is a quick slide to show you, if you record cardiac neuronal activity, you can actually see that there are dramatic changes because of an infarction. So you can get a specific neural signature of cardiac injury, and this is real, and this is for the first time we can go to the source of the problem and record the neural activity that drives uh, this whole process of uh, our increased autonomic signaling. A word about therapeutic strategies, and as it turns out, as I promised to you, this is works. So we go back to the patient. The crisis is continuing. This patient is an extremist. And the way we got control of this situation, and this is a real patient, what we did was we instituted thoracic epidural anesthesia, and subsequently he underwent uh, uh, catheter ablation and surgical sympathectomy. Uh, it turns out he also had sarcoidosis, which is causing cardiac inflammation, and we were able to treat it. But this patient would have died, this 32-year-old would have died if we couldn't get control of this situation. The way this was done acutely was using thoracic epidural anesthesia, shown over here, controls the T1, T2 levels of the cord, shown over here, shocks over time. When you institute thoracic epidural, shocks subside. And subsequently, there are many strategies that have been used for cardiac neuraxial control, of which sympathectomy has been incredibly useful. Acutely thoracic epidural anesthesia, but as a definitive therapy, surgical removal of the stellate ganglia is useful. Why is it so? Because we now know based on transplant experience, transplanted human hearts very rarely fibrillate, even if you had ischemia, which is a canonical cause of VF. Surgical sympathectomy has been resurrected by our group, which was used originally only for long QT syndromes, and we now know based on a whole lot of experience and long-term follow-up that there is a dramatic benefit and almost 60% response rate in patients over a year of follow-up when they have bilateral cardiac sympathectomy. This is now uh, a fascinating area. We do not know how it works. We think that removal of a part of the stellate probably deafferents the heart, alters interoception, and studies have shown that patients feel better. They don't have the sensation of their heartbeats as they did prior to sympathectomy. And you can use objective tests using blood pressure, measurements with hand grip, and mental arithmetic to show that you've reduced the central sympathetic drive uh, to the organ itself. So uh, where are we taking this study? There is an ongoing submission to the NIH for a multi-center trial called a prevent VT trial looking at sympathectomy. And this is um, uh, it's going to go for an A1 submission. And I'll conclude with by saying that there are multiple levels of the neuraxis that are involved in cardiac regulation, and the heart also has an important regulatory network in place. Neural remodeling occurs in the heart and extracardiac structures following cardiac injury and modulates arrhythmias. Neuromodulation therapy show great therapeutic promise and need in-depth mechanistic understanding. Cardiac sympathectomy is showing efficacy in humans. It's effective and needs intense study to develop it. Our second major conclusion is a neurovisceral map of the heart is badly needed. There's one for the GI. We don't have one for the heart. Better electrode technology for recording and stimulation is absolutely needed. Integrative physiology studies in small and large animal models to guide therapies is needed because our animal models actually recap disease quite well, unlike what we hear in the other systems. And mechanistic studies in humans, of course, are crucial. So I'll stop here uh, and say that uh, electric cures are fun, and I'm so happy that Dr. Tracy in his recent Scientific American paper included a small picture of the heart over here. So, and uh, to quote a gentleman from my country, um, if you want real autonomic control, sit down and meditate. And I'll stop here, thank my colleagues, and stay on time. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Igor Efimov from George Washington Arrhythmias. This is a technology response. I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. I'm really excited to, to present our new data and also consider this as a welcome to the neighborhood. I just moved uh, to Washington, D.C., still settling at George Washington University. So I hope to be more often here. 
Um, so I, I wish I could keep one of your last slides because you, your major conclusions, um, which you just showed, the four, four major conclusions are exactly actually my plan for, for my presentation, just slightly out of order. But yeah, I did not see his presentation. <laughs> but it's exactly the four kinds of points which I would like to make in my presentation. And uh, again, I, I have seen little brain of gut. Now we have to say that probably heart also has one. And unfortunately, uh, I completely agree with previous speaker that we do not have a detailed map. So most of such beautiful publications like this one from Dr. Poza from Lithuania are really a piece of art, but technology used here goes back to probably uh, 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 Tony, uh, uh, so, so, so to 1700s when essentially it was hand drawn and really very little digital uh, analysis of, of architecture of innervation of the heart is, is done. And Tony Scarpa uh, did it in, in 1783 uh, and still probably this is the best presentation of architecture of neurons. So currently what we do know in a cardiac field how heart is innervated uh, it comes from studies like that when you essentially focus on a specific area of the heart. In this case, this is sinoatrial node in the rabbit heart. And we can stain uh, uh, cholinacetyl transferase or, or um, uh, tyrosine hydroxylase and essentially identify that innervation inside the sinus node of, for both uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic branches is approximately five to six times, five to six fold higher as compared to the rest of the atria. And uh, uh, several investigators embarked on this really difficult studies when just single heart was analyzed painstakingly uh, and m tens of sections were conducted with many, many stains. And regions were identified like what you see here, this in red uh, study from Dobrinsky and Mark Boyd showing what they call distributed pacemaker complex, which essentially uh, big region between superior and inferior vena cava extended well beyond what is considered to be sinus node. But this is a distributed pacemaker complex which is capable of generating electrical impulse, impulses even if denervated. Functional studies uh, in rabbit hearts under different conditions, including sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation, show, yes, indeed, this, all these black dots here show these are uh, regions from which we could observe the site of origin of heartbeat under different types of stimulation. So essentially, morphological and molecular mapping studies go along with functional studies. However, uh, we do need a map. We do need a map at micron scale, and uh, I'm glad to show this picture for the first time. My student, uh, uh, Catherine Holzen, just went to Stanford to Dyserov's lab. So we were able to adopt his technique for uh, clarity, for clearing different tissues to, to the heart, which was much more challenging because of high density of the tissue. And this is a, a first data set where approximately a centimeter uh, of tissue was cleared and, and um, imaged uh, by one of the members of Dyserov's group here by Dr. Tomer uh, using his light sheet microscopy. The only challenge is, going back to our discussion earlier on the big data uh, challenge, this data set, which has only two markers, DAPI and Connexin 43, is actually five terabyte. Uh, so I'm showing you, of course, very much downscaled. Uh, it's only 50 or so megabyte. I couldn't even show you 1.5 uh, gigabyte movie, which I just didn't fit on my iPad. But basically, it is a challenge how we're going to not only collect this data, how we're going to share it, and how we're going to analyze it. But method is already available, and I hope in a year or so we'll be able uh, to, to report uh, quantitative uh, maps of innervation in the heart. So how do we study uh, function of the heart in response to sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation. I, I picked only one example, which is sinus node, which is the best example of well-controlled function. Uh, heart rate is obviously well-controlled by sympathetic and parasympathetic system. So using voltage-sensitive dyes, we can very easily pinpoint the site of origin of, of a single heartbeat. We can build maps how they conduct. We can see morphology of action potentials are very different. And in different species, we can observe what happens to this site of origin of heartbeat. So this is an example of a mouse heart in which uh, blue balls here show site of origin in a denervated and not stimulated atria, while when you apply sympathetic stimulation, it always shifts upwards towards superior vena cava. So this was found in many multiple species, including in humans. So essentially, sim stimulating sympathetic nerves does not mean you just accelerate heart rate in the same region. You actually move to another region, which really necessitates uh, studies in the future, we need to map this region in terms of innervation. There are no studies which would document 
uh, the map of innervation. So if you uh, do the opposite, si stimulate parasympathetic system, again, I show the, the same map I showed before. Actually, pacemaker site, this is now rabbit heart, but it's the same in, in mouse. In majority of cases, shifts downwards, 36% towards IVC, uh, inferior vena cava, and even in 45% with extreme vagal stimulation, it goes to, uh, to the AV junction. So AV naught, the subsidiary pacemaker will take over. So uh, more recently, um, uh, investigators at George Washington University, led by Matthew Kay, uh, developed this mouse where essentially channel rhodopsin. One of the opsins was instrumented into the sympathetic neurons in the heart. And now you can induce sympathetic effects, uh, not only globally, but also locally by essentially illuminate, illuminating uh, the neurons and getting distinct cardiac effects, including sustained and non-sustained ventricular tachycardias. So now they're also working on uh, developing a mouse in, in which uh, they would drive the promoter to the parasympathetic nervous system, and we can basically study both types of uh, branches of uh, 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 autonomic nervous system. Another preparation, which is now gaining traction, but it's a very difficult preparation to study uh, neuro neurocardiac uh, function, is essentially the entire thorax of an animal can be perfused, where you preserve full innervation, as well as lungs and heart. But it's a very, very difficult preparation. Only two groups in the world currently use it. So now going back to, to the challenge of how do we translate, and I've heard many times already today from animal to human, and uh, basically I'd like to quote uh, Jeffrey Robbins, who wrote several years back, uh, essentially thinking about what happened after 20 years of work with a mouse a transgenic mouse approach, which he called wet bench. And he said that we cannot help but uh, be humbled by the relatively tiny impact of this data on human health in general and cardiovascular uh, disease specifically. Our wet bench advances have not, with rare exceptions, been translated to the bedside. So several years ago uh, at Washington University in St. Louis, where I'm coming from, we developed a program in which we procure human hearts, uh, which are becoming available after being explanted from the chest of the patient during transplant, or donor hearts, which were deemed uh, uh, essentially not acceptable for transplantation. And this center was uh, based on Mid-America Transplant Services Organization, this is an organ procurement organization in uh, St. Louis, which is really unique because it's always uh, one, one operating room where donor hearts are procured. So it's only one-stop shopping, essentially, for investigators. It's also interesting that coincided with this uh, conclusion that there is actually a national decline in donor heart utilization. So there are many, many hearts which are actually available for research if proper infrastructure is put in place. And this is probably what... Uh, NIH can actually do in many leading centers to pr provide the res resources to utilize these hearts. So what we do essentially, we collect uh, uh, hearts both from donors, approximately 45% of hearts, and, and stage failing hearts, about 55%. And as I said, uh, as of today, uh, there, there are 352 hearts collected and uh, um, also studied. So I'll give a couple examples how essentially what I just showed you in animal models, uh, the results do not really translate to humans. They are very different. So this is a, an example how we studied a sinus node in the human heart. So this is a heart uh, of a 32-year-old female who died in a car accident, and we procured this heart, uh, which was deemed not acceptable for transplantation because of anoxia, and we were able to perfuse and image this area where SA node is residing. And because heart is explanted, we could follow up with actually anatomical study. And what we found is, unlike mouse heart, uh, this is the sinus node in this region. You can see origin of heartbeat, but actual first breakthrough to the atria at this point. Let me just repeat it again. So this is origin of, in the sinus node, but this is the breakthrough. It's the same data, just differentiated. So basically, this shows evidence that sinus node does not excite tissue all over around it, but goes through a specialized channel, which we later confirmed histologically. Moreover, we showed that when you apply electrical pacing, you can inhibit this superior pathway, as we call it, and then heartbeat will originate from inferior pathway. So essentially, a sinus node of the human is very different from mouse or rabbit. In fact, it is, has a very distinct three-dimensional architecture. This is the sinus node reconstructed histologically, which has several specialized sinoatrial pathways which connect, uh, basically, impulse originating in the sinus node to the atria. Therefore, if you combine it with uh, still unknown architecture of sympathetic and, and parasympathetic innervation, it's a quite complex three-dimensional structure which we do not understand. We have no knowledge at this point. Another important uh, uh, difference also, actually going back to the 
picture shown by, by the previous speaker who said that the system is slightly more nuanced. I have to say it's even more nuanced from his picture because he, he missed beta-2 receptor. So essentially, beta-2 receptor, unlike beta-1, can also be coupled through GI, uh, not only through GS. And the balance between these two states depends on phosphorylation uh, of um, beta-2 receptor itself. So again, uh, we conducted a series of studies in a paper which just came out in circulation arrhythmia and electrophysiology where we looked transmurally in the human heart how sympathetic stimulation specifically to beta-1 and beta-2 uh, would uh, have effect on uh, cardiac function. So we looked at many different uh, markers. I'll show just one because I don't have enough time. And that is shortening of action potential duration. When you stimulate with beta-1 or beta-2 agonist, you will have very strong shortening of APD. Uh, and what is interesting in donor heart, it's present primarily in the subendocardium and less, less prominent in subepicardium. Uh, but uh, when you apply beta-1 stimulation to the failing heart, it's blue showing essentially no effect. Beta-1 is completely desensitized. But beta-2 effect is completely flipped on the other side. Now most of the effect is in subepicardium as compared to no effect in subendocardium. And this is quantified here. So beta-1 uh, has a gradient between endocardium and epicardium and is desensitized, shown in red, in, in the failing heart. So basically, we lose beta-1 function in the failing heart. But while beta-2 effect uh, in, the, in control donor hearts have the same gradient between endocardium and epicardium in blue, but in failing, it's completely flipped. So essentially, uh, innervation and, and beta-2 density is uh, reversed in the failing heart. We had one heart which was an outlier, and it turned out later this was the only heart which was a retransplant. So this was essentially a transplant, uh, and then this failed again after 20 years of use. So in this heart, the innervation was completely different from um, hearts which were essentially a donor or failing. So basically, uh, what we find that beta-2 stimulation uh, and sympathetic stimulation, of course, leads to calcium-mediating arrhythmogenesis, specifically in, in failing hearts. And of course, then uh, uh, removal of, of sympathetic system would have strong antiarrhythmic effects. So now I'm coming to my last point, a new instrumentation. So several years ago, we uh, asked ourselves a question, how do we study multi-parametric multi neural and cardiac function uh, including not only electrical events, but also metabolic events, and perhaps also we can instrument the heart with various um, fluorescent probes. And in collaboration with John Rogers from uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, we developed this paradigm where you can essentially uh, take an, an, an anatomical structure of interest extracted from a CT or MRI image, build a mold on which you can uh, make a membrane-like device shaped exactly as this particular organ. And then uh, John Rogers developed a, a transfer printing technology which allows you to print on this membrane device of your choosing with uh, various types of sensors. So what you see here are electrical sensors, mechanical sensors, uh, light sensors and actuators, uh, pH, temperature, and many others. So essentially you can envision a device in which you will be stimulating uh, electrically or mechanically all by light neurons and uh, cardiac uh, tissue. And also you can interrogate the tissue at very high density at precise locations with uh, whatever uh, resolution you require. So more importantly, the um, array of sensors and actuators is such that you can essentially target uh, an energy or met metabolic function because there are several sensors to do that, including pH, for example, or we can do uh, light spectroscopy for NADH, for intrinsic fluorophore. We can do electrical interrogation and actuation stimulation and mechanical interrogation and stimulation. And this, all, all these devices will be uh, 3D printed for a particular organ size and anatomy. They could be fl flexible and stretchable without impeding cardiac function, for example, and they will have high-definition diagnostics and high-definition therapy. We also can do uh, the, uh, energy harvesting for these devices, and then uh, ultimately they can be instrumented as biodegradable devices, which essentially, if, if therapy is required only for a transient period of time, they will uh, dissolve uh, upon a certain period of time. So, and I would like to conclude with acknowledging uh, all my students and as well as NIH. All this work was fun funded by NIH and my colleagues who are listed here, including uh, Carl Dysirov's lab and John Rogers's lab and my colleagues from the uh, Washington University School of Medicine. Thank you. I hope everybody is keeping notes of the questions they are going to ask at the end of two more talks. Uh, so the next talk is going to be Dr. Irving Zucker, and now we are going into heart failure.
I hope we're not going into heart right. failure yet. <laughs> so I want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to talk. This has been a really stimulating, no pun intended, uh, uh, a workshop. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about some, um, some work that we have done uh, on uh, some, perhaps a new way of looking at mod neuromodulation. Uh, let's see. Uh, just a little bit of disclosure. So um, for those of you not familiar with the syndrome of heart failure, it's often been referred to as a, uh, a, a vicious cycle, a positive feedback system, a downward spiral in which the compensatory mechanisms, which are largely neurohumoral, actually over a prolonged period of time cause further deterioration of myocardial function by a variety of mechanisms, including changes in peripheral resistance, changes in uh, cell function within the myocardium, and this feeds back to cause a, a worsening of the heart failure condition. Uh, so the initial compens compensatory mechanisms can actually be uh, deleterious if prolonged. Uh, one of the goals in understanding how neurohumoral activation can be intervened is to understand the pathways largely in the spinal cord and the central nervous system. And this is an area that we've worked in for many years, uh, looking at modulation of sympathetic outflow by uh, structures in the brainstem and hypothalamus. And now we're moving a little bit more into the spinal regulation. And there's very clear evidence that activation of the sympathetic nervous system in heart failure uh, promotes uh, uh, decreases in cardiac function. And you can see this very old study done by Joe J. Cohn many years ago showing that patients with high levels of plasma norepinephrine had a very poor five-year prognosis compared to patients with lower levels of norepinephrine. And I think there's very good evidence right now that sympathetic nerve activity, peripheral sympathetic nerve activity generated by increases in central activity are increased as ventricular function worsens. This is human data using microneurography techniques. So we know uh, from a lot of animal experiments and many human experiments that arterial baroreflex sensitivity, the uh, uh, vagal afferent sensitivity from the heart is impaired in heart failure, while there are several sympathoexcitatory reflexes, such as the arterial chemoreflex shown here, um, uh, as well as the uh, cardiac sympathetic afferent reflex, which I'll talk about more in a moment, are actually augmented in the setting of heart failure and may be a, a peripheral driver for central sympathetic outflow to various target tissues. So let me say a few words about some of these uh, 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 ways of modulating uh, uh, reflex activity. Uh, Hani Sabah will talk a little bit more about this, I'm sure. You've already heard about the barrel reflex and about carotid sinus stimulation. Actually, a long time ago, uh, Dwayne Eckberg and Gene Brownwald showed very clearly that in patients with cardiomyopathy, arterial baroreflex control of heart rate was significantly impaired in the setting of chronic heart failure. You've already heard about vagal nerve stimulation as another technique to modulate uh, uh, um, a function, and, and you can see that, uh, that older studies now by uh, Peter Schwartz's group uh, have shown that there may be a beneficial effect uh, in patients with very severe heart failure, vagal stimulation may increase ejection fraction over a period of time. Chemo reflex sensitivity is clearly augmented uh, in, in heart failure. Andrew Coates and his group have shown that patients with heart failure have increases in chemo reflex sensitivity. And if you take these patients and subdivide them into those with high levels of chemo reflex sensitivity versus those with low levels of chemo reflex sensitivity, you find those with high levels of chemo reflex sensitivity reflex sensitivity have uh, increased non-sustainable ventricular tachycardia and lower ejection fractions. Harold Schultz in our group uh, has recently shown that carotid, selective carotid body denervation, which can be done very precisely in animals while leaving baroreflex uh, sensitivity intact, results in, um, in increases in, uh, in or reductions in um, in, in, in sympathetic nerve activity and augmentations in, uh, in normal breathing. And you can see Shane Stokes breathing is very common, but after carotid body denervation, much more normal breathing patterns 
uh, have, been, uh, have been demonstrated. So this is another potential technique to uh, modulate uh, abnormal sympathoexcitation, both in the setting of heart failure and perhaps in other sympathoexcitatory diseases such as hypertension. So we know a lot about cardiac pain. We know that uh, pain in response to cardiac ischemia uh, manifests itself as a substernal crushing pain with some referred pain to the jaw and shoulder and arm area. Uh, the afferents that sense pain also do many other things. So these so-called cardiac sympathetic afferents, and you've, heard, you've seen some of this uh, earlier today, uh, traverse uh, pathways which actually enter the, the dorsal root ganglion and enter the spinal cord at every level of the spinal cord. In this case, we're talking about levels from about T10 to T4 or 5 for most of the cardiac and thoracic afferents. The interesting thing about these cardiac afferents is they do several things. They go up the spinal cord, the dorsal columns, in the spinal thalamic tracts and the spinal reticular tracts, and they give off projections to the medulla, to the pons, to areas of the hypothalamus, as well as going through the thalamus and ultimately up to the cortex. So at the same time that they can transmit sensations of cardiac pain, they can also modulate sympathetic nerve activity through, uh, through uh, reflexes uh, within the, the lower brain stem. The afferents that, uh, or the stimuli that are responsible for activating these so-called sympathetic afferents, and this is just a short list, uh, are, are, are mostly agents that are released during prolonged ischemia. Even short periods of ischemia have been associated with, uh, with cellular acidosis, oxygen-free radicals, certainly potassium and lactate are released, prostaglandin metabolites, et cetera. Two of the agents that uh, we have focused on are bradykinin and substance P as afferent neurotransmitters, which are also released in large quantities um, during, um, during ischemia. Capsaicin, of course, is an exogenous substance can, that can actually activate these, these receptors by activation of the TRPV1 receptor. Some years ago, we found that in a pace and a dog pacing model of chronic heart failure that if one looked at the uh, uh, sympathetic nerve response and blood pressure response to the epicardial application of bradykinin in animals that were vagotomized, so the only input from the heart was through these sympathetic afferent pathways, we found that there were augmented responses in animals with heart failure, as you can see here. Similarly, um, if one records afferent discharge from these so-called sympathetic afferents and looks at the response to epicardial application or left atrial injection of uh, capsaicin, the sympathetic afferent response is greatly augmented in animals, in this case, pacing-induced heart failure. And if we apply lidocaine onto the surface of the heart, onto the, onto the um, epicardial surface, we find large falls in peripheral sympathetic nerve activity, in this case, renal sympathetic nerve activity, in heart failure animals, but not so much in animals that are sham operated or normal animals. So these data suggest that there is a tonic input from the so-called cardiac sympathetic afferents uh, in the setting of chronic heart failure. So this gets me to a discussion of what the transmission is doing and what it's like. And we know that many of these afferents are well endowed with a TRPV1 receptor protein. And this is a very unique kind of channel. It's a nonspecific cation channel that is activated by a variety of stimuli, including heat uh, and many other exogenous substances, uh, capsaicin, and another substance called resinivera toxin that I'll talk about at some length uh, following it. So what happens is this pore between the S5 and S6 uh, transmembrane uh, spanning domain opens, and there's an inrush of calcium. Much like glutamate toxicity, uh, cells ultimately get calcium overloaded and, and die. The expression of the TRPV1 uh, protein uh, goes away, as I'll show you in a moment. 
So this is resin of veritoxin. It comes from a, a plant that grows in a few places around the world. And for those of you that are not familiar with the Scoville scale, this is a scale of hotness, and it's 16 billion on the Scoville scale, which is about 1,000 times more potent than capsaicin. So we took advantage of this molecule to see if we could intervene and ablate these so-called cardiac sympathetic afferents. And we did a very simple uh, study in which we had animals that were sham operated or subjected to a myocardial infarction and followed up 12 weeks later. We painted RTX on the surface of the heart uh, in order to ablate these afferents. It turns out these sympathetic afferents are very near the surface of the heart in the epicardial layer and not so much in the deeper layers. And the other advantage is that myocytes themselves do not express TRIP-V1 channels. So the RTX can be rather selective for the epicardial sympathetic afferents. And what you can see here is that, um, that uh, if we stain for a pan-neuronal marker, PGP 9.5, which stains both afferent and efferent uh, terminals, you, and TRIP-V1 in, in a sham animal, they tend to co-localize. So 12 weeks after adding resveratoxin to the surface of the heart, we can completely ablate the TRIP-V1. And you can see there's nothing here, while other, other markers of uh, of neuronal function are still intact. So the efferent fibers are probably still largely there. So then we looked at these animals and we looked at sympathetic nerve activity, um, both to the kidney and to the heart. We looked at the ability of capsaicin and bradykinin to, uh, to be reduced after, uh, the response to be reduced after RTX. Uh, and you can see that up to, and this is, is at 12 weeks, but I'll show you data that this lasts much longer than that, uh, there's a reduction in the response to capsaicin or bradykinin. But remarkably, we found that, um, that renal sympathetic nerve activity and cardiac sympathetic nerve activity was markedly normalized in, uh, in animals treated with, in heart failure animals treated with RTX, while animal, sham animals, there was very little uh, to be seen. Now, in addition, if you look at global sympathoexcitation and just measure urinary norepinephrine as a marker, you can see that animals treated with RTX uh, show a uh, normalization of plasma norepinephrine or urinary norepinephrine, which is reflected in the plasma as well. So there seems to be an important uh, effect, the tonic effect of sympathetic afferents on sympathoexcitation in the setting of chronic heart failure. But one thing we noticed when we looked at hemodynamics in these animals is that in, in animals treated with RTX, left ventricular end diastolic pressure was markedly lower compared to vehicle-treated animals. And this, this rose a kind of a question because ejection fractions were about the same. And we said, well, how could this happen? And one of the ways it could happen is if the compliance of the heart changes. And the compliance of the heart can change if we change the extracellular matrix, so that if remodeling takes place. And when we looked at these hearts, we found that certainly MI hearts were larger. There was a clear and distinct myocardial infarction, which is about 40% of the left ventricle. But in animals treated with RTX, these hearts were markedly smaller even though infarct size was about the same. So when we went further with these, we found that while indices of inotropic, of resting inotropic state, like positive DPT, were no different after RTX, relaxation was augmented. Negative DT was better. And furthermore, cardiac reserve seemed to be increased. So if we challenge these hearts with isoproterenol, you can see that there's augmented uh, input or augmented responses to isoproterenol. If we then do pressure volume loop analysis and look at end systolic pressure volume relationships, we didn't see much difference. But the end diastolic pressure volume relationships, as you see here, were markedly reduced. So the heart is more compliant, which is consistent with a decrease in extracellular matrix remodeling. And so we took a look at things like collagen, uh, at um, alpha smooth muscle actin, fibronectin, and the TGF-beta receptor. 
And sure enough, what we found in areas remote from the scar, remote from the scar, in the septum and in the left ventricle, that RTX-treated animals had lower levels of these markers of, of fibrosis. In addition, the beta adrenergic receptor, the beta-1 adrenergic receptor, was upregulated in these animals. Uh, indices of apoptosis. So we've looked at two indices now, tunnel staining and cleave caspase 3, and you can see that um, there's a reduction in tunnel staining in both the, uh, in, in both the, in the infarct area and in the peri-infarct area, as well as in the remote and in the intraventricular septum. So um, uh, activation of afferents in the, uh, in the heart, these sympathetic afferents, do several things. On the one hand, they release neuropeptides, such as substance P and CGRP, to activate NK1 receptors uh, on, uh, on, on afferents, and that's probably the pathway that mediates a lot of the afferent input and the sympathoexcitatory process. The other thing that, that the release of these peptides do is they dilate adjacent blood vessels and change permeability. And this can initiate an inflammatory process, which may be part of the remodeling. So one idea that we, we are investigating now, and I'll show you a little bit of data for, is that there is an effect on capillary permeability, plasma extravasation, and infl inflammatory markers following, uh, following an infarct, which can be abrogated by the uh, treatment with RTX. So just as proof of principle, and these are still in the early stages, uh, if we apply um, bradykinin or capsaicin onto the surface of the heart with a small piece of filter paper, you can see that Evans blue extravasation takes place in that, just in that area where the, where the drug uh, uh, is applied. In animals treated with RTX, that, that plasma extravasation is completely blunted. And similarly, in animals that are infarcted after either one day or one week post-infarction, there's an increase in plasma extravasation, which can be prevented by RTX treatment. Similarly, Spantide 2, the NK1 antagonist, can prevent that from occurring. Um, in addition, some other inflammatory markers, such as IL-1, uh, IL-1, uh, and um, and uh, uh, TNF-alpha can be reduced by uh, RTX treatment. Again, this is oftentimes in the remote, the remote myocardium. Okay, just finishing up real quick. Uh, this is uh, collagen. Uh, the collagen uh, weave is abnormal, and you can see that there's a, a reversal of that. And MMP expression can be normalized following... Uh, following RTX treatment. The last thing I want to show you is survival. If we follow these animals out for 26 weeks, you can see very nicely here that, um, that there is a, a very, very substantial increase in survival compared to vehicle-treated animals. And I think I'll skip this just to say that epicardial or epidural I'm, I'm sorry, epidural application can reduce sympathetic nerve activity uh, almost as well as epicardial, actually better than epicardial application, and survival uh, is the same. So I will just stop here. I think there's a lot of things we need to, 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 we, to, to this is another way of neuromodulation. I think we need to look at things like proof of principle strategies using, uh, or using optogenetics. We need to be look at specificities, large animal models, mechanisms of TRIP-V1 expression, arrhythmogenesis, inflammation, and design clinical studies, of which some for the, for the abrogation of chronic pain are already in progress. And I'll stop here. Thank you. So you've heard a lot about heart failure. It's my favorite cartoon here, but uh, autonomic imbalance is the message here that there's increased and sustained, increased and sustained activity of the sympathetic uh, discharge and reduced or withdrawal of parasympathetic drive. So 
these are some of the things that happen as a result of that imbalance. Maybe not cause and effect, but certainly by association. Increase in heart rate, bad for you. Increase in proarrhythmias, bad for you if you have heart failure. Dysregulation of nitric oxide influences every cell function, bad for you. Excess pro-inflammatory cytokines, bad for you. And the question is, if you are able to restore this autonomic imbalance, can you normalize these functions that are essentially bad for you. And the three ways that have been approached to look at that are vagus nerve stimulation, baroreflex stimulation, which you heard essentially from Kip on, and spinal cord stimulation. So three ways of neuromodulation in heart failure. This is vagus nerve stimulation. Essentially, the electrode is placed on the right vagus nerve. There's an IPG that sends a signal, and the person that asked the question is, do we know the magnitude of the current to deliver? Do we know the frequency to deliver it at? Do we know any of these parameters? And the answer is only empirically, that no studies have been done to really identify an algorithm that is the appropriate one. Nonetheless, we have some results that we can share with you. This is the barrel reflex. So instead of the electrode being placed on the vagus nerve, it's placed on the uh, carotid sinus. And you heard from Kip on that one earlier. And finally, the spinal cord, where an, a multiple electrode uh, lead is placed into the epidural space. And in this particular case, this is an approved technology for pain and in Europe for also for pain and for angina. Uh, pectoris, but here, using the same parameters, they applied it to heart failure, looking for an effect. I'll show you why they did that. So if you look at the literature and ask yourself, well, what is it that drives the process uh, in uh, heart failure as far as vagus nerve stimulation, but could be true for baroreflex stimulation as well, spinal cord presumably the same, there are four silos here. So you get vagus nerve stimulation leading to essentially a reduction in heart rate and therefore MVO2 positive for heart failure. Second silo through activation of alpha-7 acetylcholine receptors and limitation of pro-inflammatory cytokines, positive. Third silo, normalization of nitric oxide signaling, very positive. And finally, a pathway that works through M3 receptors and connects M43, which you heard about very briefly, can lead to an antiarrhythmic effect, which would impact the sudden cardiac death component of heart failure. So here are data. Now, what I'm going to show you the next few slides are data from the same animal model. Uh, this is microembolization-induced heart failure, a model that we developed some 30 years ago. We've been using it for the last 25 years. Every one of these devices was done in the same model over the same period of time, starting with the same ejection fraction. So you can compare them to each other. So this is the vagus nerve stimulation. I want to point out the ejection fraction. You can see it compared to a control group, ejection fraction improved. No background therapy. No background therapy, no comorbidities. Only the heart is bad. And if you look at uh, a biomarker here, this is NT pro BNP, NT pro PNP begins to go down. If you look at the same model or the same treatment with respect to TNF alpha and IL 6 in the tissue, normal heart failure tissue, heart failure plus vagus nerve stimulation, abnormality corrected. Abnormality corrected. If you look at the plasma in terms of biomarkers for IL 6, interleukin 6, and TNF alpha, you get the same thing. So we do negate the pro inflammatory cytokine, at least in the model. If you look at nitric oxide, these are the synthases, the enzyme that regulates the release of NO. Normal heart failure, heart failure, bus vagus nerve stimulation for endothelin NOS. Down in heart failure, something you don't want to have restoration with vagus nerve stimulation, the opposite true for inducible nitric oxide synthase, and the opposite is true for uh, neuronal nitric oxide synthase. So in essence, we normalize the maladaptations in the nitric oxide signaling pathway, at least for, uh, with respect to the enzymes with vagus nerve stimulation. And I can tell you that we can do that with better reflex stimulation as well. This is baroreflex stimulation, same period of time, same animal, treatment for three months, 
versus control, no background therapy. Again, I'll punch you through the ejection fraction. In the untreated group, it goes down. We have a certain, certainly significant restoration of ejection fraction with battle reflex stimulation. In this particular study, we also looked at the potentially the value of antiarrhythmic effects of, of battle reflex stimulation. I can tell you the same thing happens with vagus nerve stimulation. This is an EP protocol. Basically, we are given extra stimuli, and we're looking to see whether we can produce a ventricular monomorphic VT or a VF as to end the study. This is a typical animal. In this particular case, the animal was not given any therapy, was in the control group, implanted but not, treat, not turned on. And you can see that the stimulation here leads to a monomorphic VT and collapse. Uh, then, of course, DC shock and the animal comes back. And here's the animal treated with baroreflex stimulation, bad stimulation. Again, you see the extra stimulation, VF, collapse, and they're restored with DC shock. But if you look at this bottom panel, this is what's important. We started out at pre-therapy, all the animals at the, with the protocol we used went into VT or VF. As we went to three months following therapy, half of them only had a VT or VF. And if you go to six months, only 30% continue to have that arrhythmia with very, very high stimulation uh, protocols. If you stop the therapy, six weeks later, it goes away. Spinal cord stimulation. So here, basically, a catheter is put into epidural space between uh, T2 and T4. And the protocol is delivering a signal that essentially is the same as you use for pain. There was no differentiation that we're not treating pain here, we're treating heart failure. This is data from Dr. Doug Zipes' lab. He's the first one to have done this in an animal model of heart failure. The model here is a model of rapid ventricular pacing, essentially. And what he showed, basically, at 10 weeks after therapy, a similar result with the ejection fraction that we have seen with the microembolization model. So we went back and we did this with the microembolization model, the same technique, except a different device, but same electrode in the same epidural space, two different doses, a group one and group two are two doses of the spinal cord stimulation and a control arm. We see nothing with respect to changes in volume of the ventricle, and more importantly, with group one, we actually see no improvement in ejection fraction, very little improvement with the group two. So with our model, we could not get anything to work there. If you look at all these three uh, technologies together, vagus nerve stimulation got the most effect in the microembolization model, followed by baroreflex therapy, and then very, very little with spinal cord. So where are we with respect to patients? By the way, all these three are in uh, clinical trials. This is vagus nerve stimulation, 32 patients, followed for up to almost two years now. Exercise capacity improves. This is no control here. This is an uncontrolled trial, safety feasibility. Uh, the quality of life, Minnesota living with heart failure gets better. And ejection fraction increased. So you could argue at least a translation from the animal model to the human absent a control arm. Very promising. So now there is a big trial going on called Innovate Heart Failure. This is in about 700 patients with heart failure randomized two to one to the device. So we'll see what that does. The endpoint mortality and hospitalization. So we should know if this technology does anything to extending life in a patient with heart failure on top of background therapy. Nectar heart failure, you heard about more than once. This is a trial that was negative. But look at this down here. This may be a telltale of why this study was negative. The current delivered was very low. Very low compared to what, what Innovate is delivering and what other trials have delivered. It's possible that we were not activating the proper fibers in the nerve. This is the Anthem heart failure. Anthem heart failure was a positive trial in patients with heart failure. They compared the right vagus 
versus left vagus. But there was no control arm. So we don't know if there was a control arm, would this trial have been positive? In this trial, notice here, they got up to two milliamps. Two milliamps is almost at the threshold where we think is necessary current delivered in order to activate B fibers. The feet was the spinal cord, did not show anything. Now, is it, did it fail because actually you cannot do it using the spinal cord stimulator? Or did it fail because we were guessing at what parameters to deliver for heart failure? I mean, we delivered parameters for pain. It worked for pain. Does it work for heart failure given those parameters? We need more understanding of what's going on when you put a catheter in the epidural space. <laughs> this is why I said the current is very important. This is a study showing here current amplitude, energy delivered, versus activation of uh, various fibers. And you can see here that at the low current, A fibers are activated. That's what cyberonics uses for epilepsy and depression. In order to get to the three milliamps where you need to activate B fibers, you have to be in a range above two. In the Innovate Heart Failure, we're delivering, or they are delivering, I should say, about four milliamps on average. That's not what happened in Nectar. This is just a different design. This is the biocontrol. This is the device using in, used in Innovate. And the one thing I want to point out here is it's designed in such a way as to minimize current leak. And current leak is the problem that we have when we go to patients, or at least one of the major problems. This is the uh, Cyberonics uh, lead, very similar to the Boston Scientific lead in the Nectar Heart Failure, an open loop uh, uh, device that can send signals in both directions, afferent and efferent. So here are some of the issues that I find difficult to justify at this point without further experimentation. I, I believe in the technology, but I may be proven wrong if we deliver the wrong signal to the wrong patient. What is the ideal current? Don't know. What is the ideal frequency? We don't know. What is the ideal duty cycle? Right now we deliver 30% of the time, 10 seconds on, 30 or 20 seconds off, for example, in Innovate. Is that, is that appropriate? Why not different? What is the ideal location? Site of lead implantation. Is it the cervical vagus, for example, the right place to uh, stimulate? Timing of delivery, should it be timed the cardiac cycle? Innovate, or at least a CardioFit device, delivers during the absolute refractory period. Nectar does not. What are the causes of pain? Current leaks. We, one of the things we were totally surprised by is when we went from the animal to the patient, the first thing the patient did was say, ouch, when we got up to a current that we believed was necessary to, to get that technology to work. And what we ended up doing is gradually building up over a period of six weeks from a one milliamp current all the way up to a three to four milliamp current in a patient. After the six weeks of upgrading or at least of increasing the current, we were able to get the patient to be sustained at three to four milliamps. Otherwise, we could not do it. Uh, percutaneous versus surgical approaches. Everything right now is surgical, but there's work to percutaneous. Battery issues, uh, remote activation, uh, doses, that's one size of it all. I mean, we, we, in this case, you're delivering, we deliver the same dose, same frequency, same cardiac timing to every single patient with heart failure, regardless of whether they have class two heart failure or borderline class four. Which patient should be treated? Who are the responders? Who are not the responders? Uh, what is the degree of organ injury? Are we causing any organ injury? Uh, when to implant during the course of the disease, early or late? I can tell you that if you implant devices late, if the patient is already on 3B4, New York Heart Association class, you get nothing. The heart is basically shot. So if the patient needs a heart or needs a ventricular assist device, they're not gonna do very well with these devices or for that matter with drugs, at least in our experience. So now we limit those patients 
to the ones that have a reasonable size ventricle, not the ones that you open the chest and the heart pops out of the chest. Uh, identifying responders versus non-responders is a big issue. Biomarkers. We, we have biomarkers that tell us that we are doing something, but it's down the line. Three months, six months, one year down the line. What we don't have is when we first implant the patient, are we engaging the target? What biomarker tells me that I'm engaging the target in that given patient? What is the response? What should be the response? In Innovate, we try to look for, we keep increasing during the, during the surgery, increasing the current until heart rate goes down. Three, four, five, six beats per minute. And they say, well, okay, so at least we have engaged the target in that patient. In other devices, we don't have that, uh, that privilege to do that. Uh, at least was not done in Nectar. Uh, to my knowledge, was not done in Nectar. Uh, are there patients that are contraindicated for this? And I just mentioned the whole idea of those that have so far advanced a disease that you cannot do anything with them, no matter what. And if you recruit them into the trials, that's where you get into trouble. Uh, so this is uh, uh, getting to the point of, is, is there a point where it's too late to be intervening, to be able to either prevent further progression or reverse the disease. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. I'm going to ask all the speakers of the session to come up. And before that, Dr. Peng has an announcement. I just wanted to let the folks who are on videocast know that we are receiving your live feedback through your forms. Uh, several of the feedback is general, our general comments, and those will be archived and um, uh, analyzed by the Spark Working Group. Those particular comments that are directed towards specific speakers, those are forwarded to the speakers. If you have specific questions or comments now for this particular session, please send them in. Thanks. Open for questions. Uh, our Delphi UCLA, as you correctly pointed out, you're doing it in a late stage reactive mode. Um, how could we impact the potential for efficacy if we could move it further up the treatment ladder? And more importantly, how do we deal with the complications possibly dealt with by normal pharmacological therapies, which actually can impact on the neuromodulation potential? So the <clears throat> The background therapy is one of the biggest problems we have to deal with, also even in translating some of these findings from animal into the human. Uh, if the patient is not on any therapy, if you're doing it in various countries of the world where the patient is not fully ideally treated on all drugs, uh, you end up with a big signal. If you do it in Western Europe or in the United States where the patient is maximally treated, the signal may be somewhat less robust as you see elsewhere. So the ideal situation here, and this is I think by default, is that you cannot put a device surgically in a patient unless the patient is optimally medicated with drugs. That, that is a, the, the FDA lays the law for you right there. It has, it has to be on all the drugs and has to be on maximal tolerable effect of those drugs. So you are forced to go into patients that basically remain symptomatic despite the fact that they are on optimal medical therapy. And therein lies the rub. Therein lies the rub. But you're stuck with it. Now, what, I'm, what we're trying to avoid is going even beyond that to the patient that really has nothing to give you back. Uh, the patient has advanced so far into their disease that no matter what you do, you cannot restore any function to that, to that myocardium. They need a new heart or a device or a, or a vet. Did I answer all your questions? So my name is Arun Sridhar from GSK Bioelectronics R&D. So I have a question for both Shiv and also for uh, Irv as well. Uh, Shiv, you've been, I mean, both the cardiac rhythm, the rhythm management has a long history of both slash and burn and kind of optimization of defibrillation approaches. So why do we need to think about neuromodulation here and not slash and burn? Why can't we just ablate these nerves? And Irv presented some data on the preclinical models, but why wouldn't it work in a, in a patient population? 
Uh, I'll give you the short answer. And first is, we do ablate and burn a lot on the heart. We get patients referred from all over the world. And I spend two days a week operating on them, ablating ventricular tachycardia circuits. And it clearly has a place. You have to control monomorphic VT circuits. That's established wisdom for over 100 years of reentrant circuits. We went into neuromodulation because there was a time when you simply couldn't control the arrhythmia at the heart itself. So you had to go to a higher level, which is where neuromodulation came in. And the only way in which we can practically apply neuromodulation right now is by performing sympathectomy because it's the standard of care for patients who have uh, CPBT, for instance, you know, um, polymorphic, this is catecholaminergic polymorphic VT. So it's a, it's a channelopathy. It's one of those conditions where sympathectomy is incredibly effective. And it's a procedure that was done over 100 years ago for other causes, for angina and so forth. And we just simply resurrected that procedure. As it turns out, it works. And in trying to understand how it works, I think we can come up with a more uh, nifty way of doing this, perhaps by using pharmacologic approaches, such as what Dr. Zucker said, or even specific delivery of things like, you know, for one idea was using botulinum toxins or use pharmacological therapies that can be delivered at the level of a ganglia itself. But we need to know how the ganglia work. So bioelectronics is going to have an interface, whether you use uh, biologicals or drug therapies. This is here to stay. And I think that's how the future therapies are going to evolve. I'm not sure exactly what the question was for me, but with, with neural ablations, specifically sympathetic afferent neural ablations, we can probably impact arrhythmogenesis as well. Uh, there's a, a large body of data saying that, showing that many uh, um, some pathoexcitatory disorders may be driven by changes in afferent input. Um, we haven't done that yet, but it's certainly on the drawing board. The reason why I ask that is because when it comes to potentially translation and also from investment perspective, I think what it makes sense is to understand if a denovation approach or ablative approach probably is easier, then why would one need to go for a neuromodulatory approach? And I think that, that was where the thinking is. I appreciate that the, we need to understand the mechanisms of that, but, uh, but point well made, though. So we, we think that the, the neural ablation, at least the pharmacological intervention for neural ablation, is certainly doable in humans. And I think there are many, many cardiologists, including Shiv, would tell you that it's probably very feasible to target uh, discrete areas either by intrapericardial uh, application or through application to a d specific dorsal root ganglia. Let me, let me just make one comment. Uh, it's one thing to reduce sympathetic drive. It's another thing to eliminate sympathetic drive. So in, in, in the experience with heart failure, we know that if we overdo it and reduce sympathetic drive to abnormal levels, we get into trouble, actually, as opposed to if we only bring it down to normal values. So one has to look at sympathectomies in that light as well. Muxcon trial, right? In, in fact, for sympathectomy, when you do remove the stellates, most of the cardiac sympathetic efferents actually come from the middle cervical ganglion. So to really highlight Dr. Sava's point, we actually are not taking away too much of the neural control of the heart. It is just that we are probably cutting off some of the afferents, we think. So that point is extremely well taken. You, we are not denovating the heart mm -hmm. in that sense. In fact, the heart perhaps can never be denovated because it also has its own intrinsic nervous system, so. Yeah, that, that was my uh, question. We've used the term sympathectomy when you destroy the stellate ganglion, but we know that there are many afferent nerves which go through the stellate ganglion, and they go up and then they run along the, the sympathetic chain and go up at many different levels of the spinal cord. So I think probably it's wrong to use the term sympathectomy. We heard about cardiac sympathetic afferents producing pain and evoking sympathetic reflexes. So I think a lot of the effect might be due to deafferentation. The other issue, though, is when you put RTX on the heart, do those afferent nerves grow back into the heart, whereas if you destroy them more centrally, 
they don't make it back into the heart? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And uh, we have shown, at least functionally, that you can, in, in the rat model, you can reduce the response for about 26 weeks. That's a long time in the life of a rat. Yeah. Uh, uh, but they do tend, the reflexes do tend to come back. Now, people have thought about you know, multiple applications over a period of time. And in fact, for pain management, that may be another strategy. But um, we, we don't know how to target them specifically centrally yet. I think it's a lot easier to target them uh, at the periphery. Mm -hmm. One other question. We, we're talking about plasticity. And it seems like there is dramatic plasticity in the beta adrenergic receptors, beta 1 down, beta 2 maybe up. But there's been interest recently in the beta-3 receptors in the heart and their potential, I think, protective effects. So is there do anything we know about beta-3 receptor mm -hmm. plasticity when you damage the nerves to the heart? Um, first of all, I'll, I'll go back to beta-2 story. It's not just it's up, but it's also switching from, from GI to GS. So essentially, under normal circumstances, Beta-2 receptor, uh, in addition to having some GS effect, some stimulatory effect, it also has a very significant inhibitory effect. And perhaps this is why maybe vagal uh, stimulation works, because it takes over lost function of beta-2. But in addition, you're right, beta-3 is now uh, emerging field. There are a number of studies in animals showing that beta-3 seems to be protective under ischemic conditions, for example. And we are now conducting study in human preparations as well. And preliminary data does show that it does have protective effect during ischemic reperfusion, for example, when you stimulate beta-3 receptors. Mm -hmm. Children's Hospital Philadelphia. I, I mean, we've heard uh, incredibly nice talks today about vagal stimulation for uh, depression, epilepsy, gastroparesis, heart failure, <coughs> and really elegant descriptions of different different types of vagal afferents. And I guess I, I would be interested from not just the people that are at the podium, but also the other presenters. And how, how much do we need to understand? Um, the effects of activating different subsets of vagal afferents to uh, elicit these different types of beneficial responses. I'm just thinking I should get a vagal stimulator implanted. It's good for everything, as far as I can tell. Um, but <laughs> about this problem, I guess. Uh, actually, a uh, word of caution that uh, one of the most popular models for atrial fibrillation is stimulation of, of, of vagus nerve. <laughs> <laughs> but, but now that I, I made him say that so I, can so I can say something about this. Actually, that was one of our biggest concerns. But in over, at least in heart failure, in over a thousand or so patients that have been studied so far, we have not seen a single case of induced atrial fib as a result of the therapy. So it's, it's something that you see in a normal animal, that if you take a normal animal and you stimulate the vagus, you will get often a, a, an atrial fib, but we have not seen that in a patient. Again, it highlights the importance of you know, getting real human data. But one point I think we have to expand upon is at least for the heart, we can say clearly that knowing more about where the actual, how the freeway called Vegas works is going to be incredibly important. Um, someone once made this comment that we are looking at a major freeway, looking at cars, trying to predict where the car is going to exit. So most of the studies in the literature where major recordings have done, it's very hard to put that in physiological context. And in fact, Dr. Zucker had, has done some vagal recordings of the atria and atrial fibrillation, and I can tell you that that entire area of science is going to be revolutionized by some of the things that are going to come out of such symposia, which is better technology to study the nerve itself. Just, just, just one comment. I think your point is very well taken. Most vagal afferents, or many vagal afferents, are very polymodal. Some respond to stretch, some respond to chemical stimuli, and many of them go up a delta fibers versus C fibers, and they tra they transect many different areas of the of the central nervous system brainstem. So I think to target specific kinds of afferents, and some fibers will have an afferent that's a chemosensitive afferent and one that's a mechanosensitive afferent, is not going to be done probably by by focusing in on the on on the specific afferent, but probably on the type of fiber that is carried by that. In that information, and that'll take some experimentation to understand what kind of activity we need to generate to either activate or block one or the other. <clears throat> Thank you. 
So the chair allowed me to make uh, one additional comment to follow up on Dr. Saba's comment, and that's mainly because we have people from other parts of the federal government, including the FDA. I think in future, when device trials are going to be done in this field, and I served on the steering committee of some uh, recently a de renal denovation study, which actually had to be shut down because of simplicity's results, I think it's very important to highlight that if you're taking someone who's very end stage, um, in electrophysiology, we say we can't pay stake. So that's a bit of a problem. If renal denovation were tested as a drug for hypertension, it would have won hands down. So uh, there's always regression to mean and the way studies are designed. So maybe we're actually hurting patients by not designing the proper studies. And maybe the, the sort of the bar that we set for some of these device-based technologies is so high that it simply cannot be crossed. So I think that's also going to be a component of the discussion. And we think some of these neuromodulatory therapies are going to be incredibly effective when they are applied upstream very early in the stage of disease, not at the tail end when the plane is about to crash. And it's amazing that it still works, though. So thank you. I think the FDA will actually relax the, the hard rules that they have if you can come up with devices that are less invasive and miniaturized so that you can actually put them in a patient early during their stage of the disease. They're very open to that. Thank you very much. Okay, we can take a 15 minute break and then come back and we'll hear about the respiratory system and get the perspective of one of the surgeons involved. Mm. So now for the one organ that um, is going to, that feeds everything else, the air we breathe. <laughs> and uh, so it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Marianne Kolari. Okay. Uh, he will be talking about electrical neuromodulation of respiratory function. Thank you. I want to thank organizers for uh, the privilege to participate in this exciting uh, meeting. And I would like to discuss the opportunities for electrical neuromodulation of respiratory function. I would like to convince you about uh, several points. Uh, firstly, that the nerves play a major role in the pathophysiology of respiratory diseases, uh, specifically asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, these diseases are viewed as they are uh, as an inflammatory disease. And it's uh, presumed that the major problem in these diseases, which is airway obstruction, is uh, caused directly by inflammation. In fact, uh, there is a huge component due to nerve activation that contributes to the, to the uh, airway obstruction. The second point I would like to make is that the lung is a very feasible target for peripheral neuromodulation. And there are several reasons for, uh, for uh, me to make this assertion. Firstly, uh, the functional innovation, uh, virtually all functional innovation of the lung uh, is in the vagus nerve and is mediated through, and it's uh, anatomically uh, mediated through the vagal pulmonary branch. Secondly, the uh, lung has almost no uh, intrinsic circuits, so it may make it more amenable to, uh, to neuromodulation. And uh, finally, there is also a big... Uh, a uh, big potential for uh, uh, translational studies uh, because uh, there are very well-defined uh, bioassays and uh, uh, easily measured an outcome that can be measured in, uh, in uh, human tissue and in, uh, in patients. And, uh, and I would also think that uh, additional functional and anatomical mapping will enable more refined uh, neuromodulation strategies. So similar to other organs, uh, the, the airway is densely innervated. What you see here is a small human airway stain for paneuronal marker uh, PGP. So the innervation is, uh, we can see that it's uh, virtually carpeted by uh, nerves. And the nerves indeed can evoke, uh, uh, activation of the nerves can evoke the major symptoms of respiratory disease, which is uh, bronchospasm uh, air, uh, due to airway, uh, smooth muscle contraction, and mucus secretion then together uh, contribute to airway obstruction. And of course, there are uh, symptoms 
like uh, dyspnea, chest tightness, and cough that are triggered uh, by the activation of afferent nerves. Here is the uh, human innovation of the lung, which is uh, through the vagus nerve. The afferent neurons are in uh, the nodules and jugular ganglia, and the efferent neurons, uh, efferent uh, uh, pathway run also through the vagus nerve. Here you can see pulmonary, pulmonary branches that, uh, that innervate the lung, and uh, this is where uh, the neuromodulation therapies uh, in our view, can be selectively targeting. Here's a simple scheme of uh, the nerve regulation of the airway. Uh, you have afferent, uh, afferent nerves that mediate uh, sensation and also contribute to regulation of breathing, center, modulation, uh, center regulation, and then uh, efferent uh, regulation uh, mediated by parasympathetic uh, preganglionic and postganglionic uh, uh, nerves. Uh, I'll first talk about the efferent part, which is highly conserved among the species, and it's dominated by the parasympathetic, uh, 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 parasympathetic pathways that uh, cause cholinergic, con uh, bronco uh, cholinergic contraction of airway smooth muscle. So here is the central... Uh, central uh, preganglionic neurons in the, in the CNS. Here is the preganglionic fiber, which is in the vagus nerve. And here is the parasympathetic ganglion, which is, uh, which is in the tissues, actually on the surface, or on the outside surface, on the, on the airways, and uh, which then innervate uh, the muscle. The mediator causing uh, parasympathetic contraction is acetylcholine. There is also in uh, many species uh, present the uh, uh, relaxation pathway, which uh, can uh, have uh, functional effects under under certain circumstances. What what you see here is a uh, is a uh, uh, small human airway in a classic tissue bath experiment in which the uh, tension as a measure of airway constriction is measured. Uh, and the nerves is stimulated electrically, which stimulate in the tissue the postganglionic uh, nerve terminals. And you can see that the increasing uh, frequency of, st of stimulation increases the contraction, and that is contraction due to stimulation of uh, postganglionic nerve terminals is completely abolished by atropine. And this is conserved among the species. So it's actually... Uh, one part of evidence for the involvement of uh, uh, afferent nerves in uh, respiratory diseases comes actually from the use of anticholinergic. Here is uh, uh, the effect of inhaled anticholinergic versus the, the cold standard of uh, a direct uh, bronchodilator uh, beta activator on, uh, on, uh, in patients with the uh, with the COPD. As you can see, on, on, uh, this can be measured, and this is important for, uh, for uh, bioassay and evaluation of neuromodulatory effect in humans. This can be measured on a, on a very small scale. And you can see that the, that the cholinergic, uh, anticholinergic drug has uh, the effect on airway resistance that is comparable, and in this particular case, even stronger uh, the effect than, than is the effect of uh, direct uh, smooth muscle uh, uh, relaxant. Similarly, this was, this was COPD. Similarly, recently, uh, a big paper came out in uh, the New England, of, uh, New England Journal of Medicine showing uh, in patients with uh, uncontrolled asthma that the uh, long-acting anticholinergic has about the same effect on measures of airway resistant as the direct uh, uh, smooth muscle, airway smooth muscle uh, uh, relaxant. So uh, these uh, this, uh, data, uh, clinical, these and others are consistent with the, with the notion that uh, the, there's a big component of, uh, of uh, airway obstruction that is mediated by, uh, uh, by parasympathetic uh, nerves. So one, one feasible strategy, in, uh, especially in patients with, the, in, our, in our view, 
especially in patients with uh, severe disease, would be actually blocking the conduction in uh, parasympathetic preganglionic in order to, to uh, block the uh, cholinergically mediated bronco, uh, bronchoconstriction and also uh, mucus secretion. So I spent some time on the efferent part. Uh, now I would like to also uh, uh, introduce the afferent part. And the, the role, in addition to mediating the, uh, the sensation like dyspnea and cough and uh, regulating the breathing rate, it's also that it feeds into so the central mechanism into, into, uh, into parasympathetic efferent uh, activation. So, so uh, a part of that uh, increased uh, parasympathetic activation can actually be due to afferent uh, nerve activation. Here are a few examples of uh, afferent innovation of uh, uh, the airways. In this case, this is, uh, this is guinea pig. Uh, this is a receptor which is located in the, in the large airway um, and uh, is activated by acid and uh, mechanical uh, and uh, very, very fine mechanical uh, stimuli. This receptor prevents, uh, or in, in our view, uh, uh, serves to prevent uh, aspiration. The other, ma the, uh, the other major type of afferent nerve in the large airways uh, are uh, C fibers. I'm showing this example to, to illustrate how, how uh, at least anatomically, and in many cases, uh, mouse and other species, I'll talk about that later, how uh, conserved uh, the nerves and uh, are between the species. So here, here, are, uh, here are the data from mice and rats. Here is the guinea pig, and uh, here is the human uh, large airway illustrating the C-fiber innovation. And he, here is the uh, cough receptor, the one that I just described, uh, uh, responsive to acid and mechanical stimuli. And this is a similar thing. Is, uh, similar receptors are seen in uh, humans as well as in other species. I would like to focus uh, more on the afferent innovation of the lung because uh, this would be where uh, the proposed uh, neuromodulation strategies uh, should work. Here there are two major type of afferent nerves. Uh, these are uh, uh, low threshold stretch, mechanoreceptors, mecano mechanosensors. They are in, in most species A fiber. These mechanoreceptors are activated during normal breathing and uh, uh, don't, do not respond directly to uh, chemical or inflammatory stimuli, although they can be uh, activated indirectly. The other set uh, of the afferent nerves in the, in the lung are uh, bronchopulmonary C fibers. These are essentially unresponsive to, to breathing or even to large uh, lung inflation but they are responsive to, to a number of, uh, of inflammatory and chemical stimuli. I would like to point out, and I put these numbers here to, this, this is the data from Lee for, uh, obtained in red, that these uh, afferent nerves have been extensively characterized in, in, an, in, an, in, a, number of, uh, in a number of species, and uh, the results uh, uh, of a large number of studies uh, at, at Johns Hopkins uh, uh, Brett Andem's lab uh, recorded over maybe maybe over 500 of uh, mice and uh, and uh, uh, guinea pig uh, fibers. So so this is this is uh, very very well established in a terms of afferent nerve properties and their character characteristics. Uh, I would spend uh, a little bit on bronchopulmonary C fibers. As I say, they are as I said, they are relatively quiescent in normal normal tissue and they are readily stimulated by noxious chemicals, inflammatory mediators, or excessive physical stimuli. Uh, here is the comparison of response to capsaicin and the baseline activity of C fibers in different species. It's highly comparable. Uh, it's known that uh, C fiber activators initiate, initiate cough in, uh, in uh, laboratory animals, and there is high consistency between uh, what stimuli can initiate cough in uh, humans and uh, in animal models, especially trip v one uh, the capsaicin receptor, and uh, also recently trip one 
uh, that was characterized in the airway uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Taylor Clark, who is also in this symposium, and other stimuli known to induce cough in uh, animals, guinea pigs, uh, and others uh, also activate uh, bronchopulmonary C fibers. So I uh, try to convey the, my, uh, my opinion that uh, afferent uh, innovation of the of the lungs and airways is uh, is complex, but this complexity is not that is not uh, that over uh, overwhelming uh, that would stood in a in a in a way of uh, uh, neuromodulatory approaches. And this figure illustrates that uh, it's a. Uh, in the same time, the, the regulation of, uh, of uh, respiratory function, in this case, uh, parasympathetic, parasympathetic tone, is, uh, is complex, but that complexity is in the central nervous system. So here is the, uh, this uh, figure is by Dr. Brandon Kenning, who is speaking next, and it details uh, what is known about the central regulation. Compared to that, and this is the point I want to stress, the... Uh, Peripheral part of it is uh, relatively simple, consisting of a limited number of uh, afferent nerves, in many cases with highly defined function, uh, that uh, can be amenable to, to blocking approaches. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, it needs to be emphasized that uh, in, uh, in uh, inflammatory diseases, it's been described, there is a neuroplasticity that would change both afferent and to some extent also efferent limb of this reflex, increased excitability, increased expression of receptors, central neuroplasticity, and so on and so on. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's consistent with a large body of literature that the uh, nerve activity in uh, respiratory diseases is in, increased. So here is uh, one example, and uh, Dr. Kenning is going to... Uh, to uh, present some uh, uh, some data pertinent to this to this figure, uh, there is an example of a neuromodulation strategy that can be used in respiratory diseases. Remember, uh, uh, the clinical data is consistent with the fact that uh, bronchoconstriction in a major uh, life and often life threatening uh, diseases, asthma and COPD, is uh, uh, mediated by uh, parasympathetic afferent nerves that in turn are triggered by inflammation. So if you, if you picture one of those pulmonary branches uh, that, I, that I presented before, one, one plausible approach to, uh, to uh, neuromodulation in, uh, let's say, uh, asthma, uh, severe asthma, would be to try to block the signal uh, with, uh, for example, kilohertz frequency blocking signal to block the nerve traffic either selectively if possible to block the parasympathetic traffic into the lung or uh, to block the whole nerve it should be also beneficial because in inflammation the activity of c fibers and other afferents that contribute to parasympathetic reflexes uh, would be enhanced on the other hand it should be also noted that this may interfere with uh, normal regulation of breathing so some additional neuromodulatory approach may be, may be required. Finally, I uh, would like to mention a few techniques that, uh, uh, just very briefly, the last uh, three slides. Uh, airway neurons, this is the nodose ganglion in the guinea pig, uh, are highly amenable to, uh, uh, to transfection and uh, other research techniques, so we can deliver green protein into the, these are the nodose neurons transfected by in this case, adeno-associated vi viruses, this uh, will allow us to map the peripheral nerve terminals. We think this is a, two different types of C-fibers uh, terminals in the lung. It also allows for delivery of molecular tools into the lung and airways. And uh, here, here is an example of a, of, uh, of a paper we did a, a few years ago in which we could selectively silence uh, in this case, NAV 1.7 voltage-gated sodium channel, which resulted in uh, decreased vagal conduction and uh, abolition of uh, cough in the guinea pig. Finally, uh, this is uh, our uh, recent data. It is also possible from, uh, uh, from human donors, as we discussed earlier, to obtain the uh, real 
a vagal pulmonary branch. So this, this, comes from a, this comes from a human organ donor. Uh, uh, these uh, nerves are therefore good for, uh, for uh, studying, uh, studying, studying the conduction, which is pertinent to, uh, to what, uh, uh, what I'm trying to say, that uh, the parameters required, for example, in this case, to block this type of fiber can be optimized uh, by using... Uh, Human tissue. So, so one of the big questions that was that was here: how you choose the parameters, at least at the level of what would be required to block nerve, uh, uh, can be answered this way. This this data shows that this is reproducible and we can study. So, this is my final slide. Uh, we think that the nerve play major royal role in pathophysiology of uh, major respiratory diseases, asthma, and COPD. We think the lung is very feasible target for uh, peripheral neuromodulation, and uh, the, 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 uh, the further research into uh, mapping and uh, the properties on, and structure of afferent nerves will, ena will enable more defined neuromodulation. Thank you very much. Technology response, Dr. Brendan Canning, also from Johns Hopkins. Thank you very much. Um, so in one of the teleconferences we had in the lead up to this meeting, uh, it was mentioned, we hear this often, uh, respiratory neurobiologists, is that there just isn't a lot known about airway neural control, is there? And, uh, and in fact, that's really not true. And I hope Marion at least touched on the point that, that, in fact, we know a great deal about airway neural control and from pioneers like Whittacombe and Coleridge, and, and there's a number of groups still very active. What is clear, however, is that those of us studying airway neural control have gotten very little, made very little progress in convincing the pulmonary community as a whole to consider the nervous system is relevant to respiratory diseases. So I've taken this definition of asthma from the NHLBI guidelines on the diagnosis of, and treatment of asthma. And this is a 200-page document that tells you everything you'd want to know and then some about asthma treatment and diagnosis. And cover to cover, 200 pages written by primarily allergists, all of them inflammologists, Nerves are mentioned exactly one time, and in that context, it is stress may result in the formation of pro-inflammatory cytokines to, uh, to, promote, uh, to promote asthma. So, so very little um, uh, of traction in terms of airway neural control is relevant to respiratory diseases. And yet, if you look closely at this definition of asthma and you see some of the words that the patients tell them, what they experience when they have asthma and how they diagnose this disease. They talk about wheezing, so that's air, airflow obstruction, reversible airflow obstruction. Breathlessness and chest tightness, which of course are sensations, which we refer to as dyspnea. Cough, of course, an airway defensive reflex we all recognize as, as uh, in, involving vagal afferents. The diurnal variation of symptoms, well established in asthma, clearly implicating, in my mind, a, a neuronal component. Reversible airways obstruction, Marion presented some data showing clearly that in asthma and in COPD, to the extent that there is reversible airways obstruction in these diseases, to a large extent, this is driven by airway parasympathetic innervation. And then finally, airways hyperresponsiveness, which to the extent any drugs modulate airways reactivity in asthma, it would appear to be that this is largely a cholinergic Phenomena, So nerves are quite important. And so then, as a hypothesis, from a neuromodulation perspective, an effective therapy through neuromodulation for respiratory diseases would limit or reduce some of these symptoms which are common to all obstructive lung diseases. So cough, chest, nice, ch chest tightness, reversible airways obstruction. And so that really, as, as a benchmark, what would be a successful neuromodulation therapy some beneficial effect on these outcomes, which are easy to measure in animals, very easy to measure in patients.
this would be the evidence for a successful therapy. There are companies thinking about this. So as, as we all know, GlaxoSmithKline is represented here at the meeting, and, and they have, amongst their initiative in, in bioelectronics, is an effort towards respiratory neuromodulation. And so we're quite thankful for that. Uh, other companies are also involved. So there's some effort both from academic groups, but also from some uh, small startups to explore the possibility of the optogenetic approaches for modulating airway neural control. And I've listed one company there, Circuit Therapeutics, involved there. Not necessarily a neuromodulation approach, but again, acknowledging the importance of the nervous system in respiratory diseases. The company Holera is developing technology for selective neural ablation uh, through the airway to limit the symptoms, in this case, of COPD. This was uh, an advertisement from a symposium they sponsored at the European Respiratory Society meeting last year. And then finally, some clinical and some animal data from the company Electricor looking at endpoints of primarily acute asthma, but also some lung function measurements in animals. This is with implantable off-the-shelf electrodes, but also their non-invasive neurostimulation. So companies are thinking about the notion of neuromodulation for respiratory diseases, even if uh, academics and key opinion leaders are not. Um, so what I want to do is to summarize very briefly an approach that we are exploring, and this is through our work with the uh, Bioelectronics Network at GlaxoSmithKline, uh, exploiting some of the technology and some of the approaches championed and, and refined by, by Kevin Kilgore, Case Western, of course, and then uh, Butera at, in uh, Georgia Tech. And this is the uh, kilohertz high-frequency stimulation for nerve blocked, some of the endpoints that Marion talked about. And this is just proof of concept. Can we achieve this? Can we achieve neuromodulation of relevant respiratory endpoints? And so this is our linear approach to this. So we start fairly simple. Marion showed you the compound potential in the human vagus nerve. And we'll start our primary species of choice for these things are guinea pig. It's a nice uh, predictor of human physiology. Um, just simply compound potential. Can we block this with high frequency AC stimulation? just recording with compound potentials. Then we take those parameters and isolate a main stem bronchus of a guinea pig, and we electrically stimulate that bronchus to evoke contractions. And you get nice frequency-dependent contractions. And then we'll apply the high-frequency AC block and see if we can prevent those contractions functionally. And these are all driven by the release of acetylcholine from postganglionic parasympathetic nerves. And then with success, can we take this then to an intact animal. This is sort of a classic old physiology preparation that maybe even undergraduates could use, and then just driving bronchoconstriction in vivo with an electrical stimulation of the vagus nerve, and then asking simple proof of concept questions. Can we prevent this vaguely driven bronchoconstriction with a uh, high frequency block? So let's start with the compound potential. So you'll recognize these types of traces. Here's a brief shark artifact. Shark artifact and you see two different populations of fast-conducting afferents here. Not so obvious, so this is a C wave out here. This is under control conditions, and then applying a high-frequency block here in the middle. Here you see the shock artifact, and all components of that compound potential are lost, at least the fast components here. Removing the block, coming back and stimulating complete recovery. So. In this evidence, and this was not surprising given what Kevin's done at Case Western and, and, and the work from Mark Butera at uh, Georgia Tech, we can achieve block, especially of myelinated fibers, uh, through this approach. Um, and that's on isolated nerve. Now we're going to take this to the intact preparation, same parameters, same nerve, and we're going to isolate this whole preparation. So the vagus nerve is intact, and then we isolate the bronchus. And we'll measure muscle contraction here in vitro. And this will be all perfused in, in, in physiologic oxygenated saline. And then we'll stimulate the vagus nerve. And if we do that, just 10 second uh, pulses onto the vagus nerve, you get these very rapid, fast developing contractions. This is due to acetylcholine. So 10 second stimulation, it goes up. When the stimulation stops, acetylcholine is very quickly metabolized. The contractions come right back down to baseline. You do this repetitively. It's a highly reproducible bioassay. Then we apply the high-frequency block. There's a very brief 
onset effect and an offset effect, but with these continued stimulations, complete block of the muscle contraction. These are massive muscle contractions of the airways. This would be the type of response that would drive an asthmatic to the emergency room that we're preventing here. Let's do a little bit something different here. We're preventing bronchoconstriction, do something a little bit more physiologically relevant. Can we reverse a contraction? So this is a sustained stimulation of those vagus nerves. Again, a massive contraction of that bronchus. It would be shutting down those airways. And then we apply the high-frequency block, essentially complete reversal of this muscle contraction, stop the block, and the tone develops back and then stop the stimulation entirely and, and muscle return. So functional levels, we can achieve uh, quite profound uh, neuromodulation with this uh, AC block. So this established in vitro, at least, that we can achieve uh, a neuromodulation approach. Can we take this to the in vivo setting? And in fact, we can. So this is a simple preparation. The animal's mechanically ventilated. We're measuring the pressure with which it takes to inflate that lung. And if you stimulate the vagus nerves, the airways constrict, so it takes more pressure to fill the lungs with a constant volume. Here's the response, control conditions, and then with high-frequency block, largely abolished, and then recovery. So this is encouraging proof of concept that neuromodulation would be effective at restoring lung function in, in animals, at least. Now, the goal, of course, is to improve lung function without having unwanted side effects. And, and this is a big issue uh, with high-frequency stimulation. And particularly if we're going to apply this to a mixed nerve like the vagus nerve. And the concern would be, of course, that's what we want. We want to restore normal uh, airway, airway tone. But what we don't want are cardiovascular side effects. And all the experiments that we've described so far, we're applying these stimulations directly to the whole vagus nerve. We're not looking at pulmonary branches. We don't want GI dysfunction. And then even in the airways, tremendous amount of breath-to-breath -breath regulation of, of tidal volumes and respiratory rate, which arises from vagal afferents. But there's also control of upper airway function. You don't want to block that. And so ideally, you want to limit side effects. And that is where Marion alluded to the point that perhaps the respiratory system is amenable to these neuromodulatory approaches because you can target these pulmonary branches. And here's just a diagram. This is a guinea pig. So now we're looking at the dorsal view of the main stem bronchus. Over here is the esophagus. Here's the vagus nerve. And then here are these pulmonary branches coming off. Um, of the vagus nerve. You see a few different ones. Some of these are likely uh, spinal and sympathetic projections that merge with the vagus nerve, but certainly major branches coming off the vagus, which are amenable to uh, uh, neuromodulation approaches and electrode. And so we've explored this, again, proof of concept using um, a number of different, just simple off-the-shelf electrodes. Uh, here, looking at microprobes and Cortec. Here's the... Uh, the uh, configuration of one of these sling cuffs that we've used. And again, just looking at the, c the compound potential, quite clear evidence that we can achieve neuromodulation on a pulmonary branch of the vagus nerve. So that at least increases the prospects that we can interrogate respiratory endpoints uh, by limiting some of the GI side effects and upper airway side effects and perhaps cardiovascular side effects that we would want to avoid. So again, I think this is purely proof of concept that we've done in the animals. We've gone with a very simple endpoint of muscle contraction. But I think what I would like to believe is that I've convinced you that this is amenable to neuromodulation. The respiratory system is, is, is certainly uh, a, a relevant target for neural control, and it's relevant to, to um, obstructive lung diseases. And there is potential benefit of neuromodulation in outcomes. And if we can achieve any uh, normalization of any of these sorts of outcomes in these patients, I think uh, it, it would prove to be a success. And with that, I would end. And, and thank you. Yeah. So open for discussion, Mark.
Hi, my name's uh, Tom Taylor-Clark. I'm from the University of South Florida. Uh, thanks, Brendan and Marion. Great talk. Um, I have a question. Uh, what is known about... You say uh, you can block the A fibers very clearly. What is known about the conduction velocities of the parasympathetic nerves innervating the airways? So there, there has been a bit of work done on that in, in animals and to, to a small extent in humans as well, based on uh, uh, parasympathetic ganglia recordings. Primarily a delta uh, conduction, particularly for the cholinergic pathways. There is some evidence for an unmyelinated component to uh, preganglionic input uh, in some airways, and in particular to that non-cholinergic bronchodilating pathway. Uh, the, the VIP nitric oxide uh, driven pathway. The preganglionics driving that system would appear to be unmyelinated. Hi, Xin Bingai from Bergen. Uh, whenever I talk about the neurobiology in the pulmonary tract to my colleagues at Bergen, I always got two questions. I guess I will get opinions from the expert in the field. The first question is uh, since the transplant lung works just fine, Presumably, a lot of nerves has been severed during transplantation because surgeon never made attempt to connect the nerves. So why do you need nerves in a lung? So that's usually the first question I got. And then the second question I usually get is from asthma uh, doctors. They always argue, why do you need other methods to treat asthma since the dilator works really well? I think a majority of the asthma patient, once you get the puff of the uh, dilator, you, you, you recover. So I guess these are the two questions I have. And then, uh, in my opinion, I have my own comments on the field. I think there's a lot to know about the connections. You know, during the Marion's talk, there's a nice connection of vagus nerve to the ganglion in the trachea pop predominantly. I guess the question is how much of the connection through the vagus nerve is going through the intrinsic ganglion, and how much of that actually bypassing that? I, I think I'm still not clear from the talk. So uh, regarding the first comment of, of uh, lung transplant patients uh, doing just fine, I think, uh, I think lung transplant patients would probably dispute that, as would their physicians. Um, I think airway neural control is quite critical. And, and in fact, the lung transplant patients are a perfect example because they are extraordinarily susceptible to aspiration, aspiration pneumonia, for example. And so the goal of any neuromodulation approach is, of course, to normalize neural function and not to eliminate it entirely. So complete denervation is an undesirable outcome, rather to normalize function. Um, that, would be, that would be the first point. And then getting to the second point of why not just a bronchodilator and the potential benefit of a neuromodulation approach are several fold. First of all, the bronchodilators that you're talking about are effective only in those airways in which they can reach. And one of the things we know about asthma and COPD is that there are a lot of obstructed airways with mucus. And if those drugs can't get by inhalation, they're given all by inhalation, if they can't get to those airways, then they'll have very little benefit. And in theory, at least, a neuromodulation approach that works through the nervous system and limits the, the efferent drive would open up those airways, and then they would be amenable to potential aer aerosolized therapy. The other point would be that it's not just airways obstruction. There's chronic cough, there's dyspnea as well. These are big problems for patients in terms of quality of life, and anticholinergic and bronchodilators have very little benefit in terms of cough and dyspnea. So the the, the question is, uh, why are we ignoring the sympathetic nervous system? There are beta adrenergic receptors, which you showed, that respond to salbutamol and other. And we know that when you administer beta adrenergic blocking agents, it can induce bronchoconstriction in asthmatic patients. Uh, so are there no sympathetic pathways? And also, are there any sympathetic pathways that contain afferents that might play a role in some of the dysfunction? Yeah, I'll start with the first uh, part of your question. Um, so there is certainly sympathetic innervation to the airways of all species. It turns out, though, in humans, as it relates to obstructive lung diseases, there is no sympathetic innervation to the airways of the muscle, despite the presence of beta-2 receptors on the muscle. 
which explains the, the therapeutic benefit of beta-2 agonists upon inhalation. But there is no functional sympathetic innervation to the muscle. There is sympathetic innervation to the vasculature, and that's probably quite relevant to pulmonary hypertension, obviously, but also potentially to regulating the caliber and blood flow to the mucosa, which helps clearance of, of irritants and other things in the airway. So I think that's, that's an important point. But in terms of muscle, at least, no direct innervation. I thought, I the, thought there was some evidence for sympathetic control of the parasympathetic system, that, that sympathetics could modulate acetylcholine release. Or yeah, so, so uh, certainly the neurotransmitters can, uh, but in terms of direct innervation, there's very little evidence in humans and then also in animals, very little evidence for, for direct innervation. Okay. But hormonal, absolutely. I think there's good evidence for that. One, one other quick question. In the first slide you showed with high-frequency block, it looked like there was not a, an immediate recovery of the evoked response. Uh, some of my colleagues in Pittsburgh are also intrigued by this delayed recovery after high-frequency block. So was that an unusual response, or is this something that occurs regularly? Well, I would, I would respond at the level of uh, the compound action potential that we, that we recorded uh, from, uh, directly from the vagus nerve. Uh, at the at the lower voltages that were already sufficient to completely eliminate the compound, the A, A wave in the compound potential, this the reversal for a short duration up to one minute was reversal, reversed immediately to the extent that we could we, we stimulate it every uh, two, uh, at two hertz. Uh, why uh, the bronco the reversal of bronchoconstriction? The example that Brandon showed was. Uh, a tissue that was contracted and then the signal was blocked. And the reversal, I think, I don't know what Brandon is opinion, I think this is more related to the, to the uh, readout system than to, re, uh, than to actually blocking A fibers in, the, in that system. The parasympathetic, uh, in the parasympathetic system, sometimes denervation causes a post-junctional supersensitivity. I know that that is quite prominent in salivary gland. Um, do, you, it, it, do, you see, do you envision or do you see any modulation of the sensitivity of your tissue by chronic stimulation or chronic denervation? So we haven't done that. and I think the, the only place we could draw some... Uh, Indication as to whether or not that happens would be in lung transplant patients, and um, and at, at the level of an isolated smooth muscle, there doesn't seem to be a tremendous amount of change in terms of muscarinic sensitivity, for example, uh, in the muscle. But there is some evidence in vivo, at least, of of an, of an enhanced response to an inhaled methacholine <laughs> challenge. Is that structural? Is that something else? Uh, it, it's unclear. It's unclear, but um, not a supersensitivity. Can I make? Yeah, I would also like to. Is there a synergic component in this innovation? There is in the um, in the parotid. I know. So uh, th th there is a great deal of interest in the role of uh, purinergic regulation of afferent excitability in the airways, and this is driven in part by a recent paper in Lancet describing a profound uh, restoration of cough responsiveness in patients with chronic cough with a uh, highly selective P2X23 receptor antagonist. Functionally, on the autonomic side, there was some time that this was investigated, and the evidence is, is, is not very compelling that there's a purinergic component in airway swim muscle. If I, if I may, I would make two comments, one uh, to purinergic, that uh, on the efferent side, though, there is plenty of evidence that the efferent uh, signaling that then drives the parasympathetic is uh, uh, regulated, uh, I would say, in a manner perhaps similar to what's been found uh, in bladder, also in the, in the respiratory system. And the, other, uh, and the other point I wanted to make earlier, uh, at least I think Brendan may have different opinion, but uh, as of the chronic effect, this, uh, as at least the, the way I envision it initially, it's uh, reserved for the patients who are not really controlled very well, 
and uh, in a, in a times of asthma attacks or 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 uh, COPD exacerbation, I failed to make that point. So we are not thinking about chronically driving kilohertz frequency levels. It's it's when when the bronchoconstriction bronchoconstriction comes. I'm glad you asked this question. Thank you. So I really enjoyed your presentation again. Um, when our group for the first time described structural changes in neurons in stellate ganglia in patients with cardiomyopathy, we were actually quite impressed to see that when you look through the pulmonary literature, lung diseases are actually associated with very similar changes in those neurons. So I was going to sort of follow up on the same question that uh, Professor de Groot asked, and that is, um, what are those afferents doing? Because uh, it, or is it just the activation of the efferents? Uh, what what ex what would explain that? Because it's strongly associated with pulmonary disease. And what do sympathetic nerve fibers do in the lungs? Purely vascular or just upper? You're asking about about um, spinal afferents. Uh, in the yeah, lungs we're, yeah, we're talking about yeah, exactly because those yeah. transition through those ganglia as they do for the heart. Yeah, yeah. Um, so not a great deal of literature uh, studying this. So Marion just very recently uh, started to map uh, terminations of these afferents, and I think that's an important step. We don't have a lot of information on what they do. Uh, so much of the physiology in the lung is explained by vagal control, both afferent and efferent, that much less uh, time has been spent on, on studying uh, spinal and sympathetic regulation of the airways. Uh, I, I, there certainly is, and we've studied this, there is sympathetic regulation uh, through spinal afferents uh, in terms of cardiovascular control. And so if you initiate something like an acute pulmonary embolism, a big component of the cardiovascular response is driven by spinal afferents that innervate the lung, um, and they'll drive a pulmonary hypertension and a systemic hypotension when activated. And they'll be sensitive to things like serotonin, for example which would be derived from platelets. But again, the, the literature is fairly patchy because so much of, of the physiology of the lung is driven by, by uh, vagal control. So do you think these studies that are trying to do pulmonary denervation for pulmonary hypertension, are they completely shooting in the dark? <laughs> I don't know. So I, I uh, y you know, I, I think you'd even get debate amongst uh, pulmonologists as to whether or not there is even a reversible component, a, a smooth muscle component, that it's really an obliterative component. But uh, it's conceivable that it'd be benefit. But one more question, or maybe two more. Um, so I, I know the advantage of neuromodulation when you're stimulating nerves, like for carotid barrel stimulation, is you can titrate the response. Can you do that when you're blocking the nerve? Can you titrate how much you block the nerve? Um, I think Kevin Kilgore could probably answer that better than I could, and I think he'll have an opportunity to do that. I would say yes. that it would be... It would it, be nice. It, it, it would be yes, and particularly if, if you're asking the question, can you titrate in terms of targeting just myelinated fibers versus unmyelinated? That would be that one option. I mean in terms of how much you block yes. the nerve. Just any given nerve, can you titrate that response just as well as you can a stimulation? Theoretically, yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What is the uh, pathway for pain from the respiratory tract? Or is this an <laughs> organ that completely resistant to pain? No, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the, this is a this is a debate that we 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 get into uh, a lot because um, one of the things that that we we often uh, use as a term to describe the bronchopulmonary C fibers is nociceptors, and and that term has become synonymous with pain in the literature, and I think that is not the intent of how we would use it, um, and absolutely you're, you're you're right that there are pulmonary conditions that are associated with pain. It could very well be that the sensations of pain are driven by pleural afferents that are spinal. Mm -hmm. We've wondered whether or not there's a vagal component uh, to the sensation of pain. It seems unlikely based on the literature, but, uh, but it's difficult to prove. So maybe, maybe the sympathetic afferents that go yeah. into the spinal cord. Yeah, yeah. 
one last question. One quick question. Um, uh, Brendan and Marion, um, the reason why we're talking about this is, is because drugs can't treat certain diseases. So... Uh, so, um, essentially, what, what is the problem with pharmaceutical treatment of cough, seeing as cough is the primary reason why people go to their healthcare physician? Uh, the answer is fairly simple, and, and that is that they, the, the drugs currently used to treat cough are utterly and completely ineffective. Uh, and, and that is the problem with... Uh, with pharmacologic approaches to to cough, they do not work, and it's and it's firmly established that they do not. And yet, we still happily spend billions of dollars a year uh, treating cough with dextromethorphan and codeine. But um, okay, thank you. Thanks. So, with that um, statement about pharma pharmacological approaches. Uh, let's go to the final talk of the session this morning, um, and that will be Dr. Syed hey, Ikramuddin. And after his um, uh, talk, we will take some questions specifically for him, but we will open it up for discussion to ask questions of any of the speakers who uh, presented today. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Jung, for moderating the session. My gratitude to the NIH um, team for inviting me down. I'm very grateful for that. I'm especially grateful for Dr. Pauli for giving my lecture uh, for me uh, in such an eloquent way. But that's okay because I, I learned a great deal uh, from it, so that was good. The, um, and I guess I, I'm grateful to all of you scientists out there who, who really have shown, for me personally, as someone interested in understanding what I do and why it works for being... Uh, so collaborative over the years. And, and one of the things I've learned from sitting here is there's, there really is something to be said for human work. And we've had so many patients now we've been able to put these devices in that uh, I think that uh, there's a huge opportunity to study them. And they're willing to do it. Our, our patients are very interested in their own disease, particularly diabetics with obesity, and uh, are very open to, to uh, understanding the mechanism. So it's something to be, to be said for that. I'm going to try and give you a, a, a slightly different perspective. Uh, you, you, you know this, but maybe from a different angle of why this is all so important. Uh, and, and maybe we can uh, hopefully draw some conclusions from that. So obesity is a, a problem in the United States. 35% uh, of, of Americans are, are overweight with a BMI greater than 30. And obesity is a, is a difficult disease to treat. You can see the whole spectrum of disease of interventions for this, this disease here. Uh, and you can see that uh, at the very, um, let's use the mouse, I can use that. Very low calorie diets will get you significant weight loss, but there's tremendous recidivism. And with diet, you kind of get what you pay for, um, not very much weight loss. So it's an issue, it's, it's hard to do. Uh, and there are nice models to, to treat obesity, especially in patients with diabetes. One uh, set of modules comes from the Look Ahead study, which is just a brilliant study in terms of its degree of intervention and rigor in treating people with lifestyle modification. And it really, really does work. And you can see uh, in the blue the weight loss at uh, one year. But again, you see that weight regain after that first year or so. And then as you get out to your seven, eight, nine, uh, you, you start to see weight loss in both groups, in the green, the, the, uh, the uh, diabetes self-education group, and in the uh, blue, the um, intensive lifestyle intervention. And this may actually be due to a sarcopenia. It's hard to say exactly what's been going on with that population. But I'll remind everybody that this study was designed to look at uh, mortality due to a composite of cardiovascular endpoints heart attacks, uh, non-fatal MIs, uh, and death from uh, cardiovascular disease. And uh, this, that 12 years uh, was the final endpoint, but at 9.6 years they stopped the study because there was perhaps not enough weight loss. It's hard to say, or maybe the end wasn't uh, high enough to prove a difference. So weight loss, um, we, we've always suggested that it uh, causes death and mortality, but we need a lot to, to have um, uh, the results that we see. Maybe, it's hard to say, but it's interesting. 
So that's where surgery comes in. It's rather a draconian uh, approach to, to taking care of this problem, given the complexity of the disease. And there are a number of, of players in the field. We have the LAT band, which we thought was going to be the, the sort of savior of bariatric surgery. Very, uh, very little invasiveness to it. Uh, could be done as an outpatient. Uh, it's essentially gone uh, from what we do today. The sleeve gastrectomy, uh, and I apologize, you can't see that uh, there very well on the slides which is the, the new kid on the block, if you will. It's just a narrow sleeve of the stomach with the greater curvature removed. The Ruamai gastric bypass, which we've heard is the gold standard today, and um, the duodenal switch. And one of the things I want to say is the sleeve gastrectomy, the second operation, really has surpassed the Ruamai. For me as a surgeon, the Ruamai gastric bypass has very little clinical relevance today. And that's interesting and somewhat ironic because uh, we've always held it to be the gold standard but if you look at the premier database, that's a purchasing database, uh, looking at staples and, and procedures done. Uh, the sleeve gastrectomy, at least in the northern half of the country, has eclipsed the gastric bypass. So uh, things are moving very much in a sort of low moral hazard. In other words, the idea of having better uh, uh, outcomes from uh, lower consumption of health care is a definite direction that uh, uh, we're going in. So we, we did look at the gastric bypass to try and look at the impact of this operation on, on type 2 diabetes. And I only want to show you one thing on this group, which is the BMI, which was uh, le lower than traditional criteria, BMI 30 to, to 40. And uh, we had patients with a very high hemoglobin A1C of 9.6. So really the sickest patients. We really wanted to do is see how best medical management combined with surgery and best medical management alone would do in terms of achieving endpoints and achieving weight loss. And what we're really trying to do is identify a gap, if you will. And you can see uh, these data at 24 years, uh, these are in press now, 24 months, excuse me, uh, looking out from surgery, we have about a 9% weight loss in the, in the medical group and about a 25% weight loss in the surgical group. So there's uh, a significant difference in terms of weight loss but what was very interesting, I thought, was the change in hemoglobin A1C. It went from 9.6 in, uh, in both groups down to about 7.8 in the medical group and 6.3 in the surgical group. So very big differences in hemoglobin A1C. In fact, you would argue that according to the ADA criteria, American Diabetes Association criteria, most patients in the medical group with intensive lifestyle modification and best medical management are not at goal. So we need something else, and we need something else because surgery has complications. And we've known this for a long time. And here's just a list of all the things beginning at right after surgery, starting with GI bleed and atelectasis, pulmonary embolism, all the way to uh, nutritional problems, and, of course, weight regain as you get out from surgery. So we need something that can be durable and, uh, again, have less uh, loss of well-being. And at the time... Uh, that we were doing these in, in the largest number. This is all we had, and we helped a lot of people. But at the same time, we need to continuously ask ourselves the question of where does surgery fit? And I show you this because this is a marginal ulcer uh, from someone who smokes, who's had uh, bariatric surgery before. And these are very, very difficult problems uh, to, to fix in patients. And oftentimes, we will have to remove the ulcer and actually reverse the surgery. And as, as it was pointed out today, you're never quite the same with those. So we've got a gap to fill, a substantial gap. So with diet, exercise, and lifestyle modification, those are difficult to achieve. Uh, significant weight loss can be achieved, but it comes back, especially with, uh, uh, with time. Uh, drug therapy, there are several new medications on the market now, and uh, more to come, I think, but uh, certain risks that occur with those. Uh, certainly in patients with depression, it's an issue. Uh, those who are childbearing years, it's an issue. And many of these are injectable. Uh, and uh, of course, there's cost and coverage. 15% of the country uh, is uh, a candidate for bariatric surgery. That's a staggering number. And we certainly are not out to do that at all. Uh, but again, with the risks that I showed you, there's again a huge gap. And what are we going to do to fill that gap? And that's why I think the work that you're doing today is so very important for helping us deliver the care that our patients need because that treatment really is, is suboptimal. So when you look at obesity-related type 2 diabetes and the mechanism for surgery uh, improvement, you've got, uh, you've got to understand what's going on certainly in these patients. There's less insulin secretion. 
uh, there's increased glucagon, the gut peptides are well recognized, and uh, an inability to dispose of glucose properly. And we know that there are several things that contribute to these, but vagal function may be a significant contributing factor to why bariatric surgery does indeed make a difference in patients. And the interesting thing is we do cut the vagus nerve. No matter how you, you want to think about it, here's a patient that we're getting ready to start the gastric bypass on. There's a lesser curvature of the stomach over here. This is the pancreas that you can see through. Esophagus is up here, and here are the vagus nerves. Anterior and posterior, the nerve branches over here. And you can see on the next slide, uh, there's... It seems so traumatic, doesn't it? After all, we talked about today, the vagus nerve caught up here and then coming up to this branch. And of course, that's going to be divided as this pouch is made. And you can see sort of the schematic over here of what a uh, gastric bypass actually looks like. So vagotomy uh, is, is an interesting idea. It's very permanent, but it's certainly not durable. And if you look at the original paper from 1978, that was based on three patients that were published, and they lost, I think, between 10 and 19 <laughs> kilograms. That really was what sp uh, spurred a lot of this. So maybe the standards are a little bit more rigorous today for, for uh, entertaining some of these sorts of things. But certainly in experimental animals, we know that you'll see a transient weight loss with vagotomy, uh, but then through unclear mechanisms, this seems to be overcome. And so that's an interesting thing about why uh, maybe a temporary vagal block or vagal stimulation might have a better impact rather than a permanent uh, transection, which can then be overcome by, I won't say collateral, but other mechanisms. So the science undergoing vagal block, uh, you know all much better than I do. Uh, most of uh, the vagus um, uh, function, 10 to 20 percent, um, coming out of the brain. The rest is going back to the brain. The motor functions, gastric acid secretion, digestive enzyme secretion, um, and uh, gastric capacity motility, of course, glucose regulation, uh, regulation of gluconeogenesis. But the, most of the information is com coming back from the periphery uh, with satiety, hunger, uh, regulation of uh, energy metabolism, for example. So um, it's been postulated that perhaps interruption of the vagus nerve or blockade may indeed produce weight loss. And this has been uh, the subject of many studies, uh, prospective, of course, and then uh, two randomized trials. And I will summarize uh, the, the final study, uh, which led to this device being FDA approved. And this is an um, intermittent delivery, five, uh, 5,000 hertz with pulses on for two minutes, off for a minute, on for two minutes, then off for five minutes, then off for the, the um, 12 hours at, at nighttime. This is a laparoscopic operation. We, we, you need to do this by having a general anesthetic. You've got to see the vagus nerves, the truncal vagus nerves, and then uh, there's a large subcutaneous neuroregulator. And the size of this is such because of the energy that's de delivered. And it would be nice to make that a much smaller device uh, to be able to deliver the therapy uh, in, in a less invasive way, if you will. Uh, and so the idea is to suppress appetite, to, to increase sense of fullness, and perhaps in, uh, um, uh, to change energy metabolism. And, and the, the sense of what I got earlier in the day was that vagal nerve stimulation was better than... Um, uh, was better than blockade, and then we came around full circle at the end, and uh, we're not so sure again, And because there is some complexity and perhaps some overlap there. This shows what, what we do at the time of surgery. It's relatively straightforward. Uh, this patient had fatty liver, so that was a little difficult to get access to the hiatus, but it's really not that challenging in experienced hands to find the vagal nerve trunks and encircle those, and we measure the resistances at the time of surgery. Uh, in terms of ongoing randomized trials, one's complete. This was the EMPOWER study. The EMPOWER study was the first randomized double-blind placebo trial that actually showed no difference in this patient population. And that was in large part due to the fact that these patients had nerve leads hooked up to the vagus nerve from the, vagus, from the neuroregulator, and they received therapy uh, when they were being interrogated, when the, when the device was being interrogated. So that created a bit of confusion. So uh, the company very rigorously uh, d devised the recharge study, a beautifully named study, if you will, uh, to look at uh, a two-to-one randomization of um, subjects, again, blinded in a placebo trial. And uh, the BMI range was uh, between 35 and 45, so relatively low, not going to the super high BMIs, in which there were no leads hooked up. So that took out the, the variability. And um, this uh, results were then um, looked at at one year. These patients had... 
a mean age of uh, 47, mostly female, which is typical of the bariatric surgery population, not the obesity population, but those who present for bariatric surgery, very small percentage of patients with diabetes. Um, BMI 41, which is actually a little bit on the low side for the bariatric population, uh, with an excess weight of about uh, 96 pounds and waist circumference uh, 48 inches. And so here's the data, and I'm combining a couple of different slides. The 12-month data is the one that was published, and um, this study failed to reach its primary endpoint, which was a pre-specified superiority margin over sham. And part of that is because the sham group did so well. And there's been a lot of speculation as to why that is. But I wanted to show you, and, and uh, Dr. Ludwig, I think, did a wonderful job of summarizing the, the study, is, is what happens beyond 12 months as we get out to 18 months. And this is the sham uh, group here at the top. And you can see some effacement of that effect, definitely, uh, as with time. Now, what's interesting to note is about 16 months, about 90% of the patients were still not yet unblinded to their treatment arm. Now, by 18 months, most people were unblinded to the treatment. About 75% of people were still uh, were, were unblinded, 80% uh, were unblinded. But it just shows that even in the setting of uh, being blinded, we see erosion of the sham group. And that, I found, was a, something compelling uh, to, th to think about. Another thing I find very compelling to think about is whereas the, the weight loss, total body weight loss at its maximum was 9%, very similar, by the way, to the look-ahead study, uh, which was about 8.9-ish percent, uh, is, is, the severe, is the magnitude of responders. And so when you look at the population of people that are more likely to have a durable uh, or more profound weight loss, as you get out to 15% uh, total body weight loss, the odds ratio goes to about 5 favoring the intervention, and even more weight loss, about 18 or 19%, about 13 uh, times odds ratio uh, associated with those patients having V-block device. So it can be quite potent in a subset of patients. But I guess that's sort of why we're here today, is to figure out who this will work in and understand and map out uh, the pathways that can identify success in this population. And we're very eager to do that and eager to understand that with your help. Clearly, and no surprise here, in a way that's proportional to weight loss, the better that patients did with weight loss, so did the systolic and diastolic blood pressure uh, improve accordingly, the heart rate slowed accordingly, the cholesterol fell accordingly, and the hemoglobin A1C, although small, because remember, only 5% of these patients had type 2 diabetes, uh, fell accordingly. Uh, if we look at reductions beyond the 12 months, what was published, you can see that uh, if both uh, hemoglobin A1C, and I'm sorry for the, the, the bright yellow color there, and fasting plasma glucose, both continued uh, to have robust um, uh, reductions uh, from baseline, as did systolic and blood, uh, diastolic blood pressure as well from baseline. And again, I think a lot of this was proportionate to the weight loss and sustaining the weight loss as time went out. Just a few minutes on what's going on uh, with nerves and, and potential for, for nerve salvage and avoiding nerve injury. Uh, these are data I'm going to tell you about that you will understand much better than I. Um, I I'm sure this looks at uh, uh, the current amplitude required uh, um, uh, to, to reduce um, uh, the reduction in the compound action potential for the A delta waves, that's the black solid dots and the or open dots. And as we get higher, as you, you can see with the, uh, the amplitude, uh, that you see a differential drop-off. So as you get um, uh, to between 2 and 3, you see most of the A delta waves drop out, and then uh, between 7 and 7.5, and uh, the C fibers uh, uh, with their reduction in compound action potential. Uh, the next one shows uh, the recovery of the A delta fibers after the block, um, as and uh, it quite quite quickly actually. Uh, and this is um, uh, in a in a rodent model. Uh, just most of these, about fifty percent of these, are back by about two minutes, and by ten minutes, ninety percent of these fibers are back um, uh, to their relative uh, compound active potential. One of the concerns is about uh, is over long term. Uh, a poor science study was designed to do this uh, with 71 pigs, 142 leads, and uh, they measured uh, the outcome uh, of the um, uh, histology and uh, nerve, uh, nerve uh, um, conduction velocities and function uh, at, uh, e at uh, 84 days, roughly close to 90 days, 
in this uh, in this animal model. Same, roughly the same uh, program. Five minutes on, five minutes off, um, at about eight milliamps on these patients on these on these animals. Excuse me. Here's histology, basically showing uh, here's the the capsule, uh, fibrous capsule over here. Here's the electrode that you can see. Uh, this, uh, the, the, the Tollywood and Blue study really showed very little in the way of, of injury here. No evidence of necrosis, Wallerian degeneration. Uh, really not much in the way of significant uh, nerve changes except that capsule uh, that, built, that uh, was uh, present at about 90 days post-block. This shows basically uh, at, at 90 days out uh, from, from therapy, the nerve conduction velocities that are consistent with other studies in, in the field uh, and you can see here the bottom two are from, elect, uh, from the company uh, with porcine abdominal vagus at 6 and 8 milliamps at 30 and 90 days, below that at 90 days. And you can see those numbers are relatively consistent with what you see above and the, and the ranges. So not much in the way of aberration there. And the last one shows the strength duration curves at 30 and 90 days post-block in the, in the porcine model. And the amount of energy uh, required uh, uh, does, not, does not really uh, change in in these in this animal model, so good preservation of of nerve function, um, and I'm going to talk about neurogastric function here in, in a second. So the nerve appears to be well um, well um, uh, preserved. These are some data. Uh, next, looking at testing vagal nerve function, which I think is very interesting. Uh, in the V block patients, using a, a much older device, um, and most of this comes from Dr. Mike Camilleri uh, from uh, the the Mayo Clinic. There's certainly many ways to measure vagal function. Uh, we heard reference earlier to uh, looking at autonomic function. My time's almost up, so I need to hurry. Um, uh, and uh, looking at uh, some of the function with this. And I'm going to just jump forward to this because uh, focusing on two things. One is pancreatic exocrine secretion. You can see markedly reduced from baseline in in uh, uh, an animal model. And you can see that once uh, you're post-block, the function tends to come back very quickly within a few minutes from the reduction of pancreatic exocrine secretion. I want to show you that pancreatic polypeptide, you know, as you cut the vagus nerve, that you abolish the uh, uh, pancreatic polypeptide response with sham feeding. And uh, with vagal nerve blockade, you can see that you actually will have that blockade uh, uh, produce that reduction in pancreatic polypeptide. And that produces greater weight loss with greater pancreatic polypeptide suppression. So it's important to understand if you're actually blocking the nerve and you're seeing that physiologic response, you'll actually see better weight loss in this uh, patient uh, uh, population. So that's human data. V-block uh, reduces calorie intake without changing dietary composition. You can see that uh, up to about six months out from surgery. Not a big change in the macronutrients. And finally, the last two slides, maximal tolerated volume testing. Uh, patients underwent standardized nutrient drinks uh, with Ensure to see what their maximum tolerated volume would be, and uh, a slight difference at about uh, 12, uh, 12 months in, in about eight patients. I'm going to skip this because it just shows the effect of stimulation from a, a single um, uh, vagal nerve so that we can talk about uh, in the discussion. I'd like to conclude by saying obesity is a significant health problem. Uh, there's a large therapy gap. Vagal nerve blockage produces significant weight reduction with improvement in comorbid illnesses. Nerve function appears to be preserved. Uh, there is significant variability in the response, and I think mapping of mechanistic pathways will aid treatment programs as well definition of biomarkers to optimize therapy. Thank you very much. That was a very nice talk. Um, I guess one question I have is I know that obesity can have a lot of confounding psychological uh, factors that a person eats because they're depressed and, and maybe not because they're hungry. Were you doing psych screens to try to uh, deal with any confounding factors like that? A lot of the patients with severe uh, illness were excluded uh, from the study. It would be interesting to go back and see if this had any impact on their overall psychologic profile. And I think those data have been collected, and I just need to go back and look at that. Did, do, uh, did you have any GI symptoms? Uh, how did the patients feel? 
So when we reviewed the uh, serious adverse events and what was presented to the FDA, certainly uh, a number of uh, patients uh, had uh, esophageal fullness. Some patients developed uh, dysphagia. Those were a common uh, side effect that was, was noted, and, in, and the majority of patients with discontinuation of therapy that, that uh, resolved. Well, how about more important things? That's not going to stop me from eating. How about nausea? How about satiety? How about things that we worry about? So we did see uh, increased in satiety in patients in, uh, um, uh, in, in some of the data. Nausea also was, a, um, it was uh, measured as, a, as an adverse event and was a slightly higher in, the, uh, in, the, in this population. You know, the thing about these devices, are, you know, you as a surgeon mean well, but we're handed the device. And the five minutes on, the five minutes off, all that's sort of been pretty designed. And just like we are in gastroparesis, we, we're a victim of parameters um, and there's lots of different styles, on, off time, hurts, energy. So the, the question was, how much work has been done? Five minutes on, five minutes off seems very brief to me. Uh, what data would we have if we turned it on for 30 minutes or something more aggressive? Do we have any idea about dose response in this kind of work, or are you just sort of using the recipe that you were handed? It's absolutely, absolutely using the recipe. Your point yeah. is well taken. Yeah. A lot of it's prescribed by the preclinical safety data that was presented, and that sort of puts hand, handcuffs on you. But I, I would have to concur. There, there's definitely uh, room for that, as well as the, the frequency of, of, of the therapy. A lot of that represents op, um, opportunity. So, and the other thing is, you know, within that group, there's going to be responders. So I think in obesity, the name of the game is, is selection. Within this group, there's about 30% who are stars. The, the rest are just pedestrian responders. Uh, your goal is to find the star. And to do that, you need like a pretest thing. Either you have a period of time where you maybe do the sham meal, uh, do something physiologic to find out who is the most sensitive neuromodulator person. Others are going to be responsive to psychiatry and other things. It's not going to be a panacea. That would be very naive. Uh, is there any interest or is there, any, is there any way of identifying your star responders? Was there a profile that you could kind of come up with? So the, the, the work that was done was only by way of regression to look at factors that predict some of, these, some of these factors, and nothing really meaningfully shook out from the data. But I think what you're talking about is more than what you would put into just a regression. I mean, it really is a concerted effort to try and identify what pathways, what peptides, what other factors are predicting um, uh, a change. And what I was hoping at, to, to learn from this group is to be able to take some of this back to look at a bona fide mechanism to identify those patients with those operational pathways that could benefit the most from this therapy. Um, actually, this is just a follow-up from Dr. McCallum's yeah. comment, because I think that um, the concept of precision medicine, individualized medicine, whatever you want to come, is very important here. If you talk about obesity in 75% of the population growing problem, there probably are multiple causes. And um, as <laughs> Dr. McCallum said, you identify the people who can respond must be a, a, must be a major focus of who should receive particular types of treatment. I know that uh, Michael Camilleri has discussed this at length as well in the past. So. Well, well, that's, that's one of the, the nice things about being a bariatric surgeon, having entertained, you know, being part of the study is over the last 5,000 or so patients that we were able to take care of, some patients just do not respond to anything, and uh, you will see a, uh, some some really struggle. And we really have focused a great deal more on the psychological profile of patients as we go forward, excluding patients. How do you integrate better with the, the medical management team preoperatively, and really trying to understand those patients? It's it's. Um, you know, it used to be much simpler around 2001 and 2002. All we had was surgery, and we only had one operation. 
and and now it's it's so much it's so much more of a decision tree, and so we can ask those questions, I think, in a, in a better way. It's interesting when patients come to see you, uh, the the children of the patients that you operated on, and they they they're coming in for their gastric bypass, and and it's an interesting discussion. To say we don't really do that anymore, so it's changed a great deal. So, just for the record, I guess the bariatric surgery didn't come away very, very well. And uh, even though I, I realize that, that there are side effects and things like that, you have to put that in perspective. Well, one thing you could start, if you express weight loss, maybe you show for bariatric surgeries ex- excess weight loss and not just for your stimulation. Because with your stimulation, the real weight loss is about 10%. That's actually less than in the bleeding uh, environment, you know, lifestyle studies or just about what drugs do. Because you switched from extra weight loss to total weight loss. You have to be, you know, have to be consistent if you report, report about this. And the other thing, I mean, with bariatric surgery, if you would have one here, I mean, they would stand up and they would uh, really not be happy with you. Uh, Obviously, uh, there are side effects, but it is remarkable overall how efficient it is. You cannot deny that. Uh, With sleeve gastrectomy, of course, the reason that most sleeve gastrectomies do now is because in most states the insurance doesn't pay, and so they go for the cheaper option, even though it hasn't been proven beyond like two or five or whatever years. RYGB has been shown to studies up to 20 years it is effective. Now, again, you have to put it in perspective. What would you do with your vagal block? Maybe for, what, one and a half years? So it, just just that, but, but that's just, I had to get that off. I have some specific questions for you, which is about this vagal block. And I'm very much interested in, uh, you know, using the vagus nerve as a conduit to change uh, energy balance and uh, food intake behavior. So <clears throat> one question specific is, so you have the ability here now to turn this on and off. So... I mean, the basic thing is, of course, you haven't really told us what your working hypothesis is that what's actually going on. How does it do it? So having studied the vagus nerve and obesity now for, you know, a few years, um, the first thing that all is on all our mind is to use this vagal sensory information going to the brain, which has, has this satiating capability. So that would be they are absolutely required, and, and, and you have mentioned that before, they are really re- required to, to give this feeling of satiation. And this is physiological satiation. So by, uh, by basically blocking this sensory traffic to the brain, you take that away. So it's actually a miracle that it is effective. And then when you block the vagus nerve, so we will have people here talking about all these beneficial effects to stimulate, and there is literature with the, with the whole gut with these uh, anti-inflammatory effects of the vagus that sometimes come in handy. So how does this square up if you block the vagus nerve and you block out all those beneficial effects? Well, I think that is the, the billion-dollar question, isn't it? I mean, we are told that stimulation is probably better from the whatever mechanism of increasing acetylcholine and its downstream effect on an anti- and reducing inflammation. We saw all the other data. Uh, but the fact is, this really ought to make every one of us pause because this is real weight loss. This is a sham controlled blinded study. And these patients lost weight. So there is a mechanism. Operationally, I showed you everything that doesn't make sense. Pancreatic polypeptide went the opposite direction of the way it should go. The only thing I think I did show you was not in this patient, was, was, um, was with relation to the, the nerves. Yes, we block it. And then I think there's evidence that they are being blocked. But um, I think it's, it's a very complex disease. I think that there's potential for crossover effects. I don't know what's happening at the afferent level, but 
Certainly we've postulated doing PET CTs on some of these patients to figure out what's really happening in, in, in the brain, and we're certainly well equipped to do that and we plan to do that here in the near future, but I don't have a working hypothesis for you. You see, my, my idea about this whole thing is it's not either stimulating the whole thing or blocking the whole thing. You have to know speci functional specificity. That's the key word of all of these nerve stimulations. And if you have this big cable, again, it has been mentioned before. <coughs> Somebody has, has compared it uh, with, that, uh, with that highway, with that interstate, and you are trying in the interstate to say, is that car going to exit here or there? Well, I, my analogy would be the transatlantic telephone cable. You know, if I would want to get any information out of there, <coughs> I would probably look at where this information goes in the cable and where it comes out. The last thing I would do is poke, try to poke this cable desperately to find one thing that works in my, in my favor. So I think we have to really start to think this whole thing over in terms of functional specificity, using the neurochemistry on either end to actually define what each of these fibers do. And once we know that, then we are maybe ready to selectively activate or inhibit some of these. And we can do it then, if we know all that, we can do it maybe in a modular fashion. <clears throat> we can use stimulation of some, inhibition of the others, and so on. And do you think it can be done in humans? Well, eventually, but I think for that, we that's, definitely need that, animal That's models. the challenge that I, I really feel that many of my colleagues here struggle with is the rodent data is compelling. The porcine data, I mean, it's just different. And, and extrapolating that and putting together complex sort of paradigmatic processing into place and then converting it to humans, that's, that's what I struggle with. So I, I agree with you 100%. It, the, the, the nice thing is we've got a device that seems to work. What can we do to work with this now to optimize it? And if it works perfectly, I, I, I accept that. Yeah. Um, so you're applying a nerve block, um, or at least you block most of the nerves, but could it be that you actually activate the smallest unmyelinated fibers? Uh, that's one thing. Another thing is that, uh, question, uh, do your patients report any sensation uh, at the onset of stimulation since you, you cycle uh, the stimulation? You know, I, I, I will have to get back to you on that because I don't remember that exactly. I can tell you that one confounder is that they may feel a buzzing sensation or something like that that, that is often a confounder of the cessation. In some patients, as you turn up uh, the, the amplitude, the, they will experience the dysphagia or other symptoms uh, more early. It, it's hard to tease that out, but it's certainly within the realm of, realm of possibility. Just real quick for a hypothesis, you're, we're talking about satiety. What about energy expenditure? You could be getting reflex activation of sympathetic activity that increases energy expenditure and burning of calories. Have you got any insight that that may be happening? I have not. I've, n I've not seen the data on that, or th that we have it, actually. Another important area to look at, I would think. One other uh, point going forward is is to look at a barostat, okay? You blow a barostat up in the fundus. When you eat a meal, you relax. That's the most important thing you do is you have receptive relaxation. Some people can relax a lot and can eat quite a lot. Um, <laughs> when you cut the vagus nerve, you lose receptive relaxation. E.g., some people have dumping syndrome. You're familiar with that. That's very commonly seen in surgery. So what you could do is you could uh, barostatically challenge your patients before surgery to see what their best relaxation is, and maybe the ones that relax the best are the most likely candidates to be um, impaired by transiently blocking the vagus nerve, because then they would be prematurely satiated. But I think five minutes is not enough. I think uh, you'd have to have a longer sustained blockage and then you could study the balloon before and after you block them by, by simply, uh, usually it's an insure challenge or some kind of small meal challenge or you blow it up until they feel 
gee, I'm full. And you find out how much volume does that take. But satiety is a big part of this. I'm not going to stop eating unless something makes me nauseated or full. That's life. And uh, you, you're going to have to get into that level. It can't be just smoke and mirrors. You, you've got to have some serious, um, not one call them adverse events, but you've got to suffer a little bit, just like you suffer from bypass surgery. But you lose weight. I, I think it, it's, an, it's, a, it's a deal. It's a deal. You're not, it's not, you're not going to be, uh, it's not puristic. You're going to have to suffer either way. Suffer to lose weight. And there's got to be side effects. I really appreciate those comments. And I think that one of the things is that study that you propose could be done now because we can turn off the device and, and, and do some of those measurements. We just need to optimize the, the blocking program. I think there's one more question, wasn't there? I find the uh, five minute off and five minute on stimulation. Oh. Sorry. I find the five minute off and five minute on stimulation really strange. I mean, and you're doing this 24 hours a day? It, it's, it's, tw 12 it's, tw it's 12 hours off, but I think it's, it's um, the, the five minutes on, five minutes off, I think was the poor sign. I think it was two minutes on, one minute off. That was the. That was the paradigm. And, and what would be the rationale for this when you're trying to block nerves? Were we saying that you can block nerves for just a short time and then you have some carryover effect? Because you, you showed re recovery fairly quickly. And the, the people that talked about the respiratory system showed very quick recovery. At any rate, it seemed to me it, it, the pattern and the time of stimulation would depend on the supposed mechanism of action. If you, if you wanted to try to decrease uh, food intake, well, you might want to stimulate when the person has just eaten or is going to eat. Or if you're thinking that you're changing the enzymes that are released in the gut following uh, food intake, you would stimulate during that time. But to just stimulate one minute on, two minute off, for for 24 hours a day or even for 12 hours a day. It, it, it would make sense if you stimulated something, you activated nerves, and then you produce some long-lasting change. This is a case where it's a, a passive response. We're stimulating the nerves and blocking them. And so when you would block them seems to be an important issue, and for how long you block them seems to be an important issue. But just to select one minute off and two minute off on seems really almost stupid. Well, I'm glad that I didn't think of that. <laughs> I didn't come up with the, the program for that. Yet another reason to understand the mechanism. <laughs> Precisely. So, But you've given us lots of opportunity, and I think that all the stakeholders would be very interested in saying, well, let's see what we can modify within the constraints of what's been approved in terms of for safety. I'm, I'm surprised Kevin's sitting there not saying anything. I mean, you're well, interested in high-frequency block. So maybe tomorrow you'll have some comments. Well, I, okay. I'll, I'll just say one thing. <laughs> uh, it's a little too long. And, and I'll have a chance to, to just show you some data tomorrow. But I think if, you know, uh, this one of the problems that goes back to the scaling between animals and humans. So the the data shows block in rats. I'm assuming that the vagal nerve is a lot bigger in humans than rats. That means your amplitude has to scale up pretty significantly. So eight milliamps in the rat. I don't know what you used in the humans, but I'll bet it wasn't even eight milliamps. It certainly went up to six. I can tell six. you. Yeah. So my guess is you'd have to go up. You'd have to double that to block the whole vagal nerve. So, um, you know, whether it's blocking or not in the human, to me is I'll show you some some information tomorrow. But it, it could be activating. It could be doing other neuromodulatory effects. But so at especially least, the small fibers might uh, uh, not yeah. be blocked or be even activated. I, I guess I should clarify if if by block you mean that an active potential traveling underneath the electrode is, is terminated. Mm -hmm. I don't think that happens. What, there could be blocking effects that are, that are, you know, because of the whole circuit, right? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's, it, it seems unlikely that and, that could happen. And a long time ago, I mean, we've noticed people... 
long time ago, people showed that when you stimulated at uh, sort of moderate intensities during high frequency stimulation, you produce intermittent activation. So you may be stimulating at 25 kilohertz, but that if you're not stimulating at enough intensity, you'll have those nerve fibers firing off at uh, some lower frequency. So is the question, is this block really activation at an abnormal frequency or pattern? All right. We'll talk more tomorrow. That, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, we, we have uh, seven, eight minutes for open questions for rest of the speakers today. Uh, we'll talk about block tomorrow. So, <laughs> so if people have any other questions that they want to ask of other speakers today. I, I just want to make a comment about duty cycles. At least in, in heart failure, duty cycles are used for two reasons. One is if you stimulate all the time, you end up damaging the nerve in the long term. And duty cycle are also used to see whether your response is very quick or requires duration. So if, you, if you're looking for something that has a long-lasting benefit, you need to continuously deliver a signal but you want to also have it on off so that you don't injure the nerve. So two things, at least we, we learned in heart failure, that determines a duty cycle. So it's a safety as well as some degree of efficacy. I cannot speak to the GI issues, but... Yeah, but recognize, recognize that we're using pulses which are of such short duration yes. that they're almost invisible to the ion channels in the nerve. So you're not actually activating the nerve. The, the nerve almost ignores it, yet the action potential conduction is blocked. That's the fascinating thing about 25 kilohertz high-frequency stimulation. So that's very high frequency. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A couple points. Um, a couple points. Uh, one is, is that on autonomic ganglia, their synaptic efficacy is about 7 hertz. So you're exactly right. But getting back to the point he made, the, there is actually long-term consequences on sensory processing from duty cycle stimulation. A 25% duty cycle with either spinal cord stimulation or with vagal stimulation is quite effective. We found memory functions to both spinal cord and vagal stimulations lasting up to 30 minutes to a 3-minute stress, to a 3-minute stimulation. So it actually yeah. can go on yeah. for a long period of time. So I think we need to think in terms of how we're impacting the processing, how we're, what's the memory function of that, how we're re-altering these things. So there are lots of things that we still need to, to evolve. When I tell you of those memory functions, that's actually from direct recording of autonomic nerves. So we actually are physically determining that out in the periphery. What's going on in the CNS? I'm not sure, but we've, as a side effect, we've done some of the heart failure studies we've done as well. We've actually uh, used weight loss as actually a criterion on our small animal models when we're actually getting efficacy of, of therapy. So it's, we got a lot to learn on this thing. I think in terms of heart-brain, heart-gut interactions, there's an awful lot we need to really move forward on that concept. Any other questions? Otherwise, thank you, all the speakers, for a great day. And uh, we're ready to go out in the cold.